preface of criminal investigation volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by abai in october two thousand fourteen criminal investigation a practical handbook for magistrates police officers and lawyers volume one translated and adapted to indian and colonial practice from the system der criminalistik of dr hans gross professor of criminology in the university of prague by john adam m a barrister at law crown and public prosecutor madras and john collier adam barrister at law advocate high court madras preface this volume is designed to be a working handbook for all engaged or interested in criminal investigation it has by special permission been translated and adapted from the well-known work of dr hans gross professor of criminology in the university of prague and special lecturer on that subject in the university of vienna translations have already appeared in various languages including french spanish danish russian hungarian serbian and japanese few men are so well fitted by training and experience as dr gross to compile a work like the present he has to use his own words in his introduction to the first german edition been for many years body and soul an investigating officer as m gardet professor of criminal law at nancy says in introducing the french translation to french criminalists dr gross is an indefatigable observer a far-seeing psychologist a magistrate full of ardor to unearth the truth whether in favor of the accused or against him a clever craftsman in turn draftsman photographer modeler armorer having acquired by long experience a profound knowledge of the practices of criminals robbers tramps gypsies cheats he opens to us the researches and experiences of many years his work is no dry or purely technical treatise it is a living book because it has been lived the aim of the adapters has been while omitting nothing of general or particular utility to any person investigating crime no matter in what capacity or part of the world to combine and include therewith a mass of information of peculiar interest in india at the same time they have attempted to apply many of the illustrative criminal cases and principles contained in the original work to the indian point of view Many sections of Dr. Gross's work have been greatly enlarged and elaborated, and no pains have been spared to bring the whole quite up to date. The book, following the author's arrangement, has been divided into four parts. Part 1 is designed, in the first place, to enunciate those general principles and qualities, the lack or neglect of which proclaim an investigator unfitted for the sphere in life in which it is his misfortune to be placed and in the second place to inform him in a general way what assistance science can afford in the investigation of crime and in a more detailed manner to show in just what cases expert knowledge may be effectively brought to bear advice is also given regarding the examination of witnesses and accused and the inspection of localities parts two and three deal respectively with various heads of knowledge and contain certain handicrafts with which every investigating officer should be thoroughly well acquainted while part four gives information upon the methods of criminals in committing particular offences much of which may be new even to experienced detectives this indian and colonial edition while omitting some portions of the original which would be of no use to the practical worker for example the slang words of bohemian gypsies thus contains much new and interesting matter the better to adapt the book for india and the colonies 
and also to bring the last German edition of 1904 thoroughly up to date. These new passages, derived from the writings of specialists, the latest criminal intelligence, and the somewhat extensive experience of the adapters as criminal lawyers, are interwoven with the text. For the specialist, desiring to pursue his studies further in any specific department, Appendices 1 and 2 are particularly intended. Appendix 1 contains the information which, in the German original and in many works of this description, is relegated to footnotes. Experience teaches that in a volume designed as a popular handbook as well as a scientific guide, such footnotes are embarrassing, breaking the general thread of the discourse and distracting the attention of the reader. Accordingly, each authority, as and when mentioned in the text, is distinguished by a consecutive index figure, under which figure in Appendix I the complete reference will be found. A few exceptions to this rule occur in the cases of important writers, whose names and the titles of whose works are given in full in the text. Appendix II is an alphabetical list of the authorities included in Appendix I, or specially quoted in the text, with references to the various pages of the book on which each is mentioned. These two appendixes combined will thus, it is hoped, be found by the student to constitute a complete working apparatus. The index is a comprehensive index to the whole work, with cross-references, of which we shall only permit ourselves to say that we have endeavoured to make it as useful as every index should be. The German and French editions of this work were each published in two volumes. For a book of reference, presenting no definite line of demarcation, the two-volume format is neither convenient nor popular. Anyone accustomed to employ as working tools such books as Taylor on Evidence or Taylor's Medical Jurisprudence will cordially agree. At the same time, a great and bulky book is a terrible nuisance. We believe that, with the help of the modern papermaker, who has provided a thin yet opaque paper of strong texture and adapted for block printing, we have been enabled to offer our readers a book, great but not bulky, which will prove no nuisance but a pleasure, physically, to handle and to read. A word may be said to anticipate the possible criticism that the translation is too free. We have made no attempt to produce a strictly literal interpretation. In translating a classic, where the style and language may be as important as, perhaps more important than, the matter, verbal accuracy may be desiderated, but where the matter is all in all, we believe its import can be best conveyed through a medium natural to the reader. This is perhaps more especially the case where the original is in German and from the pen of a German scientist, though we must admit that few German pens are less open to the reproach of German dryness than the lively and often humorous weapon wielded by Dr. Gross. Hence, while neither deprecating scientific accuracy of treatment nor shirking the limae labor et mora, we have endeavoured to present our results in a language readily understanded of the multitude. As to the illustrations, those appearing in the German work are reproduced from the original blocks, but a very considerable number are special to this edition. Plates 2 through 6 are from original impressions and drawings supplied by the government of Madras. Plates 7 through 9 are from photographs furnished by Mr. Joseph Farndale, Chief Constable of Bradford, as acknowledged in the text. Figures 40, 41, 42 are copied from Egerton Castle's Catalogue of Weapons in the Indian Museum, London. Figures 45, 61 through 77, 129 and 150 are drawn, by permission of the Inspector General of Police, Madras, from examples preserved in the museum attached to his office. 
the botanical drawings figures one hundred sixteen through one hundred twenty one and one hundred twenty six through one hundred twenty eight have been prepared from specimens procured with the assistance of lieutenant colonel j l van geisel i m s chemical examiner to the government of madras the plants portrayed in figures one hundred twenty two through one hundred twenty five not being readily obtainable in madras recourse was had to the illustrations in lyon's medical jurisprudence so frequently referred to in the text the blocks both half tone and line for all the illustrations here specifically mentioned and also for figure eighty two have been executed by the methodist episcopal press madras the blocks for figures 43, 44, 46 through 50, 52, 53, 55, were lent by Messrs. Oakes and Company Limited, the well-known gunsmiths of Madras. To all collaborators here mentioned, our cordial thanks are due. Many works of experts have been referred to, and from some of these excerpts have been made, we trust to no unreasonable extent. We believe that no quotation or extract has been taken from any author without acknowledgement in loco, and we have endeavoured so to frame our selections that they may prove signposts, guiding the reader from our pages to the fountainhead. Despite the most assiduous care on the part of both editors and printers' readers, we fear many press errors have crept in. For these and all other deficiencies, we can only plead the difficulties attending the production of a first edition of a work of this nature, and hope that, with the aid of our friendly critics, they may be amended, should a second edition be called for. In this connection we have specially to thank Lieutenant Colonel J. L. Van Geisel, already mentioned, for kindly reading the proof sheets of Chapter 16, Sections 8 and 9, and Chapter 18, Section 2, Subsection 2, and making many valuable suggestions. Our thanks are also due to Mr. K. S. Gopal Ratnam Iyal, B. A. B. L., who has carefully read the final proof sheets of a great portion of the book. In conclusion, we trust no one will imagine that the author and editors claim for this work either completeness or finality. The extent of the subject forbids the former, the nature of it vetoes the latter. In remedying its deficiencies and imperfections, we hope to receive the assistance of all who take a living interest in the subject. Such support has enabled Dr. Gross to enlarge his work to its present dimensions, and to furnish it with a comrade in the shape of his Archiv für Kriminalanthropologie und Kriminalistik, now in its twenty-fourth volume. Any information or suggestion, no matter on how small a point, will be thankfully received by us, and utilized for rendering any future issue more serviceable and thoroughly up-to-date. John Adam John Collier Adam End of Preface Section 2 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Ruth Golding Criminal Investigation, a Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers and Lawyers, Volume 1, by Hans Gross, translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Introduction The aim of this book is to be as practical as possible, it is not a law book, though we confidently hope that it will be of the greatest interest to lawyers. It is not a work on medical jurisprudence, though we trust that medical men will find it useful and suggestive. It is a manual of instruction for all engaged in investigating crime, its aim being not only to deal in detail with subjects coming directly within the province of a criminal investigator, but also to inform that official in what cases and in what manner specialists may or must be resorted to. 
at what stage of the inquiry the role of the expert begins depends almost entirely upon the person conducting the inquiry if the latter is unaware for example that a chemist can bring out with the help of his science an almost invisible impression of a finger upon a drinking glass there is small chance of the drinking glass either being examined or ever reaching the chemist's hands an investigator with a fair equipment of knowledge will be aware almost instinctively just when to invoke the assistance of experts in many cases wherein another would not dream of doing so we of course foresee and meet on the threshold the charge of encroaching upon the province and thereby attempting to dispense with the help of specialists nothing could be more harmful than such advice nothing could so expose the investigator to mistakes as such fancied independence but there is a vast gulf between permitting an investigating officer to undertake work beyond his sphere and instructing him how to recognize when he ought to resort to experts what experts should be chosen and what questions must be submitted to them just as an attorney requires long training and much knowledge of law to be able to state his case effectively for the opinion of the advocate cui libet in sua arte perito credendum est as a rule these three considerations alone will present themselves but there are also cases nor are they extremely rare where the investigating officer must himself play the role of expert one in all cases where no real experts exist and where a little reflection alone is required e g in cases of falsification of documents as to inaccuracies anachronisms inconsistencies in the text as a whole unless the case has to do with documents of such age as to necessitate the aid of experts in history or genealogy other instances are the observation of footprints the deciphering of writing questions concerning superstition etc two in the numerous cases where no expert being at hand it is necessary for the investigating officer to act without delay for example make an arrest conduct a search or revisit the scene of a crime the investigating officer is often placed in such a situation out in the country it happens as often as not that no qualified medical man is to be found in the place or it may be that the nature of the case itself precludes the investigating officer from at once consulting a medical man though medical knowledge would be of great assistance to him there are again cases in which the investigating officer is obliged to journey far into his district he cannot take a medical man with him from headquarters in all such cases in fact his first information may not show the slightest necessity for one suppose for example a district or assistant superintendent of police is summoned to what is reported to be a very important case of arson necessitating his personal investigation he goes off thirty forty or even fifty miles away into the wilds of his district and discovers that the arson has apparently been committed to conceal a murder or an attempted murder he has to decide whether an incinerated corpse is that of a murdered man or of one accidentally burnt in the fire he has no medical expert with him he has no means of getting one within a reasonable time he is under the necessity of at once coming to some conclusion on the matter he must rely entirely upon his own special knowledge his method of procedure at this moment will have the very greatest influence upon the result of the inquiry three finally and not the least important especially as regards india experts of the first rank are seldom to be found the chemical examiners to government the lecturers on medical jurisprudence at headquarters the government experts in fingerprints know well just what they have to say and do and how to say and do it 
but the same cannot be affirmed of the ordinary country hospital assistant or apothecary who is perhaps only at the outset of his career and indeed can seldom be called an expert at all in some parts of india the danger is all the greater when as in the presidency of madras hospital assistants are called upon to make post-mortems to draw up reports and give evidence in important murder trials the ordinary official of this grade does so without the slightest hesitation makes statements and draws conclusions with the utmost rashness declining to admit his inability to reply to a question a far more experienced man would shrink from answering and entirely forgetting that the life of a fellow human being may be dependent on his words this is no random assertion the records of our criminal courts amply bear it out and high medical authority could be quoted for the opinion that no non-gazetted medical officer i e no one below the rank of assistant surgeon should be permitted to conduct a post-mortem examination in a suspicious case and make a report thereon frequently medical men even men of long experience have never learnt the art of drawing up a satisfactory report in a criminal matter they may know their trade thoroughly and be able to give most useful information but are incapable in a criminal matter of applying their knowledge and answering questions put to them with any precision without the slightest intention of frustrating the ends of justice they fall victims to the wiles of the expert cross-examiner losing both their heads and their tempers finally a workman a shikari or a cultivator cannot be expected to find just the correct expression or to put into words exactly what he desires to say especially from the point of view of the investigating officer it must never be forgotten that the best of experts is far from being a criminalist the investigating officer must therefore know something more than what is set out in the codes if he wants to obtain answers to the point and if he is entirely ignorant on all matters connected with outside knowledge he cannot gain that assistance from specialists which they would otherwise be able to afford the reason of the remarkable success of the original of this book in europe is due to the circumstance forcibly stated by m gardet already quoted that quote, it responds to a real demand it fills a gap which not only existed in the juristic literature of germany but exists to-day in france and most other countries end quote. The realization of the same lacuna led the Congress of the International Union of Criminal Law, held at Linz, August 1895, to pass the following resolution. Quote, in order that criminal investigators may be better trained and educated for the work before them, it is desirable that the texts of the criminal codes should not be the sole subjects of instruction it is to be hoped that by special courses of instruction or otherwise wider and deeper notions may be imparted to them on the general causes of crime the striking peculiarities of the criminal world and the best methods to adopt in criminal inquiries and the infliction of penalties end quote. we most cordially endorse the view here formulated an investigating officer requires in the execution of his duties very much more knowledge than can be given him by the codes supplemented by annotations and case law no doubt the investigating officer can find much of the requisite information in a mass of books yet some is to be found nowhere as to the books themselves they are not always to his hand and when he has them at his disposition he speedily realises that a man without some knowledge of a subject cannot intelligently use a scientific manual it is impossible for him to find the notions he is in need of united in one systematic whole and he has often neither time nor opportunity to question any one in a position to give him information he is thus generally compelled to fall back on his own resources 
or on some guide easy to consult and capable of giving him the starting point necessary in the majority of cases that arise in fact he wants a book of first aid the present volume is intended to be such an auxiliary in any event we trust that the beginner will find in it a practical guide at least for the outset on his journey and possibly even through the inevitable slough of despond we should not here overlook the valuable work now being done in practical training by the police schools recently established in many parts of india we trust both teachers and pupils in such institutions will find something useful in our pages when the scheme of the book first took shape the idea was to have the different parts treated by specialists medical jurisprudence by a physician and surgeon the science of arms by an armourer the chapter on photography by a photographer etc we must allow that if treated in this way the various chapters would have been set out in a more scientific manner but it soon appeared that we should miss our true aim there are in fact enough works on such subjects but unhappily they have not been written for the investigating officer or with the aim he pursues kept steadily in view the result being that he cannot find what he has immediate need of the specialist cannot place himself in the position and stead of the jurist who without being a specialist beyond his own profession ought nevertheless to possess special information the expert can teach him many things but not those just necessary this plan was therefore abandoned and the work has been written throughout by the author and the adapters profiting it is thankfully acknowledged by the abundant labours of others supplemented at every turn by personal research and experience for various reasons some subjects of interest to an investigating officer have not been treated of exhaustively a full discussion would encroach too extensively upon subjects outside his province would be beyond the compass of a handbook or perhaps prove profitable to the criminal classes and so harmful to the public we may here enter a perhaps unnecessary caveat against any supposition that investigating officers are expected immediately to sit down and cram this book from beginning to end or at once to attain the ideal of an investigating officer promulgated in chapter one that is in truth an ideal a council of perfection but if there were no mountain tops who could exclaim excelsior the object of the book then is to show how crime is to be handled investigated and accounted for to explain the motives at work and the objects to be attained the legal aspect of arson for example and the punishment appropriate thereto the principles of the criminal law the laws of evidence and the rules of procedure to be followed in the trial of a case are barely within our limits but how the arson was accomplished what means and assistance the incendiary had at his disposal how its origin may be accounted for the character of the criminal and here comes in criminal psychology the weight to be attached to the testimony of the witnesses the consideration of errors in observation and deduction to which judge jury and all who have to deal with crime are exposed these things are part and parcel of our subject abstract legal knowledge is practically worthless where the judge magistrate or policeman cannot make it fit in with facts when he does not understand the witnesses or appreciates them erroneously when he assesses wrongly the worth of sense perceptions when he is led astray by every bit of roguery when he does not know how to make use of traces left behind by the criminal and especially when he does not know the numberless facts systematized in criminal phenomenology it must be admitted that at the present day the value of the deposition of even a truthful witness is much overrated the numberless errors in perceptions derived from the senses 
the faults of memory the far-reaching differences in human beings as regards age sex nature culture mood of the moment health passionate excitement environment all these things have so great an effect that we scarcely ever receive two quite similar accounts of one thing and between what people really experience and what they confidently assert we find only error heaped upon error out of the mouths of two witnesses we may arrive at the real truth we may form for ourselves an idea of the circumstances of an occurrence and satisfy ourselves concerning it but the evidence will seldom be true and material and whoever goes more closely into the matter will not silence his conscience even after listening to ten witnesses evil design and artful deception mistakes and errors most of all the closing of the eyes and the belief that what is stated in evidence has really been seen are characteristics of so very many witnesses that absolutely unbiased testimony can hardly be imagined if criminal psychology teaches us this much so the other parts of the subject show us the value of facts where they can be obtained how they can be held fast and appraised these things are just as important as to show what can be done with the facts when obtained the trace of a crime discovered and turned to good account a correct sketch be it ever so simple a microscopic slide a deciphered correspondence a photograph of a person or object a tattooing a restored piece of burnt paper a careful survey a thousand more material things are all examples of incorruptible disinterested and enduring testimony from which mistaken inaccurate and biased perceptions as well as evil intention perjury and unlawful cooperation are excluded as the science of criminal investigation proceeds oral testimony falls behind and the importance of realistic proof advances circumstances cannot lie witnesses can and do the upshot is that when the case comes for trial we may call as many witnesses as we like but the realistic or as lawyers call them circumstantial proofs must be collected compared and arranged beforehand so that the chief importance will attach not so much to the trial itself as to the preliminary inquiry the truth of this is but too often apparent in india and can well be exemplified by the procedure of high court judges hearing criminal appeals their first act on taking up the papers is to examine with the greatest care and so far as the often very incomplete record will permit the progress of the inquiry and if serious flaws are found therein as not infrequently is the case they attach little or no weight to the depositions of the witnesses at the trial we venture to hope that this book will be of use to many besides investigating officers properly so called throughout the work the expression investigating officer is used as a compendious term to include all persons engaged in the investigation official or non-official of criminal cases in india an inquiry is conducted sometimes by magistrates under chapter fourteen of the criminal procedure code sometimes by the police under the same chapter and the various police acts sometimes by interested parties assisted more or less by their legal advisers to all these classes as well as to judges of all ranks and medical officers of all grades this work is intended to appeal we may remind our readers that the subject with which this book deals in part criminal phenomenology is but one branch of the wider science of criminology the study of this subject has not been taken up by english-speaking nations with any sincerity of purpose or vigour of attack one or two explorers indeed have grappled with the subject 
but the textbooks used are for the most part those of other nations italy france germany even in the united states lawyers have chiefly directed their attention to what is known as criminal politics this subject it can hardly be called a branch of criminology standing as it does on a footing of its own comprises two sub-branches firstly the science of the criminal law which indeed all nations have been forced to consider and secondly penology the science that treats of the punishment and prevention of crime and of the management of prisons and reformatories america has attempted and with considerable success to define the principles upon which the infliction of punishment should be based and the exposition by her lawyers of the principles of the criminal law has been accepted and admired both in england and in india the italian school has dived deep down into the psychological branch of criminology and has propounded many original ideas but according to the general opinion of european criminologists it has to some extent lost sight of the practical in its desire to carry its pet theories to a never attainable conclusion french criminologists on the other hand have studied the subject from a more utilitarian point of view paying particular attention to what is termed phenomenology it is however to the german-speaking races we must turn to find criminology thoroughly attacked in all its branches this science has been by them recognized as a subject for really serious study and very few german universities do not possess a chair of criminology with courses of lectures and classes thereon the appended table gives the scheme drawn up by a recognized authority and shows the place occupied by phenomenology in the syllabus table criminology comprises three branches criminal anthropology criminal sociology criminal phenomenology criminal anthropology comprises two branches criminal somatology and objective criminal psychology the second branch criminal sociology comprises two branches criminal statistics and social criminal psychology the third branch criminal phenomenology comprises two branches crimes and subjective criminal psychology the sub-branch crimes comprises two branches procedure of criminals and investigation of crimes criminal politics comprises two branches criminal law and penology note as these pages are passing through the press we are in receipt of a work just published psychology applied to legal evidence by g f arnold i c s we regret we can do no more here than welcome it as an original and interesting contribution to the science of criminal psychology. End of section 2。section 3 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Tabler Criminal Investigation, A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1 by Hans Gross, translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. The Investigating Officer What is truth? said jesting Pilate, and would not stay for an answer. Yet truth, which only doth judge itself, teacheth that the inquiry of truth, which is the love-making or wooing of it, the knowledge of truth, which is the presence of it, and the belief of truth, which is the enjoying of it, is the sovereign good of human nature. Criminal Investigation, Part 1, General Chapter 1. The Investigating Officer. Section 1. General Considerations. 
of all the duties that an official can be called upon to perform in the course of his service those of an investigating officer are certainly not the least important that his services to the public are great and his labors full of interest will be generally admitted but rarely even among specialists is full credit given to the difficulties of the position an investigating officer must possess the vigor of youth energy ever on the alert robust health and extensive acquaintance with all branches of the law he ought to know men proceed skillfully and possess liveliness and vigilance tact is indispensable true courage is required in many situations and he must always be ready on emergency to risk his health and life as when dangerous criminals are to be dealt with fatiguing journeys to be undertaken persons stricken with infectious diseases to be examined or dangerous post-mortems attended he has moreover to solve problems relating to every conceivable branch of human knowledge he ought to be acquainted with languages he should know what the medical man can tell him and what he should ask the medical man he must be as conversant with the dodges of the poacher as with the wiles of the stock jobber as well acquainted with the method of fabricating a will as with the cause of a railway accident he must know the tricks of card sharpers why boilers explode how a horse coper can turn an old screw into a young hunter he should be able to pick his way through account books to understand slang to read ciphers and to be familiar with the processes and tools of all classes of workmen but it is not on the day of his appointment alone that an investigating officer can learn all this or acquire the activity and perspicacity necessary to his work it ought therefore to be a fundamental rule not to nominate as investigating officer any but those who besides their mental and bodily fitness possess a veritable encyclopedic culture who know the world have observed life and have acquired manifold experiences finally who are ready to place at the service of society with all the energy of which they are capable the knowledge thus painfully acquired every criminal expert knows that the investigating officer in the exercise of his functions may be compelled to draw on all absolutely all the varied knowledge he has amassed and that he will feel at least once in his life a profound regret for his ignorance of what he has neglected to acquire if an investigating officer is wanting in such general information the cause is lack of interest in the work and in this case he will never make a good investigating officer he will do well to seek without delay to utilize his legal knowledge which may perhaps be of great value in other branches of judicial work as an investigating officer he will not only fail to play his role well but his life will be miserable he will be definitely forced to busy himself with affairs that do not interest him and being deficient in the necessary information he will never secure good results he will be obliged to confess sooner or later that he is not occupying a situation suitable to him and nothing is more discouraging to a man than work under such conditions he who would spare himself such disappointment ought to make sure of possessing the qualities indispensable to an investigating officer before entering on this thorny and difficult career but knowledge alone is not everything the investigating officer must possess not only legal and other acquirements a general training special fitness and ideas ever ready for development but also such a complete devotion to his profession that even outside the exercise of his official functions he will be always seeking to learn something calculated to extend his knowledge he who seeks to learn only when some notable crime turns up will have great difficulty in learning anything at all his knowledge should be acquired beforehand by constant application in his ordinary life every day nay every moment 
he must be picking up something in touch with his work. Thus, the zealous investigating officer will note on his walks the footprints found on the dust of the highway. He will observe the tracks of animals, of the wheels of carriages, the marks of pressure on the grass where someone has sat or lain down, or perhaps deposited a burden. He will examine little pieces of paper that have been thrown away, marks or injuries on trees, displaced stones, broken glass or pottery, doors and windows open or shut in an unusual manner. Everything will afford an opportunity for drawing conclusions and explaining what must have previously taken place. For what we call adducing proof consists only in concluding from the knowledge of one fact the knowledge of other facts which must have followed or preceded it and these lessons must be learned in advance in connection with matters of small importance and not waited for until some murder has to be investigated quite insignificant words uttered by passers-by striking the ear by chance or little suspicious acts accidentally observed may afford precious opportunities for putting two and two together it is equally useful to get others to relate events insignificant or important at which they as well as oneself have been present these recitals supposing that those who make them really wish to speak the truth are extremely interesting on account of their variations and this is the simplest and indeed only way of learning how the depositions of witnesses should be appreciated. Nor ought the budding investigating officer to neglect any opportunity of obtaining information concerning any profession, the work of an artisan, technical processes, etc., etc., nor, last not least, of learning to know men. For this every man with whom we come in contact may be taken as an object of study and whoever takes the trouble can always learn something from the biggest fool end of section one section two the duties of the investigating officer if we now ask how should the investigating officer set about his work we can come to but one conclusion his whole heart must be set upon success. If not, he reduces his work to the mere dispatching of documents and firing off reports as fast as he can. If he would succeed in each inquiry, his work will be by no means easy, smooth, or peaceful. On the contrary, he will have to devote himself completely and continually to his task, working with all his might and never pausing for rest. Nervous people are useless as investigators. Success in a mission means the complete elucidation of the business in hand. No matter what may be his profession, a man must, if he be conscientious, bring his task to a successful termination. But here is not a task in which one can advance little by little along a natural and clearly demarcated route, terminating when one has completed a certain amount of work mapped out in advance there is always a new problem to unravel. The investigator whose work is half done has accomplished nothing. Either he has solved the question and quite finished the work, that means success, or he has done nothing, absolutely nothing. Obtaining a result must not be confused with producing an effect. The work of the investigator ought to make neither noise nor sensation. Suffice it, that the culprit must be discovered at any price. To succeed in this mission, the investigating officer must just commence his work at the start with the resolution of devoting to it every effort humanly possible and the determination not to pause till it is finished. The end has not been attained simply by the elucidation of the affair in an ordinary way. It is very easy and convenient to say it is impossible to go further. But if one says continually, another step in advance must be taken, one finishes by advancing several leagues. In every case that he has to solve, the investigating officer has first to obtain facts, often not without worry and trouble. 
as adversaries he has the accused and often the witnesses circumstances natural events difficulties that crop up as time goes on and if he loses sight of the proverb if you don't allow yourself to be beaten today you are saved a hundred times over then on the first difficulty arising he will throw up the sponge he will take a difficulty for an impossibility and say thus far and no further end of section two section four of criminal investigation volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by joseph tabler criminal investigation a practical handbook for magistrates police officers and lawyers volume one by hans gross translated by john adam and john collier adam chapter one continued section three the procedure of the investigating officer when the investigating officer starts work the most important point for him is to discover the exact moment when he can form a definite opinion the importance of this cannot be too much insisted upon for upon it often depends and in difficult cases almost always success or failure if he should come too soon to a definite conclusion relating to the affair a preconceived opinion will be formed to which he will always be attached with more or less tenacity till he is forced to abandon it entirely but his most precious moments will by then have passed away the best clues have been lost often beyond the possibility of recovery if on the other hand he misses the true moment for forming an opinion the inquiry becomes a purposeless groping in the dark and a search devoid of aim when will the investigating officer find this true moment this psychological instant of which we speak it is impossible to lay down a general rule or to foresee in a given case all that can be said is that the investigating officer will of necessity always find it if he set to work under the guidance of fixed and immutable principles never losing sight of the fact that a definite opinion on an affair as a whole will not come to him all of a sudden to arrive at it he must advance step by step while making use of such definite opinions as may be prudently formed about phenomena facts and isolated events as they arise the case must be taken up from the start with an open mind the complaint or information received by the investigating officer ought to have no other value in his eyes than this statement it is said that such and such a crime has been committed at such and such a place even if details about the perpetrator the injury the motive etc are published he should attach no more importance to them than if he had heard the remark it is said that the affair must have happened thus supposing that an important crime is involved and the investigating officer repairs to the scene certainly a great number of strong and lively impressions will bring themselves to bear upon him and the task of gathering them together will be hard enough in addition he will receive communications from all quarters officials authorized and unauthorized desire to make statements more or less important he does not wish to pack them off for they may tell him something which he will be able to turn to account in forming at once if he is so disposed a definite opinion his work at this important stage of the inquiry must enter into great detail just as if he gathered up with a sponge one by one all the drops of water he sees in order when it is quite soaked to squeeze into a basin all the drops that have been collected no matter for the moment whether the drops are clear liquid or dirty slush he gathers them all in little by little as the work advances certain opinions and ideas become separated and fixed such or such a witness makes a good impression and one begins to believe what he states one gets an idea of the way in which the author of the crime reached the spot one takes account of the instruments he has employed or find certain indications which confine within ever narrower limits the period of time in which the deed must have been committed 
when a certain number of ideas on the incidents of the case considered individually seem at length determined the investigating officer will seek to obtain a precise idea of the way in which everything has happened even if only the most general view be possible perhaps the conclusion will be forced on one that the real facts are not what they appear on the surface and that a false complexion has been given to them or on the other hand one may be enabled to say with certainty that a crime of such or such a nature has been committed in short the investigating officer will be far enough advanced to set up an outline or framework on which a provisional theory or scheme may be developed to set out this scheme beforehand will be superfluous because it may have to be changed at any moment dangerous because with a prematurely formed plan one can easily get off the track and follow a new direction we do not imply that the investigating officer must not at the beginning establish a classification to be followed in his operations for without that he would only grope about finding nothing and advancing no whither but between a provisional classification to guide inquiry and a definite scheme of the crime there is a great difference but it is difficult to construct the plan of campaign it is still more difficult to conduct the inquiry according to that plan one cannot compare the scheme of inquiry with a scheme devised in view of circumstances which can be brought into existence and modified at will it is drawn up in view of circumstances which alter of themselves which are often unknown and which do not depend on the person applying the scheme it resembles not the design of a house to be built but a plan of campaign it is based upon data which the investigating officer possesses or believes himself to possess when he constructs it it must be rigidly adhered to as long as these data are unchanged or have undergone only their natural development but it must be modified in part or in whole as soon as these data are found to have changed or to be false one would imagine that this could be done quite naturally and spontaneously but such is human nature that so simple a principle is rarely conformed to the greater difficulty there is in securing anything the more one holds to it that is why fools are so obstinate they never willingly abandon an idea because they have had trouble in getting it into their heads now the scheme of an inquiry is difficult to follow out and when one has already worked in conformity therewith it is not willingly abandoned but still pursued unthinkingly and almost automatically it happens at times that one perceives all of a sudden in one's work that one is following with exact minuteness a plan based upon data the falsity of which has become apparent long ago or which are so modified that the work constructed if not built altogether in the air is quite crooked this advice may seem pedantic yet however unimportant an inquiry may be at each step examination of witnesses visits to localities technical or expert reports and even combinations spontaneously imagined the information upon which one's scheme has been based must be verified anew to ascertain if the data remained unchanged and if not in what way the scheme must be modified it will therefore be not only the easiest but usually also the best and safest way to construct the hypothesis in the simplest possible manner strange and extraordinary suppositions should be disregarded and never forget that one great stupid fault which a criminal nearly always commits especially in big crimes it has happened hundreds of times that criminal investigators already on the right track have left it thinking the man who has committed this crime cannot have been so foolish as to do that but innumerable cases prove that he has been so foolish it matters not whether he was confused suddenly frightened has made a miscalculation acted hastily or what not it is therefore always best for the investigating officer to take the simplest view at the outset fister in his curious criminal cases rightly says the greatest art of the investigating officer consists in conducting the inquiry 
in such a way that the initiated at once perceive that there has been a directing intelligence while the uninitiated imagine that everything has fallen into place of its own accord but in order to perceive this directing intelligence the whole must rest upon a scheme continually verified and thoroughly carried out how often do we not come across inquiries where the investigating officer has started on an excellent plan but has adhered to it with desperate tenacity even when the data upon which it was based have long since changed thus to continue to follow a line the falsity of which has been demonstrated may sometimes prove more fatal and more dangerous than to grope about with no plan at all in the latter case it is still possible to hit the right clue in the former it is absolutely impossible the case where an inquiry runs the greatest risk of failure is when the scheme supposes a certain person to have been the author of the crime and after having worked entirely with this idea it suddenly becomes evident that that person is innocent when an almost incalculable amount of time has been lost on such a false scent it may be concluded as a general rule that the inquiry will prove abortive the investigating officer has expressed his ideas on the manner in which things have come about he has utilized the elements of proof in view of a predetermined result and what is graver still he has allowed time to slip away and now his original supposition has been found to be false he has first to combat his own discouragement and that of his assistant if a new scheme is drawn up he cannot muster the same degree of interest and the elements of proof seem neither so certain nor so useful many have disappeared and can no longer be found and with each production of new proofs he will make the objection or others will make it for him that in the original scheme they would have borne another meaning and pointed to another conclusion there is only one way to obviate such a danger never to allow himself to be dominated exclusively by one idea and never to follow exclusively that sole idea in the preceding pages the title investigating officer has as explained in the preface been used in a comprehensive sense but it will be well to point out that there may be two or more investigators in india in particular the criminal procedure code in addition to taking care that the magistrate possessing jurisdiction should be kept constantly in touch with the labor of the police provides both for an investigation by a police officer and an inquiry by a magistrate section four k and l these may be going on simultaneously and if there be friction or jealousy between the two authorities only the most sanguine would hope for success but let us assume and we trust the assumption is permissible that both are working together with a single eye to promote the ends of justice that he may develop or modify his plans in the way described the magistrate to economize his forces must have understand and know how to make use of his associates and subordinates it is common enough to hear the remarks the magistrate is not a policeman that is police work the magistrate has something else to do those who adopt this tone can hardly quote in its favor success scored by them the magistrate of course ought not personally to interfere in matters which do not concern him but he should keep the reins in his hands and guide the whole team whatever the police do ought to fit in with the scheme of the magistrate the actual work may at times have to be done by the police alone but the police should work strictly under the directions of the magistrate the police are sometimes found in a false position in being placed either too high or too low too low when the magistrate deems it useless to march abreast of the police does not desire to work with them and draws between their work and his too deep and inflexible a line of demarcation too high when the magistrate accords the police complete independence lets them have all their own way 
and afterwards accepts as absolutely definite and certain what has been done solely on their own responsibility the police will be found in their proper place only when the magistrate coordinates the efforts of both works sympathetically with them in the recognized interests of justice keeps them well acquainted with all he has done and all he intends to do when in short he has but one ambition to bring the work to a successful conclusion but if on the one side the magistrate thus marches hand in hand without jealousy he must on the other firmly demand that the control of the inquiry be placed immediately and completely in his hands that nothing be done without his knowledge that everything he has ordered be carried out in the way prescribed every police officer who has his duty at heart should willingly accept this situation the ends of justice will be furthered and the magistrate will have at his disposal men devoted to him and because they have confidence in him working well and expeditiously but the magistrate must know his men not only know their worth in a general way but know what they are thinking about in each particular case that these principles are by no means chimerical as regards india was the view of the police commission of nineteen o three the following sentences from its report sections one twenty four and one twenty five may be aptly quoted to enforce by authority what has been advanced above after referring to the various sections of the code of criminal procedure in which the respective functions of the magistracy and police are enumerated the report proceeds this is the connection which the law intends to exist between the magistrate empowered to take cognizance of police cases and the police it involves the first information being sent to this magistrate his being able to watch the case from the first to order investigation where the police are not investigating or to proceed to take up the case himself and his being kept in touch with the police investigation up to the very last his connection with the case is intended to begin with the first information and to continue to the end throughout he is intended to exercise an intelligent interest in it these provisions are very generally lost sight of the intention of the law is defeated when the first information is sent not as required by section one five seven to the magistrate having jurisdiction but nominally to the district magistrate really to a court inspector or other official at headquarters who files it until the case is sent up finally for trial it is also defeated when the magistrate assumes what he imagines to be a judicial attitude and never looks at a paper or takes any interest in the case until it comes before him in court and proceeds to dispose of it with regard only to what is put before him by the parties without any effort to do what more he can to arrive at the truth a valuable check on police work and valuable powers in criminal administration are thus lost the intention of the law is that the police and the magistracy should work together the former investigating the case for the magistrate the latter conducting the magisterial inquiry or trial weighing the evidence collected by the police sifting further any points that have been missed or inadequately treated hearing all that the accused has to say or adduce on his own behalf and deciding the case in the interests of truth and justice that the magistrate should be unduly ready to accept the police view of a case without giving the accused a fair hearing and endeavoring to sift the case to the bottom is unjust and contrary to the intention of the law it is equally unjust and contrary to the intention of the law for a magistrate to assume a hostile attitude towards the police to deny them a fair hearing or to be diverted from the endeavor to ascertain the truth by a prejudice against them suppose that in an important case sufficient light has been thrown on it to arouse suspicion against a particular person or to give an accurate idea of the nature of the offense for instance whether it be a theft or a pretended theft for the purpose of hiding a breach of trust the investigating officer in the course of the inquiry ought to come to a conclusion one way or the other and form his opinion admit that the proof is strong enough for suspecting x to be the perpetrator of the crime and for ordering his arrest 
as we have said the investigating officer ought not to follow blindly and solely the idea that x can alone be the author of the crime but neither ought he under risk of complicating the case to set out at the same time in several other directions it is at this moment he must possess his men know them and see that they serve him the magistrate will possess them if as we have indicated he is on good terms with the police and with his subordinates he will know them if he constantly keeps in contact with them not only now but beforehand and he will know they will serve him if in choosing them he takes into consideration first their character and education and then the ideas they have on the case in hand for one ought to make some concession to a man's ideas and employ him on a suitable task now suppose that certain police officials have been the first strongly to suspect x the best way to make use of their zeal and good will will be naturally to make them continue to follow the same track and search for other motives for suspecting x if the suspicions against x are not overwhelming the magistrate will not forget that some police officials are of a different opinion and have even suspected another person as these later officers must have some grounds in support of their opinion the magistrate will ask for these reasons and if they do not appear to be altogether ill-founded by reason of other grounds that contradict them those very officials who have conceived the idea ought to be entrusted with the duty of following their own clue if other officers take yet another view of the matter these again will be charged with watching that idea the fruit of their own reasoning that it will be the object of the most careful attention we may be quite certain when the investigating officer has taken care to employ upon every imaginable clue which promises to bring forth some discovery the men most fitted to each he is then free to direct all his efforts to the point where in his own opinion the correct clue is to be found he will from time to time collect reports of those searching in other directions will examine their information and compare it with his own results should he not even then be convinced that the other clue is the right one this method of proceeding will spare him many disagreeable surprises it often enough happens that the real criminal is supposed to be found and is actually handed over to justice the police assume that all is over and fold their arms but the magistrate goes on with his inquiry and is finally obliged to release the supposed real criminal to the discomfiture of the police there is nothing more to be done the matter is ended till further orders and immediately sinks into oblivion another important matter relating to the police is how to act when things have gone wrong it is quite natural that the investigating officer should not spare himself but he must treat with equal severity all who work with him and are under his orders to enforce their performing their duty to the end he must act with rigor every time he discovers a breach of duty but if the faults committed turn out to be only mistakes he should treat them with the greatest indulgence letting his subordinates clearly understand that nowhere is it so necessary to acknowledge as soon as possible a mistake which has been committed as in the service of public order and justice above all it must be well recognized that as nowhere else is it easier to make a mistake so nowhere should mistakes be more readily pardoned it cannot be repeated too often that nowhere is a mistake more fatal and more dangerous than where the question is that of discovering a crime and its perpetrator but it must also be said that nowhere can a mistake be more completely repaired provided it is discovered at once and frankly acknowledged an individual cannot be expected never to make mistakes but what must be rigorously demanded of every one occupied in criminal matters is that he be honest and conscientious enough to immediately recognize and freely confess his error if the question be asked to what points the investigating officer should direct the attention of the police the answer will depend entirely and exclusively upon the case in question for no general rule can be laid down on the subject but we may say that the investigating officer ought to attempt to delineate to his subordinates the salient characteristics of the case only the man possessed of psychological training 
can carry out the task the most experienced police officer may very well perform to perfection everything necessary to his own functions but he can rarely specialize the characteristics of a given case this is the work of the investigating officer he will distinguish the present from similar cases in the past he will look for its special character by reference to the actual crime to the victim and to the suspect drawing indications therefrom as to the directions in which at least for the moment search need not be made the police officer finds it just as easy to accept views pointed out to him and grasp the details of a crime when his attention has been drawn to them as he finds it difficult to form the first picture of a given case finally it is part of the business of the investigating officer to indicate to the police we are speaking now specially with regard to towns or large villages the principal persons who can give information about important crimes drivers of public conveyances coolie messengers prostitutes etc though the importance of these persons is well recognized yet recourse to them is often neglected their importance is manifest for three reasons firstly they are not in regular employment and generally possess time and opportunity during a great part of the day to observe their neighbors business their districts and resorts are habitually fixed and during their hours of idleness they can notice anything that takes place out of the ordinary or in any way singular from these persons one will in most cases obtain information as to the customary conduct of such and such an individual be he the victim or the criminal what he used to do and used not to do with whom he associated what were his earnings how much he spent when he went out and when he came in and so on they may also be able to tell of something unusual that happened at the time of the crime either as regards money paid meetings goings and comings or the demeanor of the parties the second ground for the importance of these classes of persons relates not so much to themselves as to the criminal himself who will in a very great number of cases have had relations with them before and perhaps after the crime often after the commission of a crime a suspect will be in funds and will try to get away quickly and without being seen from the neighborhood of the crime this is when he will engage a public conveyance he will employ a messenger to send off letters raise money or make purchases for him and finally he will need amusement and distraction and will have recourse to a prostitute the third ground for the importance of this category of persons is that each class forms a body of which the members have very extended relations with one another a hackney carriage driver in towns of ordinary size knows nearly all the others of the same fraternity a commissionaire knows the other commissionaires a prostitute other prostitutes in consequence of the relations existing between these persons what one knows the others learn and the police officer can therefore generally obtain from them the information he wants but in this he will not succeed if he only starts on the day following some great crime to make the necessary acquaintance with these classes this he must have done long before he must know these people and possess their confidence then alone can he obtain information on the points he wishes to know about but it is the investigating officer that ought previously to draw the attention of the police to the importance of these points he ought not indeed to manufacture satellites and spies but simply take measures to bring a number of persons into cooperation with himself in the service of justice there is an old adage that the investigating officer can often remember to good purpose namely cherchez la femme look for the woman at the bottom of it sounding rather like a phrase in a novel every practitioner of experience will certify that it contains a large portion of truth a mistake however can be made in relying on it in two ways either by believing that the crime no matter what has been instigated by a woman or by declaring the explanation sufficient only because the name of some woman has been mentioned during the inquiry 
in the first case one goes too far in the second the goal has not yet been reached the proper procedure is to endeavor without any pedantic obstinacy to look for a woman as having been an influencing factor in the crime the suggestion of a crime does not always of necessity emanate from a woman but one will frequently find that the most important deeds done before or after the crime itself have been done at the instigation of a woman or on account of a woman this is assuredly not a minor point we never feel sure of our case when we can assign no motive for some important action revealed by the inquiry and we are not disposed to believe that such an action has taken place so long as we do not know what the motive is the investigating officer will therefore always do well to admit at the beginning that a woman may have had something to do with the crime it is not necessarily so but inquiry in that direction should be recommended take the simplest of facts a farm servant steals wheat in order to buy a pair of shoes for his young woman an honest woodcutter has turned poacher so as to be able to cut a dash in new buckskin breeches for his girl or let us go further and take a great political trial in which we see how an offended beauty stirs up partisans to carry out projects tending to the overthrow of the state everywhere we find a woman offenses against property are committed for the purpose of getting married or spending the proceeds on prostitutes at balls dancing parties and public assemblies of all kinds brawls for the most part break out on account of women the safest hiding place for stolen objects is with a woman of apparent innocence it is almost always with the aid of a woman that criminals succeed in escaping and concealing themselves in frauds and coining on a large scale women are almost always the agents for putting the false goods into circulation the worst gambling dens are invariably run by women crimes of passion innumerable have been committed on account of women and many men have turned criminal through associating with them every criminal expert almost without exception having a certain amount of experience is wont in criminal matters to go in search of the woman as a matter of course doubtless mistakes and errors may arise from that procedure but for all that one must never forget the adage find the woman at the bottom end of section four section five of criminal investigation volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Tabler. Criminal Investigation, a Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers. Volume 1 by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Chapter 1. The Investigating Officer. Continued. Section 4. Preconceived Theories. The method of proceeding just described, that, namely, in which parallel investigations are instituted, which to a certain extent mutually control each other, is the best and one is tempted to say the only way of avoiding the great dangers of a preconceived theory, the most deadly enemy of all inquiries. Preconceived theories are so much the more dangerous as it is precisely the most zealous investigating officer the officer most interested in his work who is the most exposed to them the indifferent investigator who makes a routine of his work has as a rule no opinion at all and leaves the case to develop itself when one delves into the case with enthusiasm one can easily find a point to rely on but one may interpret it badly or attach an exaggerated importance to it an opinion is formed which cannot be got rid of 
in carefully examining our own minds we can scarcely observe phenomena of a purely psychical character in others we shall have many opportunities of studying how preconceived theories take root we shall often be astonished to see how accidental statements of almost no significance and often purely hypothetical have been able to give birth to a theory of which we can no longer rid ourselves without difficulty although we have for a long time recognized the rottenness of its foundation nothing can be known if nothing has happened and yet while still awaiting the discovery of the criminal while yet only on the way to the locality of the crime one comes unconsciously to formulate a theory doubtless not quite void of foundation but having only a superficial connection with the reality you have already heard a similar story perhaps you have formerly seen an analogous case you have had an idea for a long time that things would turn out in such and such a way this is enough the details of the case are no longer studied with entire freedom of mind or a chance suggestion thrown out by another a countenance which strikes one a thousand other fortuitous incidents above all losing sight of the association of ideas and in a preconceived theory which neither rests upon juridical reasoning nor is justified by actual facts nor is this all often a definite line is taken up as for instance by postulating if circumstances m and n are verified then the affair must certainly be understood in such and such a way this reasoning may be all very well but meanwhile for some cause or other the proof of m and n is long in coming still the same idea remains in the head and is fixed there so firmly that it sticks even after the verification of m and n has failed and although the conditions laid down as necessary to its adoption as true have not been realized it also happens that a preconceived theory is formed because the matter is examined from a false point of view optically objects may appear quite different from what they really are according to the point of view from which they are looked at morally the same phenomenon happens the matter is seen from a false point of view which the observer refuses at all costs to change and so he clings to his preconceived theory in this situation the most insignificant ideas if inexact can prove very dangerous suppose a case of arson has been reported from a distant locality immediately in spite of oneself the scene is imagined for example one pictures the house which one has never seen as being on the left hand side of the road as the information is received at headquarters the idea formed about the scene becomes precise and fixed in imagination the whole scene and its secondary details are presented but everything is always placed on the left of the road this idea ends by taking such a hold on the mind that one is convinced that the house is on the left and all questions are asked as if one had seen the house in that position but suppose the house to be really on the right of the road and that by chance the error is never rectified suppose further that the situation of the house has some importance for the bringing out of the facts or in forming a theory of the crime then this false idea may in spite of its apparent insignificance considerably confuse the investigation all this proceeds from the psychical imperfection to which every man is subject much more fatal are delusions resulting from efforts to draw from a case more than it can yield granted that no investigating officer would wish by the aid of the smallest fraud to attach to a case a character different to or more important than that which it really possesses yet it is only in conformity with human nature to stop the more willingly at what is more interesting than at what belongs to everyday life we like to discover romantic features where they do not exist and we even prefer the recital of monstrosities and horrors to that of common everyday facts 
this is implanted in the nature of every one and though in some to a greater in some to a lesser extent still there it is a hundred proofs exemplified by what we read most by what we listen to most willingly by what sort of news spreads the fastest show that the majority of men have received at birth a tendency to exaggeration in itself this is no great evil the penchant for exaggeration is often the penchant for beautifying our surroundings and if there were no exaggeration we should lack the notions of beauty and poetry but in the profession of the criminal expert everything bearing the least trace of exaggeration must be removed in the most energetic and conscientious manner otherwise the investigating officer will become an expert unworthy of his service and even dangerous to humanity we cannot but insist that he should not let himself slip into exaggerations that he should constantly with this object criticize his own work and that of others and that he should examine with extra care if he fail to find traces of exaggeration these creep in in spite of us and when they exist no one knows where they will stop the only remedy is to watch oneself most carefully always work with reflection and prune out everything having the least suspicion of exaggeration it is precisely because a certain hardihood and prompt initiative are demanded of investigating officers that one finds in the best of them a slight leaning towards the fictitious one will perceive it in careful observation of oneself and get rid of it by submission to severe discipline a psychologist of repute has stated that great artists poets and actors are mostly neuropathic individuals we are sure that in saying this he does not intend to suggest that the occupations connected with art poetry and the stage are conducive to madness but that a certain neuropathic nature leads those who follow them to become what they have become in other words their nature is the cause and not the effect of their occupations but not only those who are called poets artists and actors have this neuropathic nature many other people in less poetic professions possess it though in an unpoetic profession they may be so highly intellectual that they may be called as kraft ebbing has called them neuropathic people their nerves it may be said are of such a nature that they are poetically inclined those gifted in this way are the greatest among us but at the same time they have the heaviest responsibility in using such gifts a special variation of the preconceived opinion consists in holding to the characterization first given to a fact this characterization is based on the first impression and may be entirely justified by that impression but another consideration comes in namely to see if what has been noticed at the beginning continues to bear the same aspect throughout the inquiry it is self-evident that details must be modified but we do not here refer to these we confine our attention to the nature of the crime the most important examples to be noticed here are those where the problem is whether a violent death is caused by suicide or by unknown causes too much attention cannot be given to cases of this kind they will be treated of later e g chapter sixteen section six poisoning section three death by firearms section four death by strangulation above all a minute examination must be proceeded with where persons are believed to have been drowned to have fallen from a height to have been suffocated or to have died of sudden illnesses with vomitings diarrhea cramp etc it is safe to affirm with certainty that an enormous proportion of such cases is due to the hand of another many other crimes are often in reality quite different from what one wanted to take them for the investigating officer of experience will disregard at first sight quite a series of crimes and will inquire whether he does not find himself in the presence of something quite different to this category belongs robbery with violence or armed with deadly weapons people often pretend to have been victims to this grave crime where they wish to cover up the loss of money the investigating officer must therefore be on his guard 
when a person declares that a sum of money has been stolen from his custody even the grave wounds which the victim of the theft will pretend to have received may be disregarded often a man who has gone wrong lost at cards dissipated or hidden the money held in trust will inflict such wounds on himself the author has met with two cases of this kind in which a peasant having lost at play the money received for the sale of his cattle made pretense of robbery merely to avoid the reproaches of his wife rape again is often set up to hide the downfall of a young girl who wishes to avoid her shame by turning the pity and sympathy of every one towards her girls often enough invent attacks by quite unknown persons or graver still they bring false accusations against persons named in such a case the real seducer is hardly ever accused of the rape he is spared and no charge is made until the fact of pregnancy is certain then the woman allows herself to be seduced by a second person and the latter only is accused of the rape unhappily in this case the proof of the falsity of the charge can only be made later on at the birth of the child the date of this shows that conception must have occurred long before the pretended rape in such a case therefore one must never neglect immediately after the birth to have the child examined by experts in order to know whether or not it has attained its full term for as we have supposed at the time of the pretended rape the woman was already a long time enceinte it is not uncommon to find people inflicting wounds on themselves such are besides persons pretending to be the victims of assaults with deadly weapons those who try to extort damages or blackmailers thus it often happens that after an insignificant scuffle one of the combatants shows wounds which he pretends to have received to this category also belong people who declare that certain named persons have recently caused them wounds in which in reality date from a long time before the profit made in such a case from dislocations old sores on the eyes or ears and above all from rupture is well known ninety per cent of affections of this kind pretending to arise from recent quarrels bad treatment etc date from long before profit is also made from wounds received from machinery etc they are exaggerated or fraudulently mixed up with old complaints the cure is also purposely delayed we are acquainted with not a few cases where when the author of the wounds is worth powder and shot all sorts of means are employed to keep them open or aggravate them in order to obtain a bigger indemnity railway and insurance companies are particularly exposed to frauds of this description it is only too little known that many quacks follow the profession of helping people who require an artificial sickness in some countries in which conscription exists these gentlemen drive a roaring trade in giving young men illnesses to free them from military service they can confer heart disease carbuncle jaundice boils skin diseases and injuries of every kind singular but not so very rare are cases where individuals castrate themselves and impute these mutilations to nomads gypsies tinkers peddlers etc but always to unknown people it is characteristic of these voluntary mutilations that most frequently those who perform them do not quite complete the operation and that they are for the most part men who manifest excessive piety or lead a solitary life as shepherds gamekeepers etc among wrongs to property theft and arson are the most frequently simulated in the first case loss of fortune and breach of trust are most frequently sought to be disguised under the pretense of theft as a rule it is not very difficult to prove the falsity the most important point is that the investigating officer should continually remind himself that the theft might very well have been a sham in many cases the point must be elucidated it is not necessary to make a noise about it straight away but let him keep this idea ever before him and examine from this aspect each of the circumstances 
after asking himself what any fact would signify if there had been a real theft let him ask himself what that fact would signify if the theft were only concocted the investigating officer ought never to permit himself to abstain from making this examination by the rank and situation of the supposed victim of the theft by the cleverness of the mise en scene or by any other consideration not only must the self-made victim be shown up but innocent people who may be suspected must be protected it often happens that people set fire to property belonging to themselves in such a way as to arouse a suspicion that a fire has been started by others their aim is often to obtain the amount for which they are insured often to hide the bad state of their affairs often to get rid of the traces of a murder or some other crime in many cases the proof of these facts is not so difficult as it appears the important point is always to remember that it is possible that they may have wished to hide something this ought not to be from the start a suspicion amounting to strong probability but only a door open to every explanation in order to know exactly the attitude to be maintained towards what has passed all the circumstances of the crime must be clearly taken into account and submitted to strict logical examination from their commencement to their last stage if at a given moment something has not been explained suspicion is justified and pause must be made at the point where the logical sequence is broken for the purpose of examining if there is no better way of explaining the fact if one is found the rest of the inquiry is easy end of section five section six of criminal investigation volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Joseph Tabler Criminal Investigation, A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers Volume 1 by Hans Gross Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam Chapter 1 Continued Section 5 Certain Qualities Essential to an Investigating Officer it goes almost without saying that an investigating officer should be endowed with all those qualities which every man would desire to possess indefatigable zeal and application self-denial and perseverance swiftness to read men and a thorough knowledge of human nature education and an agreeable manner an iron constitution and encyclopedic knowledge still there are some special qualities whose importance is frequently overlooked to which attention may be peculiarly and forcibly directed first and above all an investigating officer must possess an abundant store of energy nothing is more deplorable than a crawling lazy and sleepy investigating officer such a man is more fit to be a gentleman at large than an investigating officer he who recognizes that he is wanting in energy can but turn to another branch of the legal profession for he will never make a good investigator again the investigating officer must be energetic not only in special circumstances as when for example he finds himself face to face with an accused person who is hot-headed refractory and aggressive or when the work takes him away from the office and he proceeds to record a deposition or make an arrest without having his staff or office bell to aid him but energy must always be displayed when he tackles a difficult complicated or obscure case it is truly painful to examine a report which shows that the investigating officer has only fallen to his work with timidity hesitation and nervousness just touching it so to speak with the tips of his fingers but there is satisfaction in observing that a case has been attacked energetically and grasped with animation and vigor the want of special cleverness and long practice can often be compensated by getting a good grip of the case 
but want of energy can be compensated by nothing those incomparable words of goethe true for all men are above all true for the criminal expert strike not thoughtlessly a nest of wasps but if you strike strike hard the investigating officer must have a high grade of real self-denying power it is not enough that he is a clever reckoner a fine speculator a careful weigher of facts and possesses a good business head he must be self-denying unostentatious and perfectly honest resigning at the outset all thoughts of magnificent public successes the happy-go-lucky apprehension of the policeman the effective summing up of the judge the clever conduct of the case by a counsel all meet with acknowledgment astonishment and admiration from the public but such triumphs are not for the investigating officer if the latter be working well those few people who have had an opportunity of really studying the case as it goes along will discover his unceasing and untiring work from the documents on the record and will form some correct idea of the brain work power of combination and extensive knowledge which the investigating officer has employed the investigating officer will be held responsible for the smallest and most pardonable mistake while his care and his merits are seldom acknowledged let him be conscious of having done his duty in the only possible way beyond this we can only say virtue is its own reward another quality demanded at any price from the investigating officer is absolute accuracy we do not mean by this that he must set out details in the official records exactly as they have been seen or said for it goes without saying that this will be so done the quality indicated consists in not being content with mere evidence of third parties or hearing when it is possible for him to ascertain the truth with his own eyes or by more minute investigation this is to say no more than that the investigating officer should be accurate in his work in the sense of being exact as that word is used in its highest scientific signification indeed the high degree of perfection to which all sciences have to-day attained is entirely due to exact work and if we compare a recent scientific work whatever the subject with an analogous book written some decades ago we will notice a great difference between them arising almost wholly from the fact that the work of to-day is more exact than that of yesterday naturally in all inquiries a certain amount of imagination is necessary but a comparison between two scientists of our time will always be to the advantage of the one whose work is most exact the brilliant and fruitful ideas of the scientist which astonish the world being often far from sudden and happy inspirations but the outcome of exact research in close observation of facts in searching for their remotest causes in making unwearied comparisons in instituting disagreeable experiments in short in attempting to elucidate a problem the investigating officer will observe it under so many aspects and passing through so many phases that new ideas will spontaneously come to him which if found to be accurate and skillfully utilized will certainly give positive results since exactness or accuracy of work is of so much importance in all branches of research this accuracy must also be applied to the work of the investigating officer but what is to be understood by accurate work it consists in not trusting to others but attending to the business oneself and even in mistrusting oneself and going through the case again and again by so proceeding one will certainly bring about an accurate piece of work a thousand mistakes of every description would be avoided if people did not base their conclusions upon premises furnished by others take as established fact what is only possibility or as a constantly recurring incident what has only been observed but once true it is that in his work the investigating officer can see but a trifling portion of the facts nor can he repeat his observations he is obliged largely to trust to what others tell him and it is just here that the difficulty and insufficiency of his work lie but this inconvenience can to a certain extent be remedied 
on the one hand by wherever possible making sure of things for himself instead of accepting what others tell him and on the other hand by trying to give a more exact form to the statements of others by comparison experiment and demonstration for the purpose of testing the veracity of the deponent's observation and obtaining from him something exact or at least more exact than before in endeavoring to verify the facts for himself the investigating officer must personally examine localities make measurements and comparisons and so form his own opinion if a small matter which can only be established by accurate observation is in question data furnished incidentally must not be relied upon but only ascertained facts and investigations specially carried out in an important case the circumstantial evidence had been brought together and conclusions thereby suggested drawn results which might have been of decisive importance in clearing up the case at the last moment it came into the head of some outsider to ask if the distance between two points was really two thousand paces that was one of the grounds of the argument so artistically built up in fact two witnesses had declared the distance to be two thousand paces it was decided to send a policeman to visit the ground and when the distance was found to be only four hundred and fifty paces the new conclusions rendered necessary contradicted the former ones this is a typical example among hundreds of similar instances it is much more difficult to point out how depositions can be rendered more exact when they cannot be verified by actual inspection de visu let it be granted that the witness is really desirous of speaking the truth and is merely a bad observer in general the matter should be elucidated by experiment by ocular demonstration suppose a witness affirms that he was beaten by h for ten minutes let a watch be placed before him and ask him to take good note of how long ten minutes lasts and then say whether it was really ten minutes after a quarter of a minute he will exclaim it certainly did not last longer than that again a witness asserts that he is perfectly certain that he heard a cry coming from below but trials on the spot prove that he never can guess correctly whether a cry comes from right or left above or below again a witness says that though he did not look very closely h held at least r's twelve in his hand that he can swear to very well he is asked how many coins have i at present in my hand also about twelve he answers but there are twenty-three again a witness declares when once i see a man i always recognize him again did you see the prisoner who was being taken out as you came in you ask him certainly i saw him very well he answers all right go and pick him out from ten other persons a witness estimates an important distance at let us say two hundred yards let him be brought out of doors and say how far might be one hundred two hundred three hundred four hundred yards if now these distances be measured one can easily judge if and with what degree of accuracy the witness can judge distances as this judging of distances is often necessary it becomes important to measure beforehand from a convenient window certain visible fixed points and to note the distances for future examinations for years the author had many occasions for doing so from his office room window and knew for instance to the left corner of the house sixty-five yards to the poplar tree one twenty to the church spire two ten to the small house four hundred to the railway nine fifty by these distances he has often tested witnesses if the witness proves fairly accurate in his estimates his evidence may be considered important for the case under investigation one can even rectify wrong estimates if for instance we find out that the witness is accustomed to estimate always too high or too low we can correct them by a species of personal equation such checks give the most instructive and remarkable results whoever practices them will soon be convinced that their importance cannot be exaggerated if accuracy of work is necessary in even the most insignificant cases it becomes in the highest degree important in serious cases where increased 
working material must be laid out for the future and a base of operations established here often the most incomprehensible things happen while perusing the papers connected with grave cases one often remarks that the base of operations once established the work has been carried on with the greatest care and accuracy and much sagacity has been expended but all this has been a dead loss for in establishing the base of operations an accessory circumstance of seeming insignificance has not been accurately observed or estimated a false premise has been included and the whole of the stately fabric built up so laboriously reposes on a tottering and yielding foundation two cases will be described giving a clear idea of what has been said in the first interesting for more than one consideration the singular fact came to light that the investigating officer actually stood for a long time above the corpse of the murdered man without being able to find him a blood-stained coat was found on the bank of a river in a fairly large town about the same time a man named j s who lived not far from this place disappeared on inquiries being made the coat was discovered to be that of j s the latter could not be traced fifteen days later an old saw-setter turned up and declared that one morning just after the disappearance he had noticed traces of blood at a certain spot near the river in question but not on the bank where the coat had been found the saw-setter could not read and was very deaf so that he had not heard till some time afterwards about the disappearance of j s and of his probable murder the place where the traces of blood were found was beside a bridge and at that point the river was banked up to a considerable depth and bordered by a very high wall behind this wall the snow gathered from the streets of the town was usually thrown after every snowfall great masses of snow were thrown over at this place and as in winter the river hardly ever came up to the foot of the wall a bank of snow twelve feet long and twelve feet deep often became heaped up and did not melt till late in the spring from the blood discovered by the saw setter which had long since disappeared it was supposed that the dead man had been thrown over the spikes that crowned the wall on to the bank of snow below and that he had been immediately buried beneath the sweepings of a heavy snowfall that had taken place on the night of his disappearance and which had been collected and thrown over in the early morning this took place on the fifteenth december it had snowed again on the twentieth and twenty seventh december and on each occasion fresh quantities of snow had been thrown on to the bank in question but during that winter no snowfall was so heavy as the first the investigators began to shovel these masses of snow into the river for the purpose of finding the corpse of the murdered man representatives of justice were present in order to draw up reports in the event of a discovery being made now the investigating officer desired to know whether the first snowfall had really taken place on the fifteenth december that is to say on the night of the disappearance of j s he himself having no exact recollection on the point he was informed that the fifteenth december was the date of the second snowfall which was not nearly such a heavy one as the first so that the body ought to be found resting on a bed of snow of a considerable depth formed by the first very abundant snowfall it was added that on the fifteenth this bed must have been six to eight feet in height it was then decided to dig until they had arrived approximately at the first bed of snow where the murdered man ought to be found they dug and shoveled away the snow and when what remained was no more than four feet in depth and it was certain that they had long before reached the first bed the work was abandoned but the saw setter though old and deaf was not mistaken for when the late spring had melted away the snow the corpse of the murdered man was found quite at the bottom on the ground bordering the river and at the very spot over which the investigating officer had stood for hours when the snow was being shoveled away the explanation was simply that the people questioned by the investigating officer concerning the date of the first snowfall were mistaken the fall of the fifteenth december was not the second but the first of that winter the corpse had been thrown over the wall when as yet no snow had been deposited beneath it and it was therefore necessary to search below and not above the first bed 
If the investigating officer had been more accurately informed about the date of the first fall, he would have removed that bed as well and the corpse would have been found. But much time had run on and to this day the author of the crime is unknown. The second case also relates to a murder and points out how inexact indications furnished by a large number of witnesses might have turned suspicion from the real criminals and let it fall upon an entirely innocent person. Two peasants of evil reputation and involved circumstances, Asp and B, had induced a third peasant, T, an old man, to accompany them to a cattle market some considerable distance away for the purpose of purchasing cattle they left their common residence at s together in the early morning and walked as far as l where they rested during the middle of the day at three o'clock they set out again with the object of going by way of v to d there to pass the night so as to arrive the morning after at m the place where the market was to be held only a league distant the next day t was found stretched in the ditch beside the road between the places l and v but nearer to v he was badly wounded in the nape of the neck and was unconscious in the course of the following day he came to himself and declared that all three had as we have said left l after their midday meal just as the hour of three was striking on the church clock and had continued on their way after having walked for about an hour s and b all at once asked whether the market would not be forbidden owing to cattle plague and said that information about it would have to be obtained in a village some distance from the road but t had declared that there was nothing to support their idea and besides that the information could be obtained at any inn along the road those on the road he had added were better informed than those away from it and it was useless to further lengthen their already long journey by making a detour by that village but esp and b were so obstinate about it that t supposed that they had something to do there which they wished to hide from him probably the purchase of a beast which they did not want him to know about and so he had told them to go to the village while he would slowly continue on his way until his two companions should rejoin him on the road after their detour but the two were away a long time and he sat down to await them on a milestone turning his back to the road for the wind was violent and raised up a great dust all at once he received a tremendous blow from behind on the head and he remembered nothing more the money set aside for the purchase of the cattle had disappeared some days later t died of his wounds without the possibility of again questioning him s and b declared in a way that certainly bore out each other's statement that they had really been to the village for no other purpose than to obtain information regarding the market that they had even at an inn questioned two wayfarers about it and that they had then started to rejoin t but had not found him on the road and had seen nothing of him lying in the ditch they had then come to the conclusion that he had gone on to v or d but as they had not found him they had proceeded to the market at m they had not heard speak of a man having been half killed until they were on their way back they had even been invited to go and see him at the house of a peasant because he had been identified by no one they had then recognized their comrade t that they had not seen him when he was already doubtless wounded and stretched in the ditch beside the road was explained by the fact that when they passed the scene of the crime it was already night being in the last days of autumn preliminary inquiries pointed to the fact that esp and b had the intention of attacking t at nightfall and of killing him and stealing his money in order to plan at their ease the details of the attack they had made the pretext of going to the village to ask for information concerning the market for they very well knew that t who was the worst walker of the three would not agree to the detour they could not possibly know that t would sit down on the stone and turn his back to them but they would probably have chosen for the place of the crime a forest to be passed through after dark but having seen him in a position so favorable to their scheme and the road being at that part very deserted and quiet they had immediately seized the opportunity of striking him down from behind and plundering him 
there was but one circumstance in favor of the accused namely that the story as told by them was not improbable a stranger might have killed t and plundered him and the two men would have been unable to see him in passing because it was already dark in fact many of the country people were questioned and unanimously stated that at that time of the year if one left l at three o'clock and made the detour by the village in question one could not at the slow pace of persons fatigued as the three men in question then were arrive at the scene of the crime before it was quite dark that the departure from l took place at three precisely was spoken to not only by the two accused but also by many other persons with whom they had kept company at the inn one of the former had even remarked there goes three o'clock we must be off as we have still a long way to go in spite of this weak point in the prosecution esp and b were found guilty at the beginning of spring the accused demanded a revision of the case they succeeded in effect in to some extent shaking the case for the prosecution they fastened suspicion on a young man of bad character who used to roam about in the neighborhood of the scene of the crime and as the point in favor of the accused already indicated namely whether they could have seen t lying wounded in the ditch always preserved its importance they proceeded to arrest the young man and revise the case against esp and b at this juncture the investigating officer took it into his head to investigate the incident on his own account it was naturally impossible to await the end of autumn which was the time of year at which the crime was committed so he asked two astronomers to indicate that day in spring which as regards light sunset etc would most closely correspond with the day in autumn on which the crime took place he then repaired to the scene on the given day accompanied by a magistrate they left l at three o'clock precisely walking slowly as esp b and t were supposed to have walked they made a detour by the village and remained there as long as esp and b said they had remained in order to give the accused the benefit of all the circumstances in their favor when they arrived on the scene it was still broad daylight they then made every imaginable trial they lay down by turns in the ditch on the side of the road where t had fallen from the milestone on receiving the blow and where he had been found on the following day they then alternately went back along the road turned round and advanced and came to the conclusion that from no matter what side of the road and even at a considerable distance one could not miss seeing that a man was lying in the ditch and no one could possibly pass without perceiving him only after lengthy experiments did night fall it was thus settled that the statements of all the witnesses rested on false suppositions and the only circumstance which had shown in favor of the accused did not after exact verification exist at all a number of analogous examples could be cited every investigating officer has come across them during his career just because they are so frequent they cannot be too strongly insisted upon the decisive importance of having the base of operations very firmly established cannot be too frequently pointed out besides as has been indicated it is mankind's nature to cling to points of support which have but little solidity one hears of a circumstance often but incidentally referred to by a witness and is easily disposed on its verification to base an argument upon it perhaps this argument is not without merit and giving satisfaction another and yet another argument is made to cling to it the case grows interesting and a successful result is in sight all the points thus gathered together are most minutely and carefully gone into but meanwhile the re-verification of the primary fact on which the whole structure is based has been neglected carried away by zeal and the desire to bring the case to some conclusion the investigating officer has proceeded too fast and without the calm and prudence requisite to such inquiries and so all his work has been in vain there is but one way to avoid this to proceed steadily be it at a walk at a trot or at the charge but in such inquiries a halt must from time to time be made and instead of going forward he must look back he will then examine one by one the different points of the inquiry taking them up in order from the beginning 
he will analyze each acquired result even to the smallest factor of those apparently of the least importance and when this analysis is carried to its furthest limits will carefully verify each of these factors from the point of view of its source genuineness and corroboration if the accuracy of these elements be established they may then be carefully placed one with another and the result obtained examined as if viewed for the first time the case will then generally assume quite another complexion for at the outset the sequence was not so well known and if it has a different aspect from at first each time the matter is so revised the question has to be asked whether it is in proper adjustment with the whole argument which has been formulated and whether there is any mistake to rectify if the whole result is defective the investigating officer must have sufficient self-denial to confess my calculation is false I must begin all over again. End of section six. Section seven of Criminal Investigation, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Tabler Criminal Investigation, a Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers Volume 1 by Hans Gross Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam Chapter 1. The Investigating Officer Continued Section 6. Knowledge of Men one of the requisites necessary to enable an investigating officer to work with accuracy is a profound knowledge of men for after all he cannot advance a step without utilizing the agency of men the people who play a role in an inquiry are only useful to furnish proofs they render just as much or just as little service to the investigating officer as he knows how to exact from them the impression of a foot found on the scene of a crime is absolutely of no significance to an ignorant investigating officer but it is a decisive proof if he knows how to make use of it a witness will tell nothing or make but inaccurate and unimportant statements to an incompetent investigating officer while the very same witness will make precise true and important statements to an investigating officer who can read him at a glance and knows how to handle him and if an investigating officer who has no knowledge of men by chance discovers the truth it is worthless to him there are witnesses who really desire to tell the truth but when witnesses do not wish to do so the result is truly lamentable the record shows only how the investigating officer has let himself be duped by the witnesses and led by them just where they chose a treatise on the knowledge of human character teaching how really to know men has never yet been written and probably never will be we can but indicate certain methods available in particular cases few though these unfortunately are a most important and really valuable means is the study of documents if there be any forming the record of the career of the accused one can then start with more confidence if the matter is of some importance the old record must be studied as if bearing on the case in hand it is not sufficient for example to merely read through the statements of the accused and to look up a few important registers the record must be studied in its entirety the whole history must be gone through step by step and in its fullest development in order to see how the accused has defended himself on previous occasions and compare that defense with his present one it is astonishing how men stick to the same defense and justification of their conduct even after a long space of time this is not to say that an individual who pleads guilty once will do so always or that if he has once endeavored to vindicate himself by throwing suspicion upon the witnesses that he will repeat the charge upon every occasion nothing in life repeats itself with such servile accuracy but the broad lines of the picture the whole impression that the examination has produced will be renewed as often as he is examined 
every investigating officer who following the procedure indicated studies at the outset the antecedent record of the accused will receive at the commencement of the new examination the impression that the accused is striking out a new line but as the examination advances he will regain little by little but very accurately the impression as a whole and will be definitely convinced that his man has not changed the process is indeed identical only perhaps with the difference that the individual has in the meantime acquired more experience has become more cunning and more circumspect or on the other hand that he has become older and has fallen away somewhat in craftiness and address the picture previously seen has become tarnished but the broad lines stand out quite plainly if one is in possession of the records in several cases relating to the accused and if they have been carefully studied one will know his man so well as to be able to say in advance how he will behave and what explanations he will give on what points he may be believed about what he will lie and how he must be handled in order to extract the truth from him the study of old records is very important not only in the case of the accused but also as regards important witnesses who are themselves old offenders or who have given evidence in other cases in this way one often discovers how easiest to handle the witness what to say to him how far to believe him and the readiest method of proving him to be a liar another guide to the knowledge of men consists in bringing to the examination the closest attention and in seeking all the time to read the very soul of the man the investigating officer who examines his witness only in order to complete a formality who closes the inquiry solely in order to make an end of it will certainly find few occasions of increasing his knowledge of men if the investigating officer wishes to know men every individual who enters his room must become an object worthy of study from the first moment the manner in which he presents himself looks around allows himself to be questioned replies asks questions in return in a word the way in which he behaves ought never even in the most insignificant affair be a matter of indifference to the conscientious investigating officer he must always make himself form an idea as to whether the person has spoken the truth and the whole truth or whether he has lied or passed over something in silence he must also look for the motives prompting the individual to act in the way in which he has done how his statements fit in with the circumstances which have to be taken into account the effect he has desired to produce what was of importance to himself and what means he has employed to make his testimony appear sincere and accurate the investigating officer ought to remember or better still note down what he has thus observed or believes he has observed this will be of use to him during the course of the inquiry if in its course he finds a circumstance proving the accuracy or inaccuracy of previous observations he secures in the first case confirmation of the view taken and in the second will endeavor to find out why he has been deceived and discover where and how the error has taken birth before finally leaving a case the investigating officer has a fresh opportunity at the time of the general revision always necessary on other grounds of going over all he has observed and comparing it with the results obtained this work costs much time and trouble but great profit is obtained from it in the shape of valuable and interesting observations for future guidance above all where the investigating officer has succeeded in completely elucidating an intricate case and has arrived at an unexpected result then it is most useful to go again over the inquiry and verify all the depositions of the witnesses noting how they accord with the now known course of events he can then understand why such a witness spoke with so much hesitation or why another was so embarrassed and he comprehends a mass of equivocal and uncertain statements many things which appeared to be quite contradictory now fit in together neatly he can explain the tone of voice the doubt or the assurance shown by the witnesses while giving evidence for future cases this task is most valuable 
yet it is not in the exercise of his duty that the investigating officer can best acquire this knowledge of men but in his daily and ordinary life in his relations with his fellows and in the course of ordinary events he does indeed learn while working and every case teaches him something new but his necessary occupations give him so much to do and in so many ways that they are not precisely the best suited for imparting instruction in following his profession he must always be in possession of pre-acquired knowledge this may be perfected and increased but the true time for studying is gone the principal reason is that nothing can be properly learned without actual experience practice is better than precept rightly says a popular proverb but experience can be very well gained in private life while it is not always convenient to acquire it during the exercise of one's profession to this end everything in life can be utilized every conversation every concise statement every word thrown out by chance every action every aspiration every trait of character every item of conduct every look or gesture observed in others be it only for a moment or during a long course of years and compared with events as they arise ascertain facts and realities the investigating officer ought indeed to keep a balance sheet for every man with whom he comes into contact noting down therein his observations upon his acts his words and physiognomy balancing them with events making comparisons and controlling and verifying them the best way to fill his diary if he keeps one will be to write down observations on himself and others but many things can be learned without written notes as a rule we find no difficulty in remembering the impression made upon us by the actions of others and do not easily forget the discovery of the mistakes we have made as regards them to him who goes through life with no desire to enlighten himself these disillusionments only produce a painful impression but he who wishes to profit by his experiences in life can obtain from them lessons of utility the best employed money says a frankfurt philosopher is that of which we have been defrauded because with that money we have purchased the circumspection necessary to life the investigating officer can also profit by those painful experiences which are the most numerous in life they invariably arise from false ideas we have acquired and when the mischief comes we may yet derive great profit from it if instead of bewailing our loss we look upon it as an interesting problem and try to find the cause the investigating officer will in such a case revive the idea first formed attempt to discover how he formed it and compare it with the experience just undergone the mistake committed may then be recognized and he will not repeat it and he will be able to make use of the acquired results of experience in his profession as criminal investigator other experiences than those in which we ourselves take part may prove valuable the smallest observation may some day be of decisive importance we are told something and believe it and later we discover its inaccuracy something is told us which we do not believe and afterwards find to be quite true this sort of thing appears of little importance in life but there is matter for instruction in it if we care to find out how we have allowed ourselves to fall into error how the mistake arose whether voluntarily or not how we might have been able to discover the truth at the time and why we did not discover it perhaps subsequent events will even enable us to find out the exact reason why the truth was kept dark how our mistake came about and finally the truth itself let us place ourselves in our former position and consider what our conclusion would then have been by acting frequently in this way we will be the less liable when analogous cases crop up what is above all of importance in private life is to ferret out the motive for a lie when a story about something has been related either to ourselves or to others false in some particular which we only discover later on we more often than not carry the matter no further because it is of no importance in itself but if we wish to gather a lesson therefrom we will try by a direct method for preference as by frankly and honestly asking the question to discover why the lie had been put in circulation 
most often we will find that the lie has been started out of human weakness rather than through real perversity throughout life we will find that lying is infinitely more common than is generally believed we shall be much less disposed to be indignant about falsehoods if we recognize that the motives for them are most often perfectly childish and foolish what an investigating officer has thus learned in private life can often be utilized in important cases he will understand that a man is not necessarily in league with a thief because he has not spoken the truth and that if he is told a falsehood it is often out of vanity or some other little human weakness but in an actual case the motive which has led the investigating officer into error is of little importance in many cases he will avoid being deceived by remembering these shabby motives but when even he has been convinced that the witness is not in league with the author of the crime he ought always to go on investigating in order to find out whether the witness had not some other motive for lying a motive which must often be sought for in quite another direction End of section seven section eight of criminal investigation volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by joseph tabler criminal investigation a practical handbook for magistrates police officers and lawyers volume one by hans gross translated by john adam and john collier adam chapter one the investigating officer continued section seven orientation finding his bearings the investigating officer is oriente that is has found his bearings the metaphor is derived from the mariner's compass when he knows his department his district his subordinates his auxiliaries the means at his disposal for facilitating his work his possible difficulties in short when he is acquainted with everything he may come across in his official career and what may be of service or disservice to him he must not forget that every case of even ordinary complexity presents or may present so many difficulties that when he comes to attack it he has neither time nor opportunity for studying the means calculated to lighten his labor or solve his difficulties all this ought to have been seen to beforehand suppose that an investigating officer has just arrived at his post in some part of the country his first duty is to make the acquaintance of his superiors and subordinates it is self-evident that the most important person to him is his principal assistant the magisterial clerk or police inspector or station house officer as the case may be for all depends on this man's intelligence willing cooperation and knowledge of the district and people when he can be trusted his information is most valuable to the young investigating officer more especially if the assistant happens to have been for a long time in his post the investigating officer will then try to obtain information about the other officials so as to know what to expect from them every official under government no matter what his duties is bound to promote the general welfare and it is incumbent on him in important cases to lend assistance to officials in other services but in order to command the help of other officials when needed the investigating officer ought to be on good terms with them beforehand and in his own sphere to show himself as serviceable to them this cooperation may be most varied and extend to every imaginable branch of information as a rule the most important thing to know is to what extent one can rely upon and trust people with whom one has business in the district in which the author started work there was an old tax collector who knew the people and country thoroughly in whom he could repose the most absolute confidence and who rendered him inestimable services nearly every day the author used to overwhelm him with questions and his kindness in answering them was inexhaustible he had lived in the district for a long time 
was a tireless walker and knowing the smallest village and its inhabitants was acquainted with everything he could be asked can a be relied on can you also get from x to y by way of z if someone steals a cow at m and brings it to n can he go by way of the mountain at o what would be the weight of the largest trout that can be poached from the stream p has q really the reputation of being a man of violence to a thousand questions of this kind he would reply accurately and without hesitation there are men of this description everywhere only they must be found out with such men at his disposition much labor and trouble and many mistakes may be obviated one such person is naturally not enough to give information the investigating officer must have them in every village and in each district he ought naturally to procure certificates of good character and good conduct and other information respecting different persons from the local police authorities which should find their allotted place among his records but any one who has any experience knows full well that the value of such documents is in most cases very small in theory these certificates should come from members of the community itself whereas they are in practice drawn up by officials and frequently a mere clerk prepares them in such cases but more especially in the latter personal opinion favor and disfavor relationship and friendship enmity and jealousy play a great part where is there for example a village magistrate who has not in his village either relations or friends or someone with whom he is quarreling or at arm's length if the investigating officer knows this and he ought to know it he cannot in good conscience base his opinions or decisions entirely upon a certificate thus drawn up to act conscientiously and wisely he ought to have men in whom he can trust to whom he can have recourse in difficult cases it must not be thought the act of a spy to obtain information from people in whom we have confidence concerning individuals whose testimony is for the time being of importance but it is not only when the need makes itself felt that such persons must be sought out they must be already known for a long time and have been often tested so that implicit reliance may be placed on them perhaps the investigating officer will not be ready at first sight to admit the utility of these people but when he has to appreciate the effect of an important but uncorroborated statement or compare the value of two contradictory depositions or still more to come to a conclusion as to the possibility of someone committing a crime of which he is accused then will he be too thankful to find an honest serious and trustworthy person who knows the situation and can give information concerning the character of the persons in question in european countries the most trustworthy information will generally be derived from the parish priest but such a source of information is almost wholly wanting in india the opinion of the military authorities upon old soldiers furnished in discharge notes and other documents is also of great importance the officer in command of the company of the man in question has had sufficient opportunities of observing him and that at a time when his character is revealed most forcibly and clearly the accuracy and justice of the notes made by military officers even when recorded a long time previously is often most striking the investigating officer ought to study as accurately as possible the local topography from the moment an official becomes an investigating officer he is no longer anything but an investigating officer all that he does observes studies or hears ought to be subordinated to the single aim of knowing how he can make use in his work of what he has learned he ought not exclusively to occupy himself with one side of things his knowledge ought to be extensive as extensive as possible everything can be of service to him and it is exactly for this reason that he ought to obtain information about everything but always with the view of making use of it as an investigating officer he will be indeed unable to go for a walk in the sense of strolling with mind at rest enjoying peacefully the beauties of nature 
he cannot go to the band merely for the pleasure of listening to the music in all the walks he makes either for pleasure or duty an ordnance or survey map should be in his hand so as to study thereon all the roads hills and watercourses engraving their names upon his memory he ought to know to whom the smallest hut belongs to make note of every road traversed to seek out known localities and establish their relative situation their distance apart and the means of communication between them to know what can be seen therefrom and how far the view extends when he sets out he should look at his watch and should afterwards mark on the back of his map the time it takes from point to point a peasant can but give in hours or parts of an hour or native measures of time as nali gaze twenty four minutes or jams three hours the distance from his house to the temple the toddy shop the shavidi the tana the nearest railway station etc etc for he finds it inconvenient to arrive late at a religious ceremony miss his train etc if he is questioned upon any other distance he will no doubt always answer promptly but also invariably inaccurately and this may often be the source of grave mistakes it is not always possible when necessity arises to have the distance measured by an official and therefore a note of it should be taken in advance as opportunity presents there are localities which the investigating officer must examine in the light of future events hotels and drinking shops and brothels because of brawls that may take place in them mortuaries because of post-mortems that may be carried out there ponds and wells in villages on account of possible accidents by drowning forests because of poaching and illicit felling etc he must try to become acquainted with the local police stations the organization of forest guards the beats of the perambulating police force salt and abkari circles tanks and irrigation systems the manner of closing doors windows stables and outhouses within the distance of a league one often finds quite dissimilar practices attention must also be paid to industrial works and technical installations which vary greatly according to localities because when the case arises one often finds very great difficulty in understanding them from the descriptions given of them which are always more or less defective a flour mill an oil mill a sawmill a blacksmith's forge a stone quarry a coke furnace a brick and tile kiln and many other industrial establishments differ in appearance in different localities and cannot be pictured from mere description to know what they are really like they must have been seen every one has found by experience that he can form but a very inexact idea of one of these places from a mere verbal description on the other hand it is thoroughly comprehended if seen only once a great many educated people have never entered a flour mill or a sawmill in their lives and yet such establishments have considerable interest this is all the more surprising as every one must have passed say an oil mill hundreds of times and could have inspected it without any inconvenience the investigating officer should never let slip an opportunity of visiting an industrial establishment or factory of having everything shown and explained to him in the most detailed manner he will generally find the management ready to afford every information every man especially the plain man is pleased when interest is shown in his work and what he happens to be doing when he can teach and explain anything he always exhibits willingly and readily whatever there is to be seen if one already knows something of what he is showing you so much the better he will be the more disposed to speak if one knows nothing care must be taken in questioning him for ordinary folk cannot imagine that educated people know nothing of such everyday things he will become distrustful and circumspect fancying that he is being played with one must be contented in such a situation with examining asking short questions and listening on the next occasion things will work better if the investigating officer has some technical knowledge of this kind he can in many cases facilitate his work take for example a mill not a very rare thing 
and suppose that the investigating officer has never in his life set foot in one an accident takes place in the mill or a burglary or a fraud or embezzlement by the staff or a fire etc each of these cases will have some connection with the technical construction of the mill the accident has been brought about for instance by a fault of manufacture or material or want of supervision in some part of the building the burglar will also have profited by some portion of the machinery the staff could not have carried out the frauds without knowing the plan of the interior and the relative position of the various departments as regards fire one cannot possibly find out how it has taken place without knowing the complete fitting up of the mill how can an investigating officer conduct the inquiry in such a case when he possesses not the slightest assured base for his investigations let it be again remarked that the recollection of places once seen is easily retained most men find little difficulty in remembering places even when the details have been forgotten the memory is soon refreshed when a witness begins to speak about them another important point is that of the means of communication in a district main roads ordinary roads cart tracks footpaths etc it is not difficult to become acquainted with these the investigating officer has only to find and mark on the map all the roads he has passed over and see whether they are correctly set down which will probably be the case as regards the principal arteries corrections will mainly show where a main road has degenerated into a side track through the making of a new main road or when a second class road has been promoted to the position of a main road he will also note down any other changes that may have taken place such as new buildings houses abandoned changes in the nature of the crops alterations in water courses etc in short his map must be always kept up to date nor should ordinary foot bridges newly made or disused be forgotten nor wells tanks marshes ponds or other pieces of water be overlooked to these latter special attention must be given on a map the extent and direction of the water may be seen but this is not enough we must note the depth nature of banks change in the volume of water sluices fords and dams in short all particulars in connection with the water for water plays a role in many a criminal case and it is not easy to do good work while unacquainted with its usual aspects finally attention must be paid to the interior of houses when in the country the investigating officer has examined in full detail several peasants houses big and small he knows practically all others for they are constructed in accordance with a small number of types but these several types must be known the various parts of the houses and the uses they are put to must be noticed other great difficulties would be encountered in the very first case of theft or burglary much confusion was caused in a case some time ago in madras until it came out that the presiding judge was unaware of the ordinary plan of a hindu house with one or more courtyards behind never having been in one he imagined that the rooms facing the street formed as in a european cottage the whole house it is also of the greatest importance that the investigating officer should be thoroughly posted up about the experts that he will have at his command when the occasion arises naturally he ought to be perfectly well acquainted with the special talents singularities and weaknesses of the most important experts the medical jurisprudence the experts in other departments ought also to be known to him such as experts in firearms building valuations etc all these should be known beforehand he must learn what to expect from them and how they may be usefully employed but for this it will not suffice merely to know their profession this can be done by reading their particular talents and singularities must be accurately ascertained when a person is a good linguist or has traveled is a numismatist has knowledge of horses possesses a microscope or a well-trained dog 
he does not publish it to all the world but each of these circumstances may be of the greatest utility in the mafasal in the first case he can act as an interpreter in the second make sure whether a criminal is speaking the truth about his supposed travels in the third he can examine false coin in the fourth discover a horse fraud in the fifth lend his instrument to the medical man in the last lend his dog to track down some criminal a photographic camera will always be useful and even where an individual has no other peculiarity than that of having been born in a different country he may still be useful in exposing some foreigner or stranger pretending perchance to belong to that very same country but actually speaking quite another dialect in the smallest towns there are always certain people in possession of knowledge which may subsequently when occasion arises prove to be most valuable if in towns the police force and its auxiliaries are of great value to the investigating officer the rural police are none the less so for without them he could do little and often nothing at all but the result obtained with the aid of the police will in fact depend on the investigating officer himself if the investigating officer is on good terms with the police force and knows how to make use of it he will be assured of good results otherwise the result will be negative and in the latter case the investigating officer is always at fault and not the police but a subordinate is not a machine even a policeman put into uniform and subjected to military discipline preserves his individuality you cannot kill it and must therefore submit to learn how to make use of it this is why the investigating officer should possess the most accurate information as to the humor character and education of his assistants take for example the case of a magistrate directing an investigation by the police undoubtedly it is the business of the police superintendent or inspector and not of the magistrate to select the individual officer to be employed for any special duty when the magistrate writes send a policeman to do so and so such an order is irreproachable as an official order but is it enough one officer is distinguished for tact another for energy another for unusual physical strength if in a difficult case one of these qualities is specially demanded everything may be lost if the right man is not employed but quite possibly the inspector does not know all the particulars of the case or the plans of the magistrate often he has no time to study the details and if the magistrate does not go beyond a dry official letter no great result can be expected but if the magistrate knows the men and their special qualifications he will take care to have a consultation with the inspector as to the man to be detailed then he will have the officer sent to him explain the case and give him his opinions and plans he will listen also to the views of the officer he will take precautions against incidents which may crop up he will discuss with him the various ways of setting to work in a word he will explain the whole matter as clearly as possible thus posted up the officer will certainly do his best his self-conceit thus awakened will prove a powerful stimulant and if his work is well done he should be congratulated on his success a cordial word of encouragement and praise is so quickly given and goes so far think of the difficulty of a policeman's work often heavily laden often insufficiently protected from cold or heat he has to tramp many miles to fulfill a mission for which he is solely responsible strictly tied down by the innumerable ligaments of red tape unable to take counsel with anyone he must display the finest tact indomitable courage do neither too much nor too little and finally reduce the whole to the limits of a complete and accurate report if he has done all this without mistake his cooperation must prove most valuable and it is only common justice on the part of the magistrate whom he has saved so much trouble and work and whom he has provided with so useful a foundation for his further inquiries to tender his devoted assistant a word of acknowledgment and thanks he should also express his satisfaction in presence of the man's comrades and superiors honor to whom honor is due well-earned praise is the best stimulant of zeal 
nothing discourages a man so much as to find his superior always discontented constantly finding fault and never having a good word to say of any one or anything this must be kept in view in all our relations with subordinate officials end of section eight section nine of criminal investigation volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Tabler. Criminal Investigation, a Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers. Volume 1 by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Chapter 1. The Investigating Officer. Continued. Section 8. Jurymen. The idiosyncrasies of Indian jurymen have perhaps but little interest for the investigating officer. Indeed, India and England are probably the only civilized countries in which the officer, be he policeman or magistrate, who has investigated an offense has, except rarely and accidentally, nothing to do directly with its presentation before the higher tribunals. Indirectly, of course, he has, for upon the evidence collected by him, will be based the brief of the public prosecutor or prosecuting police inspector. Occasionally he may have to instruct these officers, but the instruction generally consists only of a readiness to answer any questions that may be suggested to them by the record. Still it will be useful for the investigating officer to bear in mind that his work may at times be submitted to a body of men whose decisions often can be explained by no discoverable principles and whose intellectual and moral faculties work in mysterious ways considering also that his labors will be presented to this body by a third person it is all the more incumbent on him to endeavor before the case leaves his hands to eliminate every possible cause of error discernible by the eye of ordinary human intelligence in this view the investigating officer will endeavor to present the case to himself as it would appear to a person absolutely devoid of the experience he himself possesses every investigating officer will recall to memory how difficult he found it when first starting on his career to discover what was decisive and what not what was true and what false what possible and what impossible he was impressed with a so-called proof which an experienced jurist would at once detect as worthless many things appeared to him as irrelevant which the instructed eye would fix on as the crucial point he possesses knowledge of legal theories of substantive law and of procedure the juryman knows nothing of these things he is expected all of a sudden to plunge into the whole history of the case he has to understand the position of the various counsel see what is proved for and against retain in his mind a whole mass of detail possess knowledge follow the pleadings take note of the leading points coordinating and making use of them and finally bring a just judgment to bear upon the whole case all this without previous education without experience without practice it is a hundred times beyond what any man can fairly be called upon to do the advocate who has spent long years of his career appearing before juries and pleading before them learns to read their faces and to tell the moment when they begin to understand the case generally jurymen are not wanting in a praiseworthy desire to comprehend everything their faces betray the nervous effort they make to see clearly the expression grows more and more attentive and strained it becomes a real mortification to them when they fail to follow the thread of the argument at last these faces causing the advocate such anxiety relax and express satisfaction the jurymen see clear but what has dissipated their perplexity alas it is too often some insignificant and irrelevant statement of a witness enunciated with emphasis the reading of a good conduct certificate of no importance a word let fall by the judge 
a mere guess of an expert advocate may decide the case in the mind of the jury the juryman clings to this insignificant detail he never gives it up he decides by it the guilt or innocence of the accused the investigating officer should therefore in the course of his inquiry never forget that his work may one day be placed before a jury of the uninitiated these bestow great attention upon the mode in which an inquiry has been conducted they are always trying to find out if the investigating officer is worthy of belief or not as judges they are also incompetent an inexact though absolutely unimportant piece of information an insignificant contradiction an unimportant gap which a juryman has himself discovered in the inquiry is sufficient motive for distrusting the whole case for the prosecution it loses all value in their eyes and the accused is acquitted in face of the most overwhelming proofs of his guilt on the other hand a smart bit of procedure the revelation of an accessory fact or some other circumstances will so please a jury that it will condemn the accused simply from confidence in the public prosecutor the very man whose duty it is to run the accused in what has been said is no exaggerated statement facts easily verify it a juryman a huntsman has been heard to say it was enough for me to see that the public prosecutor knew the close time for stag hunting he was the man for me and i said guilty for if the accused had not been really guilty the public prosecutor would have let him off long ago a tradesman said i cannot make up my mind to a verdict of guilty for there are some points in the case not properly cleared up the public prosecutor does not seem to know much about the different kinds of coffee another juryman could not get over the following contradiction a witness had said before the committing magistrate the man wore a black cap at the sessions he said the man had a dark colored cap even if there had been a contradiction it was absolutely unimportant again the investigating officer should be careful to arrange in as simple clear and comprehensible a manner as possible all the documents that may have to be read at the trial search lists inquest reports reports of experts previous depositions letters etc above all the proofs of evidence must be taken down from the witnesses with scrupulous accuracy and it should be impressed on the witness to say exactly what he has seen or heard and not merely something like it many persons suppose it is matter of indifference which of several synonyms is employed frequently it is of no importance and an experienced judge knows it does not matter if a witness who has spoken of breeches now uses the word pantaloons but the juryman who is unsettled by every little circumstance who is on the pounce to detect contradictions is astonished at this difference of expression and does not know what the consequences may be it is dangerous for a public prosecutor to put forward conclusions trusting to the investigating officer both he and the judge may have the best of grounds for placing confidence in the investigating officer but it is otherwise with that amateur judge the juryman the slightest contradiction or mistake will destroy all confidence all the more if the juryman be an expert or imagine himself to be one one instance will suffice the question was whether a bull when running could overthrow the fence of a garden the investigating officer had stated in his report that in his opinion considering the construction of the fence it was impossible this was a point in favor of the accused but among the jurymen was a butcher who maintained with persistent obstinacy that a bull could break down any fence whatever and this opinion alone was sufficient to convince him of the guilt of the accused argument was useless the butcher kept repeating a mad bull is capable of anything and everything so the accused was found guilty although there was really nothing against him all this is very human and easily explained we are all ready at all times to put forward our own knowledge professional or special particularly when we know nothing about the matter really at stake the words allow me i know this class of business constantly used even when there is no question of business at all is regularly in evidence among jurymen 
often entailing most unfortunate results. For the same reason, care must be taken to guard against any mistake, even in the minutest detail. If one of the jurymen discover a mistake, however irrelevant to the issue, the result of the whole case may depend on that and that alone. Finally, as has already been indicated, the case must be put before the jury with the greatest simplicity attainable. The mistakes and misunderstandings that arise when documents are read out pass all belief. The juryman sees and hears during the case so many things he has never seen or heard before. He is introduced into a strange world where he has to strain every nerve to comprehend but a little of what is going on. If the case is badly put before him, his trouble is increased and he sees everything awry. And if the documents, such as search lists, occurrence reports, etc., are crammed full of technical terms, understood well enough by police and lawyers, his confusion is worse confounded. But even if such be carefully excluded, a jury may comprehend nothing if the document is not written in easy language, with clear statements, logically agreeing with one another, so that the conclusions follow naturally, with no conclusion based upon a supposition, however probable, and every point easy to see. The whole should be such that the most simple-minded may comprehend it readily and without hesitation. To secure this, it is a good plan to read the whole beforehand to some trustworthy but ignorant fellow and make him repeat the sense of what has been read to him. One will then hear the most astonishing things, ideas which one thought expressed clearly and beyond the possibility of mistake are found to be misunderstood conclusions have been drawn just the opposite of those desired when alterations have been made so that our man thoroughly understands the matter it will be found that the phrases and words employed are the simplest possible then we may risk putting it before a jury with comparative safety the best method to adopt in every case that is to go before a jury is to arrange everything as if one were dealing with a child stick to the truth draw no conclusions exclude everything that may appear contradictory use the simplest words and be absolutely clear in this way failure may sometimes be avoided section nine the expeditious investigating officer the struggle with crime is after all only a war for which the first necessity is plenty of money Money is the best aid for the conduct of criminal justice. With money, we can secure the best men and can provide them with every modern aid to success. With money, investigating officers may be remunerated suitably to their work and position. But in return, we may expect to enlist picked men who will recognize that they must devote time and trouble in preparing themselves for a difficult but well-paid career. Money can procure the best reports from the best experts. If adequately remunerated, they will spare neither time nor trouble nor experiment. With money, independent witnesses can be procured, who if properly recompensed for loss of time and traveling charges, will come willingly when they know anything about the matter, while if the examination of such a witness involves a material loss to him, he will try to conceal the fact that he knows anything, so as not to be obliged to appear before the court. With money we can make journeys, researches, and costly experiments. And finally with money, a sufficient number of officials may be appointed, particularly investigating officers, so that each may work at his ease, with care and application, without overwork and hurry, and without being interrupted at every moment. But if the service is undermanned and the pecuniary allotment is insufficient, what is to be done? In answer to this query, we have the invention of the expeditious officer. What is this product of the official imagination? He is an investigating officer who never complains of having too much work and who in truth never has too much, for he closes his inquiry in a simple, easy, and rapid manner. He neither creates nor discovers any difficulty. In his office are no gorgons and hydras and chimeras dire. 
nor other monsters he brings his inquiries to a conclusion before too many questions and too accurate investigations can swell them out and transform them into minotaurs bound to swallow up his time indeed every inquiry may be closed extremely quickly if one wishes if one considers it unnecessary to take the evidence of certain persons who have been named there is no need to enter their names in the list of witnesses for the prosecution and if they are not on the list there is no necessity to question them here is time gained at once let some ignorant persons be asked whether a visit to the spot will help to clear up the case and they will reply no here then is sufficient excuse for not paying the visit and here again time is saved a band of thieves is accused of having committed a dozen burglaries there is quite enough evidence to get them convicted and one is not absolutely obliged to start the police upon investigations which may perhaps bring to light another dozen which the same band has committed here again time is saved suppose there is a big cheating case it is quite the thing to pick up certain well-established facts and stop there doubtless to do the thing well one ought to place the matter on a wide basis and to study and clear up in its entirety the procedure of the person who has committed the fraud and examine the whole business from the point of view of loyalty to one's employers but is one under any obligation to do so by not doing so more time is saved again what a lot of work there is to fix the real blame in an accident case what endless consultations with experts what repeated visits to the spot what minute questionings all taking up such an enormous amount of time by fixing the responsibility upon the first workman who is found at fault the whole case is ended like a shot these examples might be multiplied without end a little time saved in each inquiry ends in the gain of a considerable amount in the long run the inquiries run on all right and when our artistic investigating officer is sufficiently skilled in suppressing the difficulties and obstacles that may prove troublesome in quick work he will well deserve the title of expeditious let the investigating officer who has no qualms of conscience when gathering such laurels act thus if he so desires it would be useless to try to turn him from his course whether he will be able to look back without remorse upon his work even though his fame for being expeditious has brought him many substantial advantages is another question no one will suggest that inquiries should languish or be conducted slowly that it is necessary to write or do what is absolutely superfluous or to pigeonhole papers so as to gain time for some happy inspiration to arise but in a serious inquiry we must seek out what may however indirectly furnish or corroborate proof of the guilt or innocence of an accused the investigating officer who neglects this primary duty incurs a very great responsibility the conduct of every inquiry costs much time and trouble the smallest piece of forgetfulness or the most pardonable carelessness may have the gravest and worst consequences to do good work and to be expeditious are two things which mutually exclude each other every investigating officer should renounce the vain glory of being considered expeditious End of section 9section 10 of criminal investigation volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by joseph tabler criminal investigation a practical handbook for magistrates police officers and lawyers volume 1 by hans gross Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Chapter 1. The Investigating Officer. Continued. Section 10. Accuracy and Precision in Details. We shall now notice certain details which, small in themselves, are of importance when taken together. 
it seems superfluous to state that the investigating officer should avoid all disorder and yet it too often happens that an investigating officer who has not a natural instinct for order and neatness does not keep his eye close enough to many small matters especially when he is much worried in his work this often occasions subsequent regret it most frequently happens in an inquiry which at the outset appears to be of no consequence but which afterwards becomes important and assumes enormous proportions at the outset things have not been put in proper order the opportunity when more care might have been taken properly to tabulate the case and records has passed unnoticed and the investigating officer suddenly finds himself in complete disorder and confusion in a matter which has become extremely and urgently important notes must therefore be kept in most minute order the most insignificant things must be written down at once so as not to accumulate for a future date fully occupied with unexpected work mistrust the hourly expression i will not forget for the moment it is remembered tomorrow it is forgotten this is all the more dangerous because it is just the more important things which one thinks will never be forgotten and in consequence it is just the important things that are forgotten appointments with witnesses things to be attended to on a certain day adjournments and in short all those things that have to be done at a certain fixed date must be carefully noted down further the notes already made must be run through so as to find out not only what time remains free but also what has been assigned to the following days otherwise one may be disagreeably surprised at the last moment by an adjournment which is about to expire or a formality absolutely necessary to be accomplished the investigating officer should be inexorable in demanding from his clerk a legible handwriting one cannot demand from a person who does not possess it an elegant hand but anyone given the will can write legibly the investigating officer must in case of need inspire his clerk with this humble ambition the clerk thinks perhaps that he gains a few minutes by writing rapidly but those who have to read the record himself included will lose hours in deciphering what has been written too speedily to be legible equal care must be taken with regard to paging and numbering the marking of exhibits and marking for identification other objects not exhibited but connected with the case if the subject matter of the crime such as the articles stolen or the accounts fabricated correspondence photographs etc are not described accurately or are not placed in their proper position in the record endless confusion will perhaps result and certainly great loss of time the best descriptions of objects are good for nothing if they cannot be referred to at need it may appear almost incredible but we have heard the statement according to the photograph this is certainly the man and yet no one knows what photograph has been shown to the witness or again the witness on being brought into the presence of a and b says it is the taller of the two that committed the crime but no one who has not the pleasure of knowing a and b can say which is the taller again on reading the letters dated one three five ten january the witness affirms of these letters only those in the good handwriting were written by me and whoever has the task of getting up the case is forced to pick out the letters indicated by examining the handwriting the perpetration of inaccuracies is not only a mark of disrespect towards those who may afterwards have to go through your work but it is far from conscientious for grave confusion and error may result therefrom in certain cases it is necessary for a tabular statement to be drawn up this is specially recommended wherever there are several charges against the accused or where several accused are involved this table will miss its aim if only drawn up when the work is over or if it contains merely a few inadequate headings the investigating officer must not forget that his table has a double aim 
it ought to facilitate the work of anyone who has to go through the record subsequently to the investigating officer and it ought also to enable the investigating officer himself to take in at a glance the case as a whole give him a lead as to whether his work is complete and enable him to revise it if necessary but to attain this end the investigating officer ought at the outset to draw up a table divided into a greater or lesser number of headings this he fills in as the work advances and opens headings corresponding to all the important points of the inquiry these headings ought not in any particular case to refer only to the questions who why where when how with what but ought also to indicate the accomplices the circumstances for and against the different criminal characteristics a confession or offer of damages and other important circumstances if these headings are filled in as the case goes on the investigating officer in the course of or at the end of the inquiry has but to cast his eye over the table to know if all is complete or if there is yet some point to clear up to judge of the care and accuracy of an investigating officer it often suffices to see how he has drawn up a tabular statement of great importance are the so-called plans or tables on which the result of the inquiry is shown in a graphic way so that the connection of the most important incidents can be gathered by a single glance at the plan for this purpose it is by all means necessary that the chief and important points of the inquiry must be selected and only these ought to be put down on the plan because putting down anything unimportant is not only a loss of time and trouble but also irritates the reader as then he must give wrong values to some portions of the table the possibility of using such plans happens very often and especially when the inquiry deals with the movements of a person or a thing this occurs for example if an accused committed several crimes at several places or if he had important meetings at several places also if an object has passed from hand to hand if at a big affray many injuries especially to several persons have been inflicted finally if a connected proof against one man has to be constructed out of many rather trifling incidents which only by being linked up show their real value for example a arrives at x on the sixteenth january he meets b on the seventeenth january sells his coat on eighteenth january he asks for work from the person c on the nineteenth january he buys a black hat on twentieth january etc in the department for samples of criminalistic work in the criminal museum at graz there is a sheet of paper reproduced on the next page which shows a complete although rather difficult inquiry in a certain rather large district many false fifty florin notes appeared the inquiry had the result of showing that these notes were traced back to one man who again had received them from several people in italy where near adine a big gang of forgers was detected the members of which circulated these notes the result of the inquiry has been reproduced by the investigating officer on paper so that the whole is reduced to the simplest fashion from below upwards all the people marked down as they received the banknotes till they joined in the hand of one man saglio from whom again upwards can be traced the origin of the notes the table has four individuals that saglio got the notes from and the numerous ones below who he passed them along to end of section 10 read by joseph tabler Section 11 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Cynthia Sheeler. Website, Cynthia Sheeler at ICANVoice.com. Criminal Investigation, a practical handbook for magistrates, police officers, and lawyers. Volume 1 by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Examination of Witnesses and Accused. Section 1, General Considerations. The object of the examination or interrogatory is to inform the investigating officer of the occurrence and all its details as if he had been present in person. If the witnesses examined have actually been present, they should tell what they have seen or heard in such a manner that the investigating officer may imagine that he himself has seen or heard. If the witnesses only give indirect circumstantial testimony, the facts they speak to as being connecting links should produce on the investigating officer the same effect as if he himself had witnessed them. If the person suspected confesses, his testimony will practically have the same weight as that of an accomplice. If he denies, his statements will complete the information obtained in other quarters. Finally, the testimony of the expert enables the investigating officer to view the whole case, not alone with his own eyes, but with the assistance of the expert's knowledge. In short, the result of the testimony recorded should be such as to enable the investigating officer to understand the case as if he himself had been present and in possession of the necessary knowledge. If this result is attained, the inquiry is at an end, if not, of two things. One, either it was in reality impossible to collect sufficient proof, or if it was possible, the investigating officer could not find it. In the latter event, either the inquiry is incomplete, in which case the gaps may at some future time be filled up, or it has failed, and the mistake cannot be set right. In the former case, the investigating officer has been balked by fate. In the second, he has bungled. An investigating officer may be said to do well in proportion as he is able to reduce the number of inquiries in which the necessary basis of proof cannot be secured. Further, to form an opinion As to the ability of an investigating officer, it is necessary to see whom and how he interrogates. For witnesses are, so to speak, the skeleton of an inquiry, their evidence being the flesh and blood. If among the persons necessary to be questioned, some have been omitted, the skeleton is incomplete and unstable. If all have been examined, but their testimony is defective, there is indeed a body, but it is lifeless, or at least weak and good for nothing. The investigating officer frequently decides in a very easy manner the question as to whether any specific person should be examined as a witness or as an expert in any matter. He has before him the complaint or the police occurrence reports in which certain persons are named as able to furnish information. They are summoned and interrogated. They and the accused introduce the names of other persons who are examined in turn and who may introduce perhaps a third lot of names. This process goes on until no one is mentioned or at least no one not yet examined. The investigating officer will then perhaps find it necessary to examine experts. All these statements are collected together to form the record and the inquiry may be considered at an end. The whole business has gone forward easily and naturally. One conclusion has led step by step to the next. Every person whose name has been mentioned has been heard. The whole is complete. There is no gap in the inquiry. All this is true in a certain sense. Naturally, an investigating officer who has worked in this way cannot be charged with laziness or negligence, but he can be reproached 
with having simply turned the handle and played the tune on a barrel organ, of having been the sport of events like a morsel of wood carried along by the stream, of having followed all the formulae without directing or conducting to its close the inquiry. Let the investigating officer who is insensible to such reproach go on in his old way. That is his affair. But he who is sworn to do his duty and to do his very best should face the matter otherwise and look upon it, above all, as a systematic whole. He must always keep clearly before him the fact that in the natural development of things, nothing happens per saltum. By fits and starts, nothing comes about which is inexplicable, isolated, incoherent. Every result follows naturally on its cause. Every fact can be explained, is one among many united facts, has a plain story to tell. Humanity had a beginning. It has been fashioned, without interruption, without gaps, not by chance, but by design. The same may be said of everything springing from man, his language, his actions, his will, and his capacity, his efforts, and the results he obtains. All is a living organism, developing gradually and naturally, an organism put together with the greatest care, and in which everything that exists in any specified place has its reason for being there and must of necessity be found there. So is it with all human actions. Not one of them happens by pure chance unconnected with the other happenings. None are incapable of explanation. They are fruits which must of necessity develop under the influence of nature and individual culture, fruits whose formation is explained by the organism producing them. They are attached to the individual as the leaf is attached to the tree on which it is grown. They emanate from the individual as naturally as surely as the fruit emanates from the tree. We do not look to gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles. If the investigating officer is penetrated with this idea, then in regard to every crime in which he is interested, he will remember this, that the people mixed up in the affair are necessarily and naturally connected with it, whether their role be active or passive, whether they be complainants or accused or only outsiders. Just as a scientific naturalist examining an organism which he has not before seen, or which belongs to periods of creation long ago disappeared, can recognize with what other organisms it was born, lived, and disappeared. So the investigating officer, from mere scrutiny of the deed, can say what sort of people have been mixed up in it, what sort of people have been round about. Not chance meetings nor the readiness of the persons first questioned should guide the investigating officer, but the systematic rebuilding up of the case, the clear and first conception of its natural development. Of course, he will interrogate those who have seen how the criminal set to work. That will form part of the first statement of facts. But how did the affair start? Why did it happen in the particular way? What were the motive and the final object? What obstacles were there? How were they surmounted? What were the antecedent facts? And how connected with the catastrophe? All that has to be built up, and to answer such questions, the investigating officer must not trust the windfalls of chance and the cordiality of the witnesses. And then, what is to be done if no one has seen anything, if there be no witnesses to the deed itself? and consequently no connecting thread. Here comes in the supposed art of heaping testimony on testimony, of making the necessity for one witness spring from the testimony of another. And if the investigating officer have recourse to this plan, summoning the persons first seen in the vicinity or who have heard any rumor, and then interrogating all the mortals named by them, he will be almost always led astray and found wandering from the goal. The investigating officer must, in such a case, reconstruct the occurrence, 
build up by hard labor a theory fitted in and coordinated like a living organism. And just as on seeing the fruit, he will recognize the tree and the country of its growth, so from the scrutiny of the deed, he can presume how it has been brought about, what have been the motives, and what kind of persons have been employed in it. The secondary characters in the picture will find themselves. How can one acquire the necessary precision of glance, and how form the picture in any particular case? No precise rules can, indeed, be laid down on this point, but certain it is that even in the most difficult case, if one conjure up in the mind's eye, quietly, prudently, and thoughtfully, the way in which events have occurred, one will always arrive at a safe conclusion as to the circle or class in which persons who know something will be found. It is for the police to get a hold of their names. These persons will be examined as witnesses, but whenever an advance has been made, one must begin anew, making fresh deductions and rectifying previous conclusions, so as to hit upon new circles where persons likely to furnish information can be found. But an investigating officer must never, under no circumstances, allow himself to follow the paths along which he is pushed be it designedly or accidentally, by the various witnesses. Apart from the fact that the reconstitution of the crime for oneself is the only effective method, it is the only interesting one, the only one that stimulates the inquirer and keeps him awake at his work. The procedure to be followed in interrogating parties is prescribed by law, and these rules will, of course, be followed. But that is not all. The legislator cannot, in a few words, lay down how an investigating officer must proceed to get into his interrogatory what must be largely supplied by experience and capacity. Much of these are required. Zeal and readiness are also essential. But the possession of instinct is indispensable. The investigating officer is indeed born, not made, and the development by assiduous study of knowledge of men, while often perspicuous mind, clear and penetrating, will alone affect the desired solution. The tact, that faculty which nothing can replace, to light instinctively upon the best way to set to work, is a natural gift. Whosoever does not possess it will never make an investigating officer, though he be endowed a hundredfold with all the other necessary qualities. With the best intentions in the world, he will stumble against everything without discovering anything. He will intimidate the witness who wishes to give him important intelligence. He will excite the babbler to babble still more. He will encourage the imprudent, confuse the timid, and let the right moment slip past. Whoso has tact can instinctively distinguish what is purely individual from what is general. Whoso is devoid of tact never can. Now, an investigating officer who cannot do this is not fit to question a witness, for every man differs essentially from his neighbors. Every man has a presence of his own, sees, hears, and feels differently from others, relates what he has perceived in his own way. Yet, men are all the same, and individual differences disappear and are swallowed up in broad common outlines. The groundwork is always the same. The form alone differs. We see the differences clearly if we stick only to the form. But on examining the groundwork, we find things identical and invariable. Fortunate is he who can distinguish the merely formal from the fundamental. The advice that can be given under this head is intended more particularly to direct the attention of the investigating officer to special circumstances likely to give rise to difficulties and mistakes. What is here supplied is extracted from the larger work of the author on criminal psychology. Section 2. Examination of Witnesses
There is but little real difference between the testimony of witnesses and the statements of suspected or accused persons, but they are arrived at by different routes. In the case of witnesses, the truth should be directly deducible from their depositions. In the case of the accused, it can be inferred only indirectly from the manner in which he endeavors to justify himself taken along with information gathered from other quarters. Therein lies the essential differences, and not in any external formalities. But this difference is so important that it will be well to treat the two classes separately and confine ourselves in this section to witnesses alone. In the examination of witnesses, the principal task of the investigating officer is twofold. He must watch carefully that all the important points of the case are taken up and dealt with, none being omitted, and he must further make sure that the witnesses speak the truth, the plain truth, the whole truth. We have already shown how to ensure the former end. To obtain the truth from his witnesses, the investigating officer has still to contend with two classes of difficulties. On the one hand, the witnesses may have the best intentions of telling the plain and entire truth, but it is absolutely impossible for him to do so. He has observed badly, or has badly comprehended what he has observed. On the other hand, the witnesses may have the deliberate intention of lying. The method to follow and the precautions to adopt differ in two cases. The difficulties in the former case are greater and harder to overcome than those in the latter. A. When the witness desires to speak the truth. Let us place ourselves at a perfectly general point of view. We note at once that in daily life, in connection with the most ordinary occurrences, different persons perceive them differently and describe them differently. Many matters of this kind can be cleared up by making all the witnesses give faithful accounts to the events in which each has taken part or which have occurred in the presence of several persons. It is a small matter whether the fact be important or insignificant, for frequently witnesses who have to depose to the most important circumstances in a sensational case do not imagine at the time that something apparently so insignificant will one day be of first importance. Take any occurrence in which you yourself have taken part along with others and make these others describe it, one by one and separately. You will be stupefied to find how differently the occurrence will be reported by each, without the slightest hesitation or uncertainty on the part of any of them. To profit by such an experiment, you must at the time of observing the occurrence intend to make the experiment subsequently and consequently must have yourself followed the course of events with scrupulous accuracy, so as to be able later on to decide which of the witnesses are the better observers. It is not sufficient to attend to the mere words of the recital, you must know the greater or less assurance with which each tells his tale and endeavor to discover the cause of the inaccuracies of each. False perception, temperament, age, social position, interest in the matter, these considerations and a crowd of others influence the narrative. And when after a series of observations you have noted how certain classes of people people of sanguine temperament, children, professional men, etc., commit the same inaccuracies in their observations and statements, you will be driven to believe when a real case arises that the inaccuracies of a witness belonging to one of the categories already observed and registered are produced in the same way. We shall now discuss the fundamental principles underlying the deposition of a witness, his power of perception, and his memory, and shall then treat of certain special points connected with inaccurate statements. End of section 11. Recording by Cynthia Sheeler. Website, Cynthia Sheeler at iCanVoice.com. 
Section 12 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Explodreamer. Criminal Investigation, a practical handbook for magistrates, police officers, and lawyers. Volume 1 by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Examination of Witnesses and Accused Continued. Chapter 2 Continued. 1. Fundamental Considerations. A. Perception. If we wish to ascertain the facts in accordance with the depositions of the witnesses, we shall constantly insist that each witness shall tell us absolutely only what he has seen or what he has heard and leave to us the work of drawing conclusions. But the great error is frequently committed of accepting the story of what has been seen or heard as if the witness himself excluded all reasoning, all induction. That is to say, to consider as accurate what he has told us from the moment that we are convinced that the witness wishes to speak the truth. Now, if we believe that the account given of the sense perceptions of the witness excludes all reasoning, there is no motive for seeking this ratio concludendi, certainly more important than the ratio sendi, a matter with which every jurist must occupy himself. But in the record of almost all the perceptions of sense, there is found not only a reasoning, but a series of reasonings. A simple example will show this. When, for instance, I say, there is a glass, I would appear to report a very simple sense perception. But let us look at it a little closer. To express myself exactly, I should have to say something like this. As I have never known myself to be the victim of hallucinations, as I have not been, so far as I know, in bad health, as further, I have no reason to suppose that anyone has been trying to deceive me by an optical illusion, by means of mirrors or some physical trick, as besides, I have no ground for surmising that there is upon the table a picture so artistic as to make a painted glass appear a real glass, as finally, I cannot imagine that the people of this house have their table glass of rock crystal, I feel entitled to state that what I saw on the table was an ordinary glass. Of course, it is not suggested that one should go so far and give such a complete series of reasoning every time that a deposition is taken down. Everyone knows what is intended by the words, I have seen a glass. But everyone ought to know also that such an affirmation contains reasoning, and reasoning the correctness of which must be frequently examined. If consequently an investigating officer of very minute accuracy has taken down, I saw a man walking some distance off. The man had a long smock and looked like a woman. The insinuation thus inserted that the man might have been disguised is surely ridiculous. But if on the other hand the witness had said, I saw a woman, one could still very well admit that the person in question was a man, the witness having judged the sex of the person only from external appearance. What is necessary is not to stick down on the record the whole chain of reasoning, but to bear constantly in mind that the depositions suppose such reasonings and that, in such reasoning, mistakes and even important mistakes may be committed. Let us put on one side for the present morbid phenomena and consider only what happens daily when our senses and spirits are in a perfectly normal state. We have only to think of the way in which our senses perceive a thing and the manner in which we come to present it to ourselves to be convinced that we are very seldom in examining an object take note of all the details which characterize it and which really cause us to have such and such an idea of it. The best example is offered by figures which we call figures of harmony and which, having typical forms, that is to say, forms corresponding to known types, renders superfluous the accurate analysis of the different parts. When we read, we do not spell out every letter we seize at the first glance the whole word. We only take to spelling if we come across a word in a foreign language or with a novel grouping of syllables. Hence, it comes that we constantly fail to notice small printer's errors, especially if the words are rather long and if the mistake does not modify essentially the appearance of the word. In the same way, a clever pianist seizes only the general look of the notes, 
especially chords, without examining each in particular. But it is especially at chords or dominoes that this can be best observed. The player does not count the pips on the cards one by one, but seeing before him the group, he says, it is a 7 or a 9. But if these images did not conform to a known type, if the pips were arranged in different ways or in a perfectly arbitrary manner, the player would be obliged to count every time, at least for the higher cards. Something analogous occurs in all perceptions and more frequently than we ordinarily suppose. What enables us to seize more easily the aspect of a whole is that we seek and store up in our memory certain characteristic features from which we can immediately spot the object. When in a room, I see a clock face, and I am convinced that there is a clock there, even if I have not seen it very clearly, and even if the look of the clock face and the objects around it give but a vague idea of the clock. Later on, I shall perhaps recall exactly what the clock was like. If in crossing a room for the first time, I see with a side glance and indistinctly in a corner something glittering in white, I will say there is a stove. Because I have seen the characteristic signs of a stove and have not seen a stove in any of the other three corners of the room. If I see flying in the fields a big bird with a very long tail, I at once say, there goes a pheasant. And if in a menagerie, I can see only indistinctly a big beast with a long trunk, I am sure it is an elephant. It is not always as easy as this to draw conclusions from characteristic signs. The nature and the education of the person drawing the conclusion makes such estimates very difficult and of varying degrees of correctness. The specialist, for example, knows very well the true characteristic feature of objects entering into his specialty and will not be deceived even if he has seen but one of these features. The medical man knows, for instance, that there is a consumptive or a strong smoker in his consulting room if he hears the one coughing or the other walking about. But it is not the same in all cases, and curiously enough, it is particularly the objects of ordinary life of whose characteristic features we are completely ignorant. We may here learn much from scene painters in theatres who with a few telling depths of colour conjure up before us the most beautiful images. Their process consists, for example, in laying hold of what appears distinctive in a basket of roses, and although these essentials consist only of a few spots of colour, they make us really see a beautiful basket of roses, the light, the distance, and the imagination of course helping. It would be of the greatest importance for us if the scene painter could tell us the precise rules according to which he works. If, for example, he could tell us how he represents upon the canvas just the most brilliant lights, the deepest shadows, and the most striking colours. But up till now, scene painters have not found any such rules. They work in a purely empirical manner, which is proved by the fact that they cannot correct any mistakes. If their basket of roses does not produce the intended impression, they never try to touch it up, for that would be always useless. They just make another one. We may conclude from this that every person does not recognize an object by the same distinguishing features. If the painting representing a basket of roses were placed alone upon the scene, probably one part of the public would think it very well painted, while the other would wonder what in the world it was. But on the evening of the representation, when all the necessary decorations are on the scene, the whole public will find the basket of roses very good indeed. The reason of this fact is that in certain circumstances, the senses can be prepared. In the present case, we will admit then that the painter has been able to give in a typical way for one part of the public the characteristic features of a basket of roses, for the other those of an old castle, for another those of a wood and for the rest, those of the background. But it is sufficient if one part of the scenery be exactly represented, for the sense of sight is already prepared to be captured, and so disposed to find the whole of the scenery correct. The idea created that one object is well represented extends and applies itself to other objects by a sort of induction. Thus, the person who thinks the painter has rendered the old castle accidentally well will at once find that the basket of roses, the wood, and the background are equally well represented. This psychological phenomenon is very clearly shown in panoramas, 
which have recently become so numerous. The principal trick of these panoramas consists in putting in the foreground real objects, stones, trunks of trees, wheels, etc., which become to all appearance parts of the picture. The eye of the spectator is attracted by these real objects, is convinced of their materiality, and immediately transfers this impression to the portion that is only paint and canvas, so successfully that the whole spectacle appears real. These phenomena of the inductive faculty are of first importance for the expert in criminology. Frequently in our daily work, we come across analogous impressions of the same class as just described, perhaps less sharply accentuated, a circumstance which renders such an image or idolon all the more dangerous, because the illusion more readily escapes attention. It must not be forgotten that a witness, at the moment of being an actual spectator of the occurrence, or at the time of reporting it, is frequently in a state of agitation and overexcitement which leads him to glide easily from one conclusion to another. Once these inductions are in full swing, it is difficult to say where they will stop. And if this is the case with impressions arising under normal conditions, the reality is enormously accentuated when certain things have strongly struck the sensations and especially that of sight. Let us then consider further the problem of that mobile picture which we have just been describing. Discarding the theory of Georg Hurt, according to which this mobility or plasticity of vision is due to the fact that the retina is always exposed to rays of light of varying length, let us stick to the older and undoubtedly correct theories, which make the phenomenon simply a matter of experience. As soon as we mention experience, the question of true or false inferences comes to the front. This kind of vision is nothing but an inference or induction. We conclude that what appears to stand out in solid relief does really so stand out, because we have proved a thousand times by actual touch that objects bearing exactly the same appearance are material and solid. But we push our conclusions still further and by the same visual illusion except as real, not only bodies of which we have seen the like a thousand times, but those which we come across for the first time. We have never seen a living will, but if we came across one in the Arctic seas, we should never for a moment doubt that it was a real will. This, however, is only an inference based upon similarity. On our hypothesis, it would be absurd to suppose that the will was painted on canvas, but in numberless cases, the conclusion will by no means be so certain, and frequently the spectator, on more or less good grounds, draws a false inference based on appearances, without the slightest suspicion of the reality of what he believes himself to have seen. This can be easily seen in most optical illusions. Perhaps the most striking is that of the intaglio. A head of sufficient size is expertly graven on a precious stone, to a spectator about a yard away, such a head stands out in relief like a camco. The only difference is in the lighting effect, the spectator being unable to appreciate the minute variations in length of the rays of light, according as they strike the concave head hollowed out of the stone, or the convexity of a relief. Yet to the expert, the light is a perfect test, for in the cameo, the surfaces turned towards the luminous centre are lighted up while in the intaglio, the same surfaces being reversed are in the shade. If then a man has before him an intaglio illuminated by rays of light coming from the left, he can at the same instant see it as a cameo, the sole condition being that he should wish so to see it. For that, it suffices that, consciously or unconsciously, he should imagine the rays of light coming from the right. For the aspect under which the head appears to stand out in relief is explained only by thinking of a cameo. Now we constantly act in this fashion. We see or believe we see a whole series of things starting from certain data. If the first idea is right, we see right. If our exemplar starts with the idea that the light comes from the left, he will not be deceived over the intaglio. But if he starts with the erroneous impression that it comes from the right, immediately the cameo starts up before his eyes. It is all the more necessary to take note of errors springing from this first false idea or conception because we are never really aware of its presence or at best forget it at once. In any given case, we must with the aid of known facts segregate the idea or notion which served as the starting point, 
We must then, by a scrupulous inquiry, verify whether or not there is any ground for suspecting a mistake in their idea. If there is, we must then endeavour to find the cause. This has an importance of its own, and when we have discovered wherein certain assertions are incorrect, we must not rest content with a mere statement of the facts. Indeed, in most cases, we can directly discover only the incorrectness of subsidiary statements. But in working backwards to the idea which is their cause, we can sometimes find by the mere process of reasoning amongst the other important statements, some of which can only arise from fundamentally incorrect ideas or conceptions. This is all the more important because frequently as the result of certain perceptions which we believe we possess, we arrive at conclusions which are not in accordance with our own experience. Take again our example of vision. If immediately after sunset we look at a low hill situated in the west, objects seen on the summit of this hill produce the effect of simple silhouettes or outlines without substance and without relief. Behind them, the sky is strongly illuminated by the setting sun, and the face of the object directed towards the spectator catches so little light that it is impossible to distinguish differences of light and shade. Thus, although we know perfectly well that these objects are solid, we cannot help thinking of them as mere outlines. And if we have no reason for correcting this false appearance, we will not do it. We shall simply say we have seen silhouettes. Note also that we have not as yet taken into account what may be called illusions of the senses. If it be admitted that almost all sense perceptions are based upon inductions, it follows that only those arising from a physical cause in the body itself of the individual ought strictly speaking to be called illusion of the senses. Thus, there will be an illusion of sense if owing to a lateral pressure on the eyeball images are seen double, or again if two points of a compass separated a little distance be placed on the top of the thigh, or on the back, or on some other part of the human body deficient in nervous tissue. Instead of feeling the two sensations of touch, the person believes that there is only one. Apart from cases of this kind, what is commonly called an illusion of the senses is in no sense an illusion, but only a false induction. If on looking through a red glass we see the landscape red, our eye is not deceived. We have only made the mistake of not taking the red glass into account. If a little before rain falls, the mountains appear nearer, it is not because the eye is deceived, but because in calculating the distance, we have forgotten that air charged with humidity refracts the light. In the same way, if a stick is held slanting in the water, refraction makes the portion submerged in the water appear to be raised up, so as to form an obtuse angle with the other portion. There is no error of the senses, for if the stick be photographed, it will be appear in the photograph also broken in an obtuse angle. There will be no mistake unless we believe that the stick is really broken. If we do so, it is only an error of reasoning owing to having forgotten that the refraction of light is not the same in water as in air. There are a great many similar cases. It is only necessary to mention the numerous phenomena of radiation of light, phenomena in which light surfaces appear larger than dark ones on account of their greater power of radiation. Thus, a black triangle between two white surfaces appear narrower than a white rectangle of the same size between two black surfaces. People clothed in black appear thinner when they are dressed in white or light materials. A line with divisions appears shorter than a continuous line. A square divided by a diagonal appears broader than high, while a square divided by a vertical appears higher than it is broad. Clothes of uniform colour appear greater than they really are, especially if they have longitudinal lines, while clothes of different colours or with transverse lines appear smaller. Lines which go in a parallel direction such as railway tracks, avenues, etc., appear to converge, and vertical lines cut across by short oblique parallel lines always appear to diverge from the vertical in the direction opposite to that of the cutting lines. But in all these cases, our senses are not in error, only we do not take into account the optical laws which come into play and consequently accept the appearance of the reality. Yet all these illusions and a crowd of others may exercise a decisive influence on the depositions of witnesses and the grossest mistakes may slip into the inquiry if we simply accept a deposition without looking for the deduction of which it is the result. And here we have not only to deal with simple cases 
as example where a person clothed in white and seen by night is depicted by the witness as a very tall man when in fact he was only a boy false conclusions of this sort may be the starting point of a whole series of facts falsely conceived because from one sense perception falsely interpreted may hang a whole series of mistakes both in the idea which we have of things and in the way in which we report them it is not always so easy to establish the cause of error that is how the perception has been led astray an explanation by a technical term such as refraction radiation etc is not always enough we have often to do with very complicated physical phenomena we know for example that if objects appear unexpectedly at night especially on a dark and misty night they are seen prodigiously enlarged this phenomenon is a fairly complicated one suppose that on a foggy or misty night i see unexpectedly a horse whose outline appears very indistinct on account of the mist i know from experience that objects which appear to have indefinite outlines are usually at a great distance i know further that very distant objects appear smaller than they really are so when this horse which i fancy to be very far away seems to have ordinary dimensions i can only suppose that its real proportions are enormous the train of ideas is then as follows i do not see it distinctly therefore it is very far away but in spite of the distance it retains its natural size therefore if i were to see it close at hand it would be immense it is self-evident that a person does not reason in this way slowly and step by step his conclusions are produced with the rapidity of lightning and without reflection and he arrives direct at the conclusion without stopping at the intermediate stages it is therefore frequently very difficult to discover the train of ideas and how the mistake has been committed if the man who has seen finds in past events an inexplicable gap the affair will appear to him strange and mysterious simply because he cannot explain it and this is how arises that tendency towards the mysterious which often plays such a great game in the depositions of witnesses thus if we see of course in disagreeable circumstances a horse galloping without hearing the sound of his hoofs if we see the trees swaying without perceiving any wind or if we meet on a fine moonlight night a man apparently without a shadow every such thing will appear mysterious and disquieting because there is something wanting which ought logically to be there we know also what a state of mind a man gets into when he believes he has seen something mysterious when a person has become thus unsettled not a single one of his sense perceptions can inspire confidence we must even suspect the truth of what he professes to have seen or heard before he became the victim of terror we must also remember that very few people are willing to admit that they have been in a funk perhaps they don't even know it themselves it therefore becomes all the more necessary to throw light upon the subsequent inferences made by the witness because that is the only way of finding out the unsettled state of mind in which he has been and which may be the cause of serious mistakes end of section twelve recording by explore dreamer section thirteen of criminal investigation volume one this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ariane Stein. Criminal Investigation, a practical handbook for magistrates, police officers, and lawyers. Volume 1, by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Examination of witnesses and accused continued. An important source of error arises from the way in which observations are joined together or split up. This frequently happens in observing moving objects. We know well the many blunders to which we are exposed when it is a matter of deciding which body is moving. Often, we do not know whether it is the railway carriage in which we are that is moving or whether it is the carriage upon the parallel line of rails. Again, from the top of a bridge, if we look for a long time at the running water, at last it appears to us that the bridge is moving upstream. The cause of these phenomena 
is that we are incapable of appreciating anything else beyond the displacement of one object relatively to another. But it is a different matter when we wish to split up a movement into its component parts. How often do we come across facts like the following? The witness is incapable of saying whether the accused has thrown the glass of beer at his victim's head or whether he has struck him with it, and often enough, one set of witnesses say one thing and one set the other. It by no means necessarily follows that one set of the witnesses has lied, provided we take into consideration the relative slowness of perception, if we may use such an expression, that is, that a certain time is necessary for a visual impression to be fixed on the retina. In our example, the witnesses have seen the glass raised, and they have seen it fall on the head of the victim, but all the intermediate facts have escaped them. They followed each other too swiftly for each to make its own separate impression. This gap is filled up with the help of inductions, and the way in which each witness fills it up depends on his individuality or the humor in which he happens to be at the moment. Generally, the witness sticks to the idea which he formed at the beginning of the incident. Seeing the accused raise the glass, one witness says to himself, he is going to strike him. Another says, he is going to throw it at him. And when the complainant has got the glass on his head, each witness has filled up in his own way what has escaped his observation and imagines he has seen the action in the way in which he expected it would happen. This fact of the relative slowness of vision is of the very first importance and the best method of enlightening ourselves on this subject is with the aid of instantaneous photographs. We all know, for example, that when we look at the instantaneous photograph of a horse at full gallop, we say we have never seen a horse look like that before. The cause is that the photograph has fixed the motion during a period too short for our sight to be able to retain it. Thus, we seize with the eye, without recognizing the fact, a whole series of images succeeding each other rapidly, and we unite these instantaneous images into a single image which has never really existed as such. This image has never had a being. We look for it in vain in the instantaneous photograph, which cannot show our visual picture. The latter being a combination of several instantaneous positions. In practice, the phenomenon is produced in the following manner. Suppose an action, very quickly executed and composed of certain positions, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, K, L, M, positions which, on account of their very rapidity, cannot be perceived separately and distinctively by the human eye. Each observer, then, will group together a certain number of these positions to form a group image. But the images thus formed will be very different, because on the one hand, the moment at which the different observers begin to group the images may, by chance, not be the same for all. And on the other hand, because a man who observes quickly requires only a small number of positions to form his group image, while a man who observes slowly requires a larger number. In the first case, the group images formed by the positions indicated above will be grouped thus. For the first observer, A, B, C, dash D, E, F, dash G, H, I, dash K, L, M. For the second observer, who began to observe very soon after the first, the group images will be thus arranged. B, C, D, dash E, F, G, dash H, I, K. In the second case, that is, where the power of observation is more or less rapid, the man who observes quickly and requires two positions only to obtain a mental picture will have his group images thus. A, B, dash C, D, dash E, F, dash G, H, dash I, K, dash L, M, while the other, who requires three positions, will have them thus. A, B, C, dash D, E, F, dash G, H, I, dash K, L, M. These group images, thus diversified by their composition, may have still greater differences. Let us suppose that one or more momentary positions, for example, A, D, G, K, 
have escaped for some reason being noticed by one or other of the observers, or that they have produced upon him only a vague impression. The constituent elements of the group images will then naturally be quite different, and different witnesses will report the same fact in a different manner, although they all observed it equally well. In practice, it is of course impossible to find the difference between the diverse group images formed with the aid of the same instantaneous images. The scientific theory of their formation has been explained here only with the object of showing how positive facts may be observed in absolutely different fashions. Of equal importance, but less capable of analysis, are acoustical illusions or mistakes of hearing. They are undoubtedly more frequent amongst sick persons than optical illusions, but of these we shall not here treat. Let us only say in passing that the investigating officer should satisfy himself even more minutely than for optical illusions, whether there is any question of acoustical illusion due to morbid conditions of the body. If so, anything further must be left to the physician. We can here only consider mistakes which may be committed by persons in good health or who, although supposed to be in good health, are temporarily in a state different from the normal. We refer in particular to people who have been greatly terrified or have fancied themselves in danger of death. This abnormal condition must be taken into account, especially when questioning people who have been dangerously wounded in a riot, robbery with violence, attempted murder, etc. Fear, terror, pain produce all sorts of mistakes on their own account. All the more will they do so when people find themselves in a condition practically equivalent to the morbid state. They suffer real hallucinations and hear words which have never been pronounced. Thus, they hear voices of people pursuing them and threats which have never been uttered. And at the same time, they hear the voices of persons offering them assistance, although there was no one in the neighborhood. In this connection, there are some remarkable illusions. Sometimes certain words long forgotten appear suddenly to strike upon the ear. A case is reported of a sailor who, when on the point of drowning, heard distinctly before losing consciousness these words pronounced by his mother, Johnny, have you eaten your sister's grapes? He had heard these words in infancy and had never thought of them since. In this case, nobody could for a moment imagine that those words had been really spoken to the drowning sailor. But suppose that a person, the victim of a crime and severely wounded, declares that he heard some remark or other. There is perhaps, at the moment, no sufficient reason for doubting the truth of the statement. Further, it is necessary to be extremely careful not to admit without verification statements of witnesses concerning the direction, the distance, or the intensity of the human voice. One has only to make certain experiments and examine the hearing faculty of a few people to discover the strangest things. The majority of people cannot tell you whether a voice comes from above or below, from the right or from the left, from before or from behind, from a distance or close at hand. And very few people know how defective their power of observation is in such matters. The reason often is found in the circumstances that one cannot readily bring oneself into touch with the locality, for example, the street of a town, hills in the country, etc. Further, everyone does not possess the gift of hearing sounds distinctly, and the majority of people understand what they hear not from the exact words themselves, but from the general tenor of the phrase. There would be nothing serious in that if everybody picked up the true meaning, but people give what they believe to be the true meaning, so that we are compelled to take into account their manner of comprehension and in consequence endeavor to reconcile an infinite diversity. If instead of one witness, we have several who tell us what they have heard, we can at least compare their different statements and correct one by the other. But if we have only a single witness, we often commit the mistake of accepting his deposition as absolutely correct, simply because it is not contradicted by that of another witness. Thus, even in ordinary circumstances, we must be cautious and accept only with reserve what a witness pretends to have heard. All the more must it be so if there are special difficulties in the way. If, for example, the voice comes from a great distance, if it is shrill, muffled, or presents any other abnormal peculiarity. The same is true if the person whose voice has been heard is of different nationality from the listener, if he speaks another dialogue or is better or less educated. Prudence is also necessary 
if the witness hears the voice unexpectedly, or if he does not mark the connection between the words he has heard and the action. Still more, if there is any ground for supposing that the witness has been mistaken as to this connection. We must remember that here memory is not yet in question. We are dealing only with inaccurate perceptions, where the witness is giving an incorrect account of what he has seen or heard immediately afterwards. Note also that stupid or uneducated people not only find it difficult to repeat word by word what they have heard, especially when the sentences are of some length, but also they constantly distort the sentences when they are compelled to repeat word for word. We must therefore be content with getting them to tell us the general sense of what they have heard, but we must, of course, from the first instant, take care that the witness really knows all about the affair. Otherwise, in reproducing the sense of the words he has heard, he will certainly twist the meaning according to the idea he has taken. Under certain circumstances, something that may be due to phonismus, an acoustical sensation caused by light, and photismus, an optical sensation caused by sound. These sensations are not experienced by everyone, but appear to be not infrequent. For example, the strange noise heard by many people at the rising of the aurora borealis. Such results are probably due to strong association of ideas. There is not much to be said about mistakes of the other senses, their place being of secondary importance. Everyone knows that the sense of touch gives rise to many mistakes. Such mistakes are of great importance for the criminal lawyer when it is a question of wounds. We know, for instance, that wounds made by a dagger or a bullet give only the impression of a shock, and that insignificant contusions cause extreme pain, while we hardly feel a mortal wound. People who have in the course of a riot received a number of slight wounds, and one severe one, are generally incapable of telling when they received the severe wound. Further, such wounded persons cannot, as a rule, state exactly how they received the blows. In short, the statements of wounded people, where the sense of touch is involved, must be received with great caution. Another fact frequently overlooked must be taken into consideration. It is that the different parts of our body fulfill their functions normally only when they are in ordinary positions. If, for example, we take up a pea between the thumb and the first finger, we feel only one pea, although the tactile impression has been conveyed by two fingers. But if we cross the third finger over the fourth and place the pea between the extremity of these two, we feel it doubled, as if there were two peas, because the fingers are not in their natural positions, and thus transmit to the brain a double tactile impression. In other words, the double sensation is the true sensation, but when the fingers are in their ordinary position, experience comes into play and we feel only one pea. As in another example, if one joins the hands crossways and turns them inside and raises them up so that the fingers of the right hand are still on the right, and those of the left still on the left, the faculty of localizing the finger is absolutely lost. And if any one tells you, without touching it, to raise one of the fingers, say the third of the right hand, you will be certain to raise the corresponding finger of the other hand. We also know that the sense of touch is one of the least developed. If not exercised, as it is in the case of a blind man, it requires the help of other senses, and especially that of sight. Thus, perceptions of touch alone are always less certain than others, because they depend upon a small number of very rough signs. The same phenomena may be perceived in a social game much played by children. In this game, they pass from hand to hand, underneath the table, perfectly harmless objects, as a piece of dough, a potato, a kid glove wetted and full of sand, etc., if one take into his hand, without seeing it, one of these objects, he thinks he is touching some hideous monster and throws it away. By the sense of touch, he has had only the sensation of cold, wet movement that is the common characteristic of the idea of a reptile. The imagination completes the sensation, and the idea of a reptile is transmitted to the brain. To these defective sensations, due to touch alone, must be added a species of transmissibility of tactile impressions. If, for example, ants are running about near where one is seated, one immediately feels the sensation of ants running about under one's clothes. 
and when one sees or hears the description of a wound, one frequently feels pain in the corresponding part of one's own body. It may be taken for granted that, with witnesses of an impressionable nature, this tendency may be the cause of serious mistakes. This want of independence, so to speak, of the sensation of touch, is intensified by the fact that all sensations are relative, and most markedly in this case. We feel a cellar to be hot in winter and cold in summer, because we perceive only the difference between its temperature and that of the outside atmosphere. And if, after having plunged one hand in cold water and the other in hot water, we place both in tepid water, the former will have the sensation of heat and the latter of cold. We have frequently, in magisterial reports, to deal with tactile sensations. We must be always careful to take into account their lack of certitude. Certain strange phenomena may here be alluded to the raison d'etre of which is to be found in the irregular structure of the human body, for example, walking in a circle instead of straight. This phenomenon is especially noticeable when walking in a fog in an unfamiliar locality or in the forest at night time, and particularly if the person be to some extent out of his senses as sick, frightened, intoxicated, stunned, or weak from loss of blood. It appears very strange that sometimes a murderer or robber, instead of running straight away, walks in a circle round the place of the deed, a fact which may be proved by footprints or witnesses. Nobody nowadays would assert that a person who has been running round in a circle in this way is for that reason alone incapable of telling the truth. As to taste and smell, they are frequently perverted by illness and even a man in good health finds it difficult to say if his senses of taste and smell are normal, for it is impossible to submit them to any standard of comparison. The parts played by these two senses in our life is less important than those of sight and hearing. We can readily ask a person if he sees well or hears well, and even test his ability, but it would be useless to ask him if he can taste or smell properly and with normal accuracy, for we have no means of testing the correctness of his reply. Besides, extraordinary changes take place in these senses. If, for example, in judging of food by its look alone, we conclude that we have before us a dish of sweets, when in reality is a plate of salted viands, we shall on tasting have the sensation of neither, but only a horrible taste in the mouth. The savor of the sweets is mixed with that of the salted provision, just as if we had really mixed up the two meats on the plate. It must be particularly noted that in the case of smell, the sensations of pleasant and unpleasant are most diverse. One person delights in the smell of rotten apples, another in that of a wet bath sponge. What one calls the horrible smell of carrion, another hails as a delicious gamey odor. Some women consider asafoetida to be the best perfume. Most people would say the smell was stinking. The odor of garlic, it is universally known, is very diversely appreciated, and many people cannot endure such common perfumes as musk and patchouli. Thus, when it is a question of determining the correctness of a smell perception, great care is necessary, and all the more because the sensibility of the organ varies so much with individuals. Some people can smell a cat in a room, others can recognize persons by the mere odor of the clothes they are wearing, while others are unaffected by the strongest stenches. At the same time, the sense of smell is of an extraordinary persistence. An odor, scented but once, is recognized ten years afterwards. It raises up before our eyes with the greatest fidelity all the objects perceived at the same time. This fact may occasionally be of importance in testing the recollection of witnesses. End of section 13《セクション14 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ariane Stein.《Criminal Investigation A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1 by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Examination of Witnesses and Accused Continued. B. Memory. 
The second faculty to be taken into account in the psychical life of a person under examination is his memory. Memory is a thing so marvelous and so complex, manifesting its activity in so many diverse ways that the investigating officer can never study it enough. All the facts of a case must in the end be established by the truthfulness and accuracy of the memories of the witnesses. According to Forel, the province or function of memory is threefold. One, the fact observed must produce an impression. Two, that impression must be recalled. Three, the impression must be recognized as identical with the fact observed. I saw yesterday, he says, a white bear for the first time in my life, and today I think thus. One, the white bear yesterday made an impression on me. Two, I have today reproduced within me the image of the white bear. And three, I am assured of the identity of the image seen yesterday with that reproduced today. This example really tells us everything that is to be said as to the activity of the brain in the case of memory. And all we have got to do is to show how it works out in particular cases. We have already dealt with accuracy of perception upon which naturally the other operations, and especially that of reproduction, depend. The second stage, then, is the reproduction of the impression. Its accuracy depends on the degree of precision with which what has been perceived, whether well or ill, reappears, and the mode in which the inevitable gaps are filled up. One may fill up these gaps accurately by comparison with the whole picture, or inaccurately by fanciful imaginings. Sometimes they are never filled up at all. It is only sometime after the second operation that we begin to establish the identity of the perception with its reproduction. By examining if the two correspond and to what extent the greater or less certainty of a statement depends on the success of this examination. To return to Forel's example, the accuracy of the first stage will depend upon the precision and care with which one has looked at the white bear. The second stage, that of reproduction, gives its picture more or less imperfect. For instance, the image of the white bear may be very accurately reproduced, but the observer has not noticed whether it had a tail or not. If the conclusion drawn from the whole look of the bear is accurate, this gap will also be accurately filled up. But if the observer gives reins to his imagination, he may confer upon the animal an appendage which it has no right to possess. But if neither analogy nor imagination come into play, the gap is not filled up, and the witness does not remember what sort of a tail the beast had or whether it had a tail at all. After the reproduction comes the establishment of identity between the two pictures, and here accuracy depends on the greater or less stringency of our examination. The investigating officer must, in every important affair, carefully distinguish between these three operations of the mind whenever he has reason to suspect that the memory of a witness is not trustworthy. If he searches at random in the hope of finding the weak spot, he will certainly fail, but will almost certainly succeed if he examines separately the three stages enumerated. Thus, he will first question the witness as to how long the perception lasted, the way in which it was produced, the circumstances accompanying it. He will thus, leaving aside all questions of accuracy, discover the solidity of the perception. Next, he will ask how the reproduction was made, and particularly how the gaps were filled up. And lastly, he will devote his attention to the way in which the identity between the perception and reproduction was established. It is almost always during this last examination that the mistake is found. Do not say that this procedure will take up too much time. In every case, less time is lost in establishing even with the greatest trouble, the accuracy of our facts, than in allowing a mistake to slip in and, in consequence, futilely examining a cloud of witnesses. We must distinguish between the conscious and the unconscious activity of the memory. G. H. Lewis shows by a physical example the unconscious activity of the memory. If a key be placed on a sheet of white paper exposed to the sun, and afterwards the key be removed and the sheet of paper placed in the shade, the image, or rather the shadow of the key, will reappear before the eyes on looking at the sheet of paper, even after a considerable time. 
There are even memories that influence us and make us, without knowing why, act in one way or another. Forel says, If, while absorbed in a philosophical problem, I avoid a pail of water, I have unconsciously, in going round it, made a whole train of thoughts. This remark is of great importance in the present connection. Indeed, we are able, on many occasions, to explain a person's actions by this theory of unconscious memory. Yet how frequently do we fail to take account of this factor, sometimes through forgetfulness, sometimes through ignorance, sometimes through sheer stupidity? Further, it appears to us most improbable that a man could perform unconsciously actions which we could perform only after mature consideration. We must therefore know a person's nature, for then only can we judge whether we have in fact to deal with a question of unconscious memory, and if so, to what extent. We may take it in a general way, that the unconscious memory is the most trustworthy, because it is based on a long line of experience. Another point of great importance in dealing with the recollections of other persons is to find the connecting link between the different remembrances. We all know how we, so to say, help our memory. One associates different reminiscences with each other. One fact remembered furnishes data, which lead directly to the recollection of other facts. For example, suppose one desires to know when he has bought a certain object, being perfectly unable to call to mind the purchase. But he remembers that on the day of the purchase, he carried the parcel in his hands until his fingers were cold. Hence, the season was winter. Then he remembers that he put it in the inside left-hand pocket of his overcoat. Therefore, it must have been last year, because in the preceding year, his overcoat had no pocket on the left-hand side. Then he remembers that on arriving home, he found his friend X there. Therefore, it was a Wednesday, because X came only on that day of the week. X admired his new overcoat. Therefore, it had just been purchased. Then, he finds from the tailor's bill that this overcoat was sent home early in November, and thus, keeping in mind the day of the week was Wednesday, the exact date of purchase can be fixed. We are constantly forming such trains of association, but stupid people do not do so readily, and to obtain from them accurate information, it is not enough to give them time to think and reflect. They must be helped, and upon the skill with which they are helped will depend the accuracy and precision of the information obtained from them. Naturally, we take into account the physical surroundings and social position of the witness. We refresh the memory of a countryman by talking to him of interesting agricultural happenings. We make up an old woman by recalling to her mind religious festivals. We remind the loafer or cockney of some scandal running round the town at the time. But even when we have not to do with such typical characters, the best method still is to get into conversation with people and thus try to arrive at more assured information. Here, once more, practice makes perfect. We may get splendid successes, but nonetheless must ever be on our guard against risky combinations. If the question of time be of importance, it is a good practice to place on the record the whole series of images registered on the tablets of the memory. Thus, the ascertainment of the exact time is put to a conditional form. For example, if it be true that the event A happened contemporaneously with the event B, and if the event B took place close to C, and if the witness D was at that moment at C, then the event A also took place close to C. And any one can say for himself whether this conclusion is accurate or not by scrutinizing the intermediate steps. A method of great importance in assisting the memory is to replace the witness in the same surroundings. This is a common phenomenon in our daily life. Sitting in my study, I think of certain business I have to transact in a certain direction when I walk abroad. When I get into the street, I have completely forgotten all about it, and all my efforts to stir up my memory are useless. But if I return to my study, and seat myself as before, I shall recollect everything. Here is the undoubted explanation. I again unconsciously experience all my former sense impressions, the same aspect of my writing table, the same tick-tack of the clock, the same soft and easy chair, and what I was thinking of then returns spontaneously. As Professor Grashy says, there is a very remarkable law. Impressions, which act simultaneously on the cerebral envelope 
are linked, or, so to say, associated with each other. Such linked ideas are most important. We know that certain sense impressions, as the sound of bells, certain effects of light, and, most persistent of all, odors or smells, have the faculty of evoking in our minds memories long since forgotten. Such observations are as interesting as important. Reminiscences which have wholly disappeared from our minds are thus reconstituted, slowly and with difficulty, by the aid of such sense impressions. But what use can we make in practice of this well-known fact? The answer is that the best way to make a witness remember with accuracy and detail a certain occurrence is to place him in exactly the same circumstances as when he first made his observations. But it is not enough simply to take him to the place. We must reproduce the surroundings as they were at the moment of observation. We should select, if possible, the same hour and the same season, and, without attempting a purely theatrical display, remember that the more accurate is the reconstitution, the more useful it will be. We specially recommend this procedure in complicated transactions, when, for example, the order of events is important, or when there are several actors in the drama and the part played by each has to be determined. We are often powerless, relying on memory alone, to recall the different scenes of an occurrence, but find no difficulty if we place ourselves on the spot and among the surroundings which we occupied at the time. Following this course, we often obtain the most astonishing results. People who in the magistrate's chambers will remember nothing change completely when they find themselves on the spot. They recall first the accessory details and subsequently some most important fact. Of course, we must not expect that the witness, when taken to the spot, will be seized with a sudden inspiration. Give him time to collect his thoughts and find his bearings. Talk to him about the scenery and matters of no importance. Bring up casually the missing links in the story or the portions he has already remembered. And thence you can lead him on by degrees to recollect all he has seen. But here there is a danger, and a great danger, to be shunned. Nothing must be suggested to the witness so as to lead him to testify to matters of which he is ignorant. The danger will be less if, without giving him special information, the witness be interrogated by simple questions to which he can reply by a plain yes or no. Nor must we ever forget that memory itself has its illusions. We frequently imagine that we have formerly seen something which in reality we have never seen. It is a well-known fact that this is no proof of mental aberration. It happens to men in a perfectly normal condition of mind when suffering from mental or physical fatigue. Such mistakes happen most frequently in connection with localities. How often has one the feeling, I have been in this place before, knowing well that he never has been. Such hallucinations are easily produced in emotional witnesses and may lead to most dangerous results. Such errors may be explained in various ways. Leibniz was one of the first to study these questions and was followed by Dugas, J. J. Van Beervliet, J. Suri, A. Lalande, Bourdon, Angel, W. Sander, Jensen, Longweiser, Wiedemeister, Hubert, Krepelin, Weigen, Maudsley, Newhoff, etc., and every modern handbook of psychology. This literature shows that the phenomenon is of frequent occurrence, and for that reason it is important in criminal investigations. Dickens even introduces it in David Copperfield. One explanation has been given as follows. The brain works in two parts, and when the subject is not in a perfect state of health, one of these sometimes receives an impression the fraction of a second before the other. This first impression gives one, at the time of receiving the second impression, the idea that he has been somewhere, or seen something at some former time, though his memory immediately corrects him, and his reasoning power proves the absurdity and impossibility of his imagining. We believe that the majority of people are ashamed to mention having experienced this mental illusion, for we have very seldom heard the subject opened, though when asked whether they have ever experienced it, people frequently reply in the affirmative. The phrase of Ribo, despite its paradoxical air, is most true and important to be borne in mind. Forgetfulness is but a special state or condition of the memory. What he means is that a man can retain in his memory 
only a certain number of things. If the memory is too full of insignificant details, important matters cannot find room and are remembered only after the others are forgotten. We apply this rule by recalling to the memory of the witness the minimum of details of secondary importance. Otherwise, no room would be left for the important fact. The difficulty is to know how to select from minor details just those which will serve as stepping stones and foundations for those of serious import. End of section 14. Section 15 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Criminal Investigation, A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1, by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Examination of Witnesses and Accused, Continued. 2. Special Considerations. A. Strong Feeling as a Cause of Inaccuracy of Observation. If men perceive the most insignificant facts in the most diverse manner, even when it is impossible that these facts should produce on the observer any emotion preventing him from observing with absolute calm, how much more will their impressions be diversified under circumstances calculated to produce in the onlookers excitement, fear, or terror? The fact is that in such a state they are absolutely incapable of observing accurately. Examples are innumerable. We may cite one of historical interest relating to the execution of Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots. When, between 1830 and 1840, the coffin was opened, it was discovered that the Queen had at her execution received two strokes of the axe, one of which had only slashed the nape, while the second had separated the head from the trunk. Now we possess a series of accounts of this execution, dating from the period itself, and all distinguished by abundance and exactitude of details, but not one of these accounts mentions the first blow which merely injured the nape of the neck. Yet judging from the careful way in which these accounts have been recorded, this detail would certainly have been reported had it been noticed by any of the spectators, but all were evidently in such a state of agitation that not even one of them observed the false blow, and would all, if questioned in a court of law, have probably sworn that only one blow was dealt. Recently the author had the opportunity of verifying this by an analogous circumstance. He was present at an execution, at which for some reason or other the executioner wore gloves. After the execution he asked four officials who were present what was the color of the executioner's gloves. Three replied, respectively, black, gray, white, while the fourth stoutly maintained that the executioner wore no gloves at all. Yet all four were in close proximity to the scaffold. Each replied without hesitation, and all four are still perfectly confident that they made no mistake. Again a man of reserved and calm temperament, an old soldier, reported the day after a railway accident which he had witnessed, that there were at least one hundred dead, that he had himself on extricating himself from the smashed carriage, seen many human heads, cut off by the wheels of the vehicles, rolling along the track. As a matter of fact, one man was killed and five persons wounded. All the rest was due to the imagination of a man ordinarily most composed, but at the moment suffering under strong excitement due to fear. Another railway accident furnishes an example of what a man in a state of terror can see and hear. A brewer, a veritable Hercules, in the prime of life and in no way nervous, having jumped from the smashed carriage, took to running across the fields to the neighboring town three-quarters of an hour's distance, in the full belief that he saw and heard the locomotive of the train puffing and blowing after him. This man, the prey to his imagination, had run so hard that he caught an inflammation of the chest, from which he died some months afterwards. The fact that he thus ran with such excess of vigor proves conclusively that in his imagination 
he had really seen and heard the pursuing locomotive. Some time ago, it was related in the papers that in a prison in Norway, a famous criminal named Gudor had escaped, during his walking exercise, by suddenly attacking his warder. The latter, seeing a long knife glittering in the hand of Gudor, fled. Gudor fled also. On being recaptured, it was found as a result of a minute inquiry that he had brandished a bloater in the air, and this bloater the poor man in his terror mistook for a long knife. It is interesting to note that in the murder of President Carno by the Italian Cesario, not a single person saw the blow struck, though the murderer had jumped upon the footrest of the carriage, pushed aside Carnot's arm, and thrust the dagger into his abdomen. In the carriage three gentlemen were seated, two grooms were standing behind, mounted officers were accompanying on either side, and yet no one saw the president stabbed, and the murderer would have easily escaped if he had refrained from calling out in a loud voice while running away, Viva l'anarchie! Each one of us has probably made similar observations on ourselves or our friends, but we often fail, in the practice of our profession, to appreciate their value. In the cases just described, it is easy to discover the cause of the error. If several persons have observed the same fact at the same time, and one alone amongst them has seen something extraordinary, there is a good ground for suspicion as to what he pretends to have seen. But how frequently does it not happen that there is only one witness, who, through excitement, observes incorrectly, without the circumstances being such as to betray the falsity of his impression? How many times is an investigating officer compelled to draw from such an observation, due entirely to the imagination, conclusions of the gravest nature? We cannot, indeed, often demonstrate in criminal matters that such observations are false, but we may safely conclude that they often are so. How can the mistakes which may spring from this faulty observation on the part of witnesses be avoided? The only thing is to check every deposition inconsistent with the others, and presenting the slightest trace of improbability. We must never go to sleep, lulling ourselves to repose with the thought, in spite of everything, this is how it must have happened, however unlikely the story may be, for the witness, so absolutely worthy of confidence, must be telling the truth. In such a fix only one course can be followed. We must reconstitute the whole affair in all its details, taking no account whatever of the statement of the exceptional witness. If before introducing this deposition it was easy to build up the case, while afterwards inconsistencies and improbabilities spring up, the statement of the witness must be accepted with extreme caution, and that all the more if it is the only thing which inculpates the accused. If the statement of the witness appears improbable, and if at the time of the occurrence he was in a state of excitement, his story must be criticized with the most minute and scrupulous care. If the improbability of the statement is glaring, there is no difficulty, because we are at once put on our guard. The danger arises when the observation of the witness has been at fault, when he tells in perfect good faith a most likely story, and thus creates great confusion. A long investigation ensues, and only at the end of it, if at all, is the mistake discovered. Fortunately, this rarely happens except when a witness is in an unusually excited state. When he is perfectly collected, he rarely hears or sees what is absolutely non-existent. It is therefore always safe to commence by being incredulous of a single uncorroborated statement, and taking steps to ascertain the condition of the witness at the time. If he has suffered from excitement, we must further inquire as to its duration, whether momentary, or whether producing a permanent effect. The author himself has been witness of a fact which had nothing to do with criminal matters, but was of the greatest importance in preventing a too ready credulity. A young peasant, whom the author had known from his infancy, and believed to be absolutely incapable of lying, had for the first time in his life visited a large town, 
and gave a most animated description of all the wonders he had seen. What had impressed him most was a menagerie of wild beasts. He spoke of all the beasts, described their appearance, told how they had been fed and how the trainer had managed them. At last, said he, there came a gigantic serpent, which rushed on the lion to devour him. Suddenly naked savages jumped up, who fought with and killed both the lion and the serpent. The explanation was simple. The scene described was represented on a huge picture hung at the entrance to the tent to attract the public, as is usual with travelling menageries. But the peasant had seen that day so many new and marvellous things, that the scene had appeared to him perfectly real, and when relating it, the picture became reality, so that he reported in perfect good faith what the picture represented, just as if it had really taken place. How many times has it not happened in criminal cases that we have been led astray in a similar manner? Here is an analogous case. A peasant, a man of intelligence, retired from active work, told the author one day, when on business in the law courts, that the medical expert had cured him of deafness in the most remarkable manner. The doctor had, he said, looked into the interior of his ear, and with much difficulty extracted bit by bit a large beetle, whose several parts were collected on a piece of paper and shown to him. The body, head, and legs were all there, and the deafness had disappeared. A little while after, the medical man was asked how he had brought about this marvellous cure, and explained that he had only withdrawn from the peasant's ear an obstruction of wax. The peasant had been much run down and worried by his deafness, and very frightened at the operation. The joy of being cured had so played upon his emotions that this creature of his imagination is quite explicable. He was certainly not lying, but really the victim of a false perception. In a criminal case, where an incident as related is not absolutely unbelievable, no one would have doubted in the least the veracity of a man of excellent reputation who had no reason to tell a lie. b. Inaccurate observations following wounds on the head. Great prudence must be observed in examining witnesses who have received wounds on the head. It frequently happens, and for that reason is of primary importance, that the wounded person is the principal, and at times even the only witness. Care is all the more necessary, in that the doctor himself is never able to say with certainty whether or not the wound has had any influence upon the mental condition of the patient. The question of the nervous centers is far from being definitely solved. Speaking generally, we may say with Forel, the seat of memory for visual images is in the occipital lobe of the brain, for auditory images in the temporal lobe, for coordination of movements between the vertex and the frontal lobe. The books which treat of this subject furnish numerous examples of intellectual disorders due to wounds in the head. Holland relates in his Mental Pathology that one day he completely forgot the German language owing to great fatigue. Abercrombie, the surgeon, one day injured his head by a fall from his horse. There being no medical man at hand, he dressed and bandaged the wound himself in a perfectly professional manner, but he had absolutely forgotten that he had a wife and children. Carpenter tells of a child, who having fallen on his head, remained unconscious for three days. On regaining consciousness, he had forgotten everything he knew before except music. The author will cite several criminal cases and others within his own experience, which go to show what care must be exercised in recording the depositions of persons who have been wounded in the head. The first of these deals with a peasant, who, on his way to a fair, had been set upon, severely wounded, and robbed of his money, intended for the purchase of a cow. When interrogated the next day, this man was perfectly conscious. He related his story with the most minute accuracy, and his account was in absolute accord with the results of the inquiry. But he affirmed obstinately, and regardless of all objections, that the purchased cow had been stolen and not the money destined for the purpose. 
it was pressed upon him that he was going to the fair, and that the robbery took place the evening before the fair, that people had seen him fifteen minutes before the attack, and he had no cow with him then, etc. He would reflect a moment and always make the same reply, that does not matter, the cow was stolen, I do not know what she was like, nor how much she cost, but I had a cow. In this case, the inaccuracy of the statement could be easily proved, but what would have happened had the consequences been different, and the investigating officer set off on the quest for the unlawful possessor of a cow that had never been stolen? A miller's man had received in a riot a blow on the head from a stick, so violent that his skull was fractured, and he remained for a long time in an unconscious state. Questioned two days afterwards, he stated with perfect confidence that the man who struck him was very tall and had a long black beard. Fortunately, among all the persons mixed up in the affair, there was none that in the slightest degree answered this description. Besides, several witnesses affirmed that the culprit was a short young man with a fair mustache. If there had been no eye-witnesses, and if a man answering the description given had been mixed up in the affair, he would certainly have been arrested on the strength of the clearness and certitude of the statement made by the wounded man. The latter, it may be remarked in passing, had no motive for shielding the guilty man, as they were perfect strangers. On his restoration to health, he was again questioned, when he described the same person as the other witnesses, but explained that it appeared to him, stretched in a semi-conscious state on his bed, that a tall man with a long black beard was trying to drag him from the bed. The next is a case which, though not a criminal matter, is most instructive on more than one ground. It concerns a friend of the author's, a man absolutely trustworthy. This gentleman, Mr. S., visited one day with several friends the estate of his uncle. To get there, they had to cross a chain of mountains, and profited by the opportunity to do a little chamois hunting. In descending, Mr. S. fell from the top of a rocky wall and received severe injuries, a broken leg and fractured skull, so that he was carried in an unconscious state to the house of his uncle, where he remained a whole week in the same condition. What is most remarkable is that Mr. S. has not the least recollection, not only of his fall, but of everything that happened during the hour and a half preceding it. He remembers the smallest details of the start, of the ascent, of the talk he and his friends had on the way, etc., up to the moment when, just before reaching the summit, he pointed to the others a tree which recalled certain memories of the chase. From that moment all recollection vanished, although they had spoken of several important matters. On reaching the summit they breakfasted, drinking only spring water, and spoke of getting up a hunting party. Later on, when S. advanced along the rocky wall, his friends cried out to him to be careful, and at that moment he fell so unfortunately but S. is ignorant of all that. The fall has entirely effaced every recollection of what passed during the hour and a half. On waking up after the seven days during which his loss of consciousness lasted, his memory reverted directly to the talk about the tree mentioned above. Suppose that a similar thing had happened to a criminal seriously wounded during the commission of an offence, he would affirm that he knew nothing at all of what had passed during the hour and a half preceding the moment of his wound. Who would believe him? And if he were a witness, who would credit him straight off? People would simply say it was impossible, and he would be pressed with questions, cross-examined in short, until he began to recount all sorts of things which might very well have happened, but of which, in reality, he knows nothing." Another remarkable feature of this case is that Mr. S., although unconscious, made several quite sensible utterances. On leaving home, his mother had entrusted him with a message for the uncle he was about to visit. Now when he was carried unconscious to his uncle's house, and the latter in alarm called out his name, S. delivered his message accurately and clearly, 
although it was rather complicated, and immediately relapsed into his state of absolute unconsciousness. If it had been a criminal matter, absolutely no importance would have been attached to the utterances of the injured man. They would have been put down to delirium, and allowed to pass unheeded. Further, if the wounded man were inculpated in the crime, there would have been suspicion of his stimulating, or at least exaggerating, this unconscious state, since otherwise he could not have suddenly recovered consciousness so as to speak for an instant in a reasonable manner. We learn from this case that in such matters the most unlikely things are quite possible, that isolated facts have no value in themselves, but must be considered in their connection with each other, and that every important notion arising during an inquiry must be submitted to a special investigation before being recorded as an ascertained fact. Here is another characteristic case. A high official, Mr. C., was returning in a carriage from a round of inspection. The horses took fright. C. was thrown out of the carriage, seriously wounded on the head, and remained lying unconscious on a little frequented road. About half an hour later he recovered his senses, went on foot to the country house of a friend close at hand, entered the dining-room without announcing himself to any one, and there remained seated on a sofa. An hour afterwards, this happened in the afternoon, the master of the house found him there, and C. spoke to him quite sensibly. In the course of the conversation the host noticed that C. was under the impression that he had been in the house since morning, and had breakfasted there. When at last the wound on his head was observed, he professed to know nothing, neither of his injury, nor of his fall from the carriage, nor of any accident whatever, and persisted in his statement that he had been there since morning. Not until evening, when he was seized with traumatic fever, accompanied by delirium, did he wholly lose consciousness. Here again the same thing would have happened, as in the previous case, had a crime been in question. No one would have believed an accused person, a proved thief, for example, in his pretense of having entered the house without knowing how and if C. had been the victim of an act punishable by law, as an attack by a robber, he probably would have known no more about it than he did of his fall, and by his statement would have led the investigating officer completely astray. Such cases are by no means rare. An engineer was passing an inn accompanied by an old gentleman, when a soldier suddenly rushed out and threw himself upon him. Some drunken soldiers had been fighting in the inn, several of them had been chucked out, and one of them inflicted on the unsuspecting engineer as he passed a blow with a sabre in the head which knocked him down. As the fight went on in the road, the old man ran away to obtain assistance from a neighboring village. When he returned to the inn, accompanied by some of the villagers, he met the engineer. The latter knew nothing of the occurrence, and wondered where his companion had got to. He would not allow him to speak of the attack or of his wound, and yet the wound was so serious that when he came to be examined surgically, the brain itself was found to be exposed. It may also be remarked that according to Osterlen, this oblivion of incidents happening before a wound also occurs with persons who have been struck by lightning and have subsequently recovered. The following case is most instructive on several grounds. It caused great excitement, and no wonder, early in the year 1893. On 28th March, 1893, a murder, having theft for its motive, was committed in the house of one M. Bruner, a schoolmaster at Diebkirchen in Lower Bavaria. Two children of the schoolmaster had been killed with blows of a hoe, and his wife and the servant had been mortally wounded with the same instrument, and were found unconscious. The schoolmaster, who occupied a room apart from the others, had, when first questioned, shown himself so upset and given such extraordinary answers that he was taken to be the guilty person. Nor was this presumption dispelled until his wife recovered consciousness and could be questioned. She told the investigating officer that on awaking from a deep sleep, she found the bed all wet, 
As day was just breaking, she saw that it was blood, and again became insensible. Besides that, she could tell nothing, in spite of many questions put to her. She was absolutely ignorant of when, how, and from whom she had received such severe wounds, all on the head, and had even to be told by a third person that she was wounded at all. When the record was prepared, she signed without the slightest hesitation the name Martha Gutenberger, instead of her own Martha Brunner. The investigating officer inquired of the neighbors if by chance Gutenberger were her native name, but was told no. He then inquired if there were any other person of that name, and found that a former sweetheart of the nurse was so called, and that the schoolmaster had forbidden him to enter the house on account of his misconduct. The investigating officer jumped at this casual indication. Gutenberger was pursued, arrested at Munich, and immediately confessed. Thus, and Madame Brunner subsequently confirmed it, the schoolmaster's wife had recognized her assailant at the moment when he struck her, but she had forgotten the circumstance owing to the serious wounds in her head. But not altogether. The picture of the crime of Gutenberger had in reality entered into her consciousness, but in the second sphere, so that she had only a vague idea that the name Gutenberger was of primary importance. And she felt she had sufficiently met this demand by declaring his name instead of her own. This proves once more that Max de Soie was right in supposing that there are at least two spheres of consciousness, the first or higher, and the second or lower, in the latter of which are received always, or almost always, facts of which we take only partial account, or which are wholly distorted. But there is yet another point of view from which we must consider wounds in the head, that is in the case of criminals long since cured. Sander and Richter rightly call attention to the fact that even in our days medical men are slow to look for such influence. Although Delbruck, for example, out of fifty-eight prisoners attacked by mental maladies, found twenty-one with old head wounds, and Necht found seventy-three similarly marked out of two hundred fourteen criminals examined by him. See also Schlager. The Friedrichs Blatter reports a case which inculcates prudence. The subject had been guillotined. A post-mortem examination disclosed the existence of grave cranial defects. Radiating scars were found on one half of the cranium, which, arrested in its development, was one-third less than the other. These scars, coming from fractures of the skull, had been produced by a kick from a horse received at the age of fourteen, which had prevented the natural expansion of the cranial sutures. Galke reports an identical case. In making a post-mortem examination on a man who had been imprisoned for strangling his wife, he found that a complete hemisphere of the brain was wanting, the space being filled by a hydatid. This had been caused by a fall on the head. For other cases, see Dr. Paul Guder, etc. The net result of the foregoing is that it is the bounden duty of the investigating officer to consult a medical expert on every occasion on which he learns that the accused has been wounded on the head. He will often be informed of this if he notices on the person interrogated scars on the head, a striking asymmetry of the cranium, etc. End of section 15《section 16 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Criminal Investigation, A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1, by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Examination of Witnesses and Accused Continued C. Differences in the Observing Powers Resulting from Differences in the Natural Qualities and Intellectual Culture of the Observer In the examination of witnesses, the principal difficulty for the investigating officer is to appreciate the value of their depositions. 
if he is content with satisfying himself as to whether or not the witness be trustworthy, and has a character as a well-behaved and moral man, he will have followed the usual formulas, but will have made no true investigation. He can truly investigate only, by means of hard work, taking into account the differences in the fashion in which the various witnesses have observed, and by then going on to try to establish what these differences really are, and how the different groups of persons see things. Here he has abundance of materials, he finds them in every inquiry, in every examination, and if he only knows how to use them, he must of necessity attain positive results of great general value. This has not yet been generally achieved, and the reason is that the psychologists have not these observations at their disposal, while the jurists, who possess them, have abandoned the work of inference and deduction to the psychologists. Thus each of us has today at his disposal only the materials which he has himself painfully gathered together. But the leading principles, the general rules, have as yet been propounded by no one. However, with a stout heart and hard work, each of us can localize a certain number of starting points, which later on will be of great utility. The root of the matter is, as we have already indicated, to establish this fact, that the witnesses, however anxious they may undoubtedly be to speak the truth, have told different stories, while if they had observed accurately, they should have all given absolutely identical accounts. This done, we must endeavor to discover the cause of the difference between their statements. Here the investigating officer will do well to begin by trying to find out whether the fault does not lie with himself and his bungling way of setting to work. Let him consider above all whether he has not pressed the witnesses too far. No one in the world is by nature an exact observer, and if he has not noticed a particular detail, all the questions in the world are worthless. Moreover, it frequently happens that a detail, which today is of decisive importance, could not appear in any way material at that moment when the occurrence was observed. This importance is discovered only afterwards, and the investigating officer, who himself knows today how important it is, is too often powerless to place himself in the situation in which the witness found himself at the moment when he witnessed the occurrence which to him then appeared absolutely insignificant. For example, the witness has seen a man come out of a house and has looked at him, just as we are in the habit of glancing at any passer-by. Later on it turns out that this man has committed a crime in the house. Then the inquisition of the unfortunate witness begins, and every attempt is made to force him to know that of what he is perfectly ignorant. But you have at least seen if but you must at least know that, and so on. As a matter of fact, we know no more at the end than at the beginning, and that is the best thing that can happen. The worst result is if the witness be harassed into making a false statement. If there are many witnesses, and their statements differ, of two things one knows, either they have not been examined after the same fashion, or if they have, the method was a bad one. In the first case, what ordinarily happens is this. We question the first witness quietly, and if he does not know much, we do not lose patience, but console ourselves with the thought that the others will be better posted up. But as we go on with witness after witness, this hope dwindles. Then we lose temper and press the witness, with the result it is true that he tells a long story, but the accuracy of the statements becomes less and less. When then we come to compare the recorded depositions, it is seen that there is no agreement, solely because the witnesses have been pressed in different directions. The witnesses have observed right enough, but the investigating officer has examined them badly. We do not, of course, mean to say that an investigating officer should question in an indifferent and dry manner, for there are many people, and especially country people, who at the beginning of an examination know absolutely nothing, 
and what they really do know can be extracted only by cross-examination. The witness must be questioned with care and accuracy, but not driven and compelled to give out what he does not know. These are two very different modes of proceeding. But if after having really treated all the witnesses in the same way, we still obtain different statements, there must be really a difference in the method of the witnesses. But the origin of these differences must not always be looked for solely in differences of observational powers, for frequently the primary cause is to be found in the office of the investigating officer himself. This is important from a psychological point of view when we come to estimate the value of depositions. It constantly happens, and this is most true of India, that for one reason or another witnesses take it into their head that we want to make them responsible for the crime. It may be that they are afraid of being suspected of being themselves the perpetrators, or that they are conscious of negligence which may have facilitated the perpetration, or that they may be considered as abettors or accessories of the accused, etc. In all these cases, and in a hundred such, the witness will, despite their best intention to speak the truth, fashion it the way apparently most useful to themselves. They will rely on certain details, they will slur over others, they will arrange the various incidents in a new manner, and if the investigating officer examines attentively all the depositions, he will recognize the existence of a group of persons deposing inaccurately, the group of frightened people, always imagining themselves suspected and constantly shuffling. The magistrate befogs himself and confuses the whole inquiry, if, being himself a man of imagination, he has in hand a witness as highly endowed with that quality as himself, and knowing something of the affair. Often in such a case he allows himself to come to rash conclusions, which he does not conceal from the witness. The latter, yielding to his own inclination, willingly accepts these, and goes on to pad them out in his own way. The judge proceeds to build, on the fresh details added by the witness, new hypotheses, and thus each in turn giving the other a lift up, both are lost in the clouds. In the result, the magistrate no longer knows what the witness has told him, and the witness cannot distinguish between what he knew before and what he has picked up from the magistrate, so that the resulting deposition is for the most part the product of the combined imaginations of magistrate and witness. We must not imagine that an honest witness will at all hazard stick to the truth. It is difficult to believe how far the imagination of emotional, though highly intellectual, persons will carry them. Besides, in such cases, each of the parties clings to the authority of the other, the magistrate to that of the witness, who, he thinks, must know all about it, the witness to that of the magistrate, who is deemed to be well versed in the law. Thus each, just as he desires, finds in the authority of the other room to give a loose rein to his imagination, and both are highly gratified. To convince oneself of this fact, one has only to note how easily emotional persons can be made to relate occurrences which they have never seen or heard, and that without any recourse to suggestion. In spite of their earnest desire to stick to the exact truth, on the first opportunity they strike off to the right or left, and at last can no longer distinguish between what they have really seen and what they have only imagined. With such persons the investigating officer cannot be too careful or reserved, especially if he himself be of an imaginative turn. But the plan to be adopted will be just the opposite with a reserved, laconic witness, one who weighs his words, and, simply through indifference, says no more than he is obliged to say. We do not for a moment suggest that the witness should be cross-examined or bullied into saying what is wanted. No, he must be piloted very differently. We must gently lead him along with us, show him the deep interest we ourselves are taking in the matter, and the time we have devoted to it, explain to him the importance of his own statements, make him understand how important it is 
that he should tell everything and describe everything in exact conformity with the truth. Then we see the witness brighten up, little by little, when he begins to understand the magistrate and his business. When he has got to that stage, he realizes the importance of careful reflection, of remembering, and of communicating everything which returns slowly to his memory. Thus the investigating officer may obtain, not without difficulty, it is true, the most valuable testimony from the most indifferent witness. Hence we must always begin by making sure of the natural characteristics of the witness beforehand, treating him in accordance therewith. But it is not enough to take into account the natural disposition and characteristics of the witness. His environment, his idiosyncrasies, his opinions, etc., are of just as great importance. Many persons, even in the gravest emergencies, allow themselves to be influenced more or less by their religious, political, or social standing, by considerations of family, of profession, perhaps even of club or society, and that without the slightest intention of departing by a hair's breadth from the truth. There are many details which they wish neither to see nor to hear, or that they see and hear them otherwise than the actual happening, so that a witness who would naturally be for the prosecution becomes one for the defense and vice versa. More than once it has happened to the author, in consequence of a strange answer given by a witness, to make inquiries as to his personal status, and as a result of these inquiries to value his statements very differently. Finally, the age and the sex of the witness are of importance. Of course, we cannot fix absolutely the age at which witnesses are more or less worthy of credit. We must, in addition, and even to a greater extent, take into account all the other elements which go to make up a man, his natural qualities and intellectual culture. But still, certain broad rules may be laid down as to age. In one sense, the best witnesses are children of seven to ten years of age. Love and hatred, ambition and hypocrisy, considerations of religion and rank, of social position and fortune, are as yet unknown to them. It is impossible that preconceived opinions, nervous irritation, or long experience, should lead them to form erroneous impressions. The mind of the child is but a mirror that reflects accurately and clearly what is found before it. These are great advantages, accompanied, however, by certain corresponding drawbacks. The greatest is that we cannot place ourselves at the point of view of the child. It uses, indeed, the same words as we do, but these words convey to it very different ideas. Further, the child perceives things differently from grown-up people. The conceptions of magnitude, great or small, of pace, fast or slow, of beauty and ugliness, of distance, near or far, are quite different in the child's brain from in ours, still more so when facts are in question. Facts to us, perfectly indifferent, delight or terrify the child, and what for us is magnificent, or touching, does not affect it in the least." we are ignorant of the impression produced on the child's mind. There is yet another difficulty. The horizon of the child being much narrower than ours, a large number of our perceptions are outside the frame within which alone the child can perceive. We know, within certain limits, the extent of this frame. We should not, for instance, question a child as to how a complicated piece of roguery was committed, or how adulterous relations have developed. We know it is ignorant of such things. But in many directions we do not know the exact point where its faculty of observation commences or stops. At times we cannot explain how it does not understand something or other, while at other times we are astonished to see it find its bearings easily among matters thought to be well beyond its intelligence. We are, as a rule, too distrustful of the capacity of a child. We have rarely found too much expected of it, while we have often discovered that it knew and noted much more than any one imagined. The same experiences occurs to us in daily life. 
how many times do not people speak in its presence of things a child is not supposed to understand, only to discover later on that it has not only understood very well, but has combined the information with other things heard before or after. Again, it must not be forgotten that a child is peculiarly exposed to external influences, whether designed or accidental. Anyone, knowing that a child is to appear as a witness in a court of justice, if he is interested in its statements and has the chance of influencing it himself, will almost certainly exert that influence. The child, as yet devoid of principles, places great faith in the words of grown-up people. So if a grown-up person brings influence to bear upon it, especially some time after the occurrence, the child will imagine it has really seen what it has been led to believe. This result is obtained with certainty if the man proceeds slowly and by degrees, leading the child to the desired goal by repeated simple questions as, Is it not so? It was not so, was it not thus? The result is the same when the influence is undesigned. An important event happens, it is naturally much talked of, all sorts of hypotheses are started, there is gossip of what others have seen or might in certain circumstances have seen. If a child, which has itself seen something of the occurrence, hears these conversations, they become deeply engraved on its young mind, and ultimately it believes it has himself seen what the others have related. One must therefore be always careful in questioning children, but their statements, if judiciously obtained, generally supply material of great value. In passing from the child to the succeeding age, it becomes necessary to distinguish sex, for just as sex differentiates in external appearance the youth from the girl, so are they differentiated in their methods of perception. An intelligent boy is undoubtedly the best observer to be found, the world begins to take him by storm with its thousand matters of interest. What the school and his daily life furnish cannot satisfy his overflowing and generous heart. He lays hold of everything new, striking, strange. All his senses are on the stretch to assimilate it as far as possible. No one notices a change in the house, no one discovers the bird's nest, no one observes anything out of the way in the fields, but nothing of that sort escapes the boy. Everything which emerges above the monotonous level of daily life gives him a good opportunity for exercising his wits, for extending his knowledge, and for attracting the attention of his elders, to whom he communicates his discoveries. The spirit of the youth not having as yet been led astray by the necessities of life, its storms and battles, its factions and quarrels, he can freely abandon himself to everything which appears out of the way. His life has not yet been disturbed by education, though he often observes more clearly and accurately than any adult. Besides, he has already got some principles. Lying is distasteful to him, because he thinks it mean. He is no stranger to the sentiment of self-respect, and he never loses an opportunity of being right in what he affirms. Thus he is, as a rule, but little influenced by the suggestions of others, and he describes objects and occurrences as he has really seen them. We say again that an intelligent boy is, as a rule, the best witness in the world. It is a different affair with a young girl of the same age. Her natural qualities and her education prevent her from acquiring the necessary knowledge and the breadth of view which the boy soon achieves, and these are the conditions absolutely indispensable for accurate observation. The girl remains longer in the narrow family circle, at her mother's apron strings, while the boy is off with his playmates, picking up in the fields and in the woods all sorts of knowledge of the ordinary aspect of common things, which is the best training for discovering, distinguishing, and observing anything extraordinary or out of the way when it turns up. With his father and his playmates, the boy learns to know the great sum of practical things of which life is composed, and which one must know before being able to talk about them. The girl has no training of this sort. 
she goes out less, she has little to do with workmen, artisans, or tradesmen, who are in many ways the schoolmasters of the boy anxious to learn. She sees nothing of human life, and when anything extraordinary happens, she is incapable, one might almost suggest, of seizing it with her senses, that is to say, of observing accurately. If besides there be danger, noise, fear, all which attract the boy and serve to excite his curiosity, she gets out of the way in alarm, and either sees nothing or sees it indistinctly from a distance. A young girl may, even in certain circumstances, be a dangerous witness, when she is interested in the matter, or is herself perchance the centre. In such a case strong exaggerations and even pure inventions are to be feared. Natural gifts, imagination, dreaming, romantic exaltation, such are the natural degrees by which the girl, too young yet to have had any interesting experiences of her own, arrives at last at Byronism. Now Byronism is a sort of ennui or weariness of life, always urging one to seek for change, and what happier variety could there be than a criminal matter in which the little lady finds herself mixed up? It is interesting enough in itself to appear in the witness box, to make a deposition, and to intervene in the destiny of another, but how much more noteworthy is it when an important matter is in question, when the attention of every one is turned upon the witness, when all the world is breathless to learn what she has been asked, what she has replied, and how the case is going to turn. Thus an insignificant theft is easily magnified into a robbery with violence. The witness, out of a miserable swindler, manufactures a pale and interesting young man. A coarse word becomes a blow. An insignificant event develops into a romantic abduction. Stupid chaff turns up as a great conspiracy. A young girl is also a very dangerous witness at, and often previous to, the period of her first menstruation, or as it is called in India, attaining her age. Many women remain similarly influenced throughout their whole life, before and during each period of menstruation. Climate is frequently a factor in causing this aberration. In short, too great care cannot be observed in interrogating a young girl to whatever class of society she belongs. But, to be just, we must recognize on the other hand that no one notices and knows certain things more cleverly than a young girl. If her imagination does not carry her away, she can furnish information more valuable than any grown-up person. The reason is the same as we have given for her exaggerations and inventions. Her school, her life, her daily tasks, do not afford sufficient nourishment for her imaginations and her dreams. The sexual instinct begins to awaken. She searches around her, almost unconsciously, for incidents touching, however remotely, this sphere. No one discovers more rapidly than a sprightly young girl approaching maturity the little carryings on and intrigues of her neighbors. The delicacy of her sensibility enables her to seize the least shade of sympathy which the pair she is observing have for each other, and long before they have found it out themselves, she knows what their true feelings are for each other. She notes accurately the birth of the intimacy. She knows when they spoke for the first time, and she anticipates long before what the result will be, reconciliation or rupture. In short, she knows everything earlier and better than anyone else in her circle. Connected with this is the trick young girls have of spying on certain people. An interesting beauty or a young man acquaintance have no more vigilant watcher of all their goings-on than their neighbor, a little girl of twelve to fourteen. No one knows better than she who they are, what they do, what company they keep, when they go out, and how they dress. She even notes the moral traits of those coming under her supervision, their joy, their grief, their disappointments, their hopes, and all their experiences. If one desires information on such subjects, the best witnesses are schoolgirls, always supposing that they are willing to tell the truth. 
From youth we pass to adults, who, though in the flower of their existence, are far from furnishing the best witnesses. The adult is in general the worst of all observers. Finding himself in the happiest epoch of his life, full of hope and ideals, interested only in himself and his desires, the young man finds nothing important but himself. Childhood is far away, middle-aged and old men have long ago ceased to exist for him. What they do is of no importance. The world is the empire of youth, what interests it is a loan of value, nothing else is worth troubling about. The ideal representative of this age is the young lady to whom the disappearance of the world would be a matter of no moment compared with the momentous matter of a ball, or the student to whom his club or society is the most serious thing under the sun. All this, of course, changes with time, but youth with its plenitude of force is the personification of that robust egotism which takes possession of the world and in all its diversions sees only itself. Anyone who has critically watched himself and watched others knows all this. Whoever has had the opportunity of questioning young people about important facts happening in their neighborhood is at once irritated and delighted at the sublime indifference exhibited. But if perchance the young man has observed, his deposition will be true and trustworthy. He has preserved his good principles, not yet scattered by the storms of life. In middle age, man employs all the forces with which he has been endowed by nature. His good and bad qualities alike have reached their fullest development. And what the middle-aged man and woman want to perceive, they can perceive and describe. Their career, the goal of their labors, is fixed. Their likes and their dislikes are formed, and that decisively. The middle-aged man thus has a clearly defined position in all circumstances. When it is a question of testimony as to justice or injustice, he advances with a firm and decided step. True, this is the case only with the man of sound moral principles, for there is no period of life in which man is assailed more violently by his passions, malevolence, egoism, self-seeking, discord, than when he mounts to the highest plane of his life, when he is the most active, but also the most unreasonable. These passions never exert their influence on him more strongly than at this age. Their omnipotence makes him an unconscious liar and there is no witness more difficult to tackle, or more dangerous, than the man in full possession of all his faculties, both good and bad. If you ask the difference between the word of a man and that of a woman, we can only reply in the words of the poet, Man has great ideas, woman profound sentiments. For the man the world is his heart, for the woman her heart is the world. This explains the vast difference between the standpoints of observation of the man and the woman. We can even say beforehand how a man and a woman will assimilate a fact which they have both seen. And what is interesting and instructive, and at the same time right to establish with certainty, is exactly that one anticipates what one is going to hear. We are then armed against anything which may lead us astray or befog us, and moreover, we can go straight to the point before an inaccurate and distorted statement has been definitely recorded. The old man comes last. He is either sweet and conciliatory, or sour and cynical, according to his luck in life. His senses and faculties of observation are weakened, but experience tells him by a sort of insight what his eyes do not catch, and frequently his opinion may be summed up in the words, to understand is to forgive. In fact, the old man has become a child again. Accurate perception of external objects is wanting, but also his passions are dulled. He sees simply and without cunning, the difference between the sexes is again accentuated, the old man and the old woman see and understand things like children, and the suggestions of another in favor of this or that regain their power just as when they were young. End of section 16.
Section 17 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Criminal Investigation, A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1, by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Examination of Witnesses and Accused. Continued. B. When the witness does not wish to speak the truth. Everyone knows that it is impossible to lay down a rule for preventing witnesses lying, but that they would lie much less if investigating officers would only give themselves more trouble. That is a fact which everyone must admit who knows with what rapidity investigating officers frequently interrogate the most important witnesses. It is true, they have generally no time to do otherwise. But it is just this rapidity which is the cause of the numerous false depositions to be found on our records. The only means of remedying this evil, which eats into the very vitals of the state and society, is for the officer to carefully prepare his interrogatory, not to be afraid to remind the witness at length that he must speak the truth, and to probe him to the bottom, especially if he has the slightest suspicion that his statement is false. But to enable the investigating officer really to manage the affair in his own way, in the interests of the state, he should have much more time at his disposal than he generally has. If this be so, the number of officers should be increased. If the investigating officer has sufficient time for his work, good results may be expected, and justice will be done under the best possible conditions. Whoever is acquainted with the progress of an inquiry knows that a minute examination may preserve the investigating officer from the gravest blunders. This is all the more important in India, where the first inquiry, or as it is in this case technically called investigation, is generally made by the police, who cannot put witnesses on oath, and to whom the witnesses are not, by a change in the law made in Act Five of 1898, compelled to speak the truth. True, the investigating police officer can take the witnesses before a magistrate, under Section 164, Criminal Procedure Code, to have their statements recorded formally and on oath, but by this time the mischief has probably been done. The magistrate may himself, instead of ordering a police investigation, hold a preliminary inquiry, section 159, Criminal Procedure Code, and it is to be regretted that this course is not more frequently adopted. When the magistrate does so inquire, he should lay himself out for a thorough and scientific examination of the witnesses. In either event, the case is too often presented to the trying or committing magistrate in a case of hopeless confusion. The importance of a minute interrogatory is clearly shown in the case where a complicated plot has been laid to deceive the investigating officer, and the falsity of the depositions must be exposed. Take the following case concocted in a very short time, and by absolutely ignorant women. It was a case of affiliation, in which the attempt was made to father a child on a well-to-do but mean peasant. The fraud was discovered, and the mother of the child, as well as her mother, were prosecuted for defamation. Both denied it, and appealed to the testimony of a woman, who they asserted could give important evidence in their favor. As soon as this woman was summoned, she was visited by the two accused, but she could in no way confirm the occurrences to which they wished her to speak. Then they tried to get her to promise to give false testimony. She would not consent, but in response to their urgent entreaties, consented for a certain sum to sell them the summons and not to appear before the court. Another woman was readily found to appear in the witness box, fortified by the summons of the real witness, and agree to corroborate all the statements of the two accused. Fortunately, the investigating officer examined this woman carefully and at length, and when he came to speak of matters that the real witness must have known, her personatrix got into difficulties, hesitated, and could give no satisfactory replies as to certain personal details, etc. Thus the investigating officer succeeded, not it is true without difficulty, 
in establishing that the person in the box was not the person that should have been there. This might be thought an isolated instance, but the author has come across at least two other cases where a substituted witness has appeared with the summons of the genuine one. In one case, the deception was discovered by minute examination. In the other, the witness gave himself away at the end of his examination by signing his deposition in his own name. Questioned by the investigating officer, he was so upset that there could be no doubt that he had intended to deceive justice. Now, if within a narrow circle one knows no fewer than three cases in which this trick has been somewhat cleverly attempted, how frequently must it be tried on, and how few must there be who can detect it? Often, too, the most detailed and meticulous examination fails to disclose the falsity of a cleverly got-up statement. The problem, then, is, which is the craftier, the investigating officer or the witness? But the investigating officer always holds the best hand of trumps in this contest. The investigating officer is the calmer of the two, for after all the witness is playing a dangerous game and risks his liberty, while the worst that can happen to the investigating officer is once more to be made a fool of. Besides, the investigating officer knows the whole record of the case, he knows approximately what may be true and what must be false. The depositions of the witnesses, as the inquiry advances, are stories which should fit into the whole building. He can denounce them as false when they do not so fit in. Above all, the investigating officer is in the happy position of being able to ask questions, which the witness, unless in very exceptional circumstances, cannot do. By questioning, and questioning thoroughly, the investigating officer always arrives at a point of which the witness has not dreamed, and on which he has not consulted his accomplices. The slightest indication of contradiction betrays to the investigating officer the weak point of the convention between the witnesses and the accused, and he has only to follow up on the same lines to pierce the whole tissue of lies. But to arrive at this result, he must take full advantage of the superiority of his situation. He must question freely and record every reply. The growth of these useful materials does not, or need not, materially swell the record. If the officer has well studied the matter, if he knows clearly what he wants and the goal he has in view, if he interrogates only on points of real importance and records the replies briefly and concisely, he will have fewer words but more matter, and the record will be no longer. This job, of course, is not always very pleasant, but the investigating officer is not there to amuse himself, and he who is afraid of such worries should not become an investigating officer. As an example, we may take the case where an investigating officer has to combat a false alibi, certainly the most dangerous obstacle to the conviction of the real malefactor. Carl Steiner it was, we believe, who truly said, quote, To be a good poacher, three things are indispensable, a gun that takes to pieces, a blackened face, and a good alibi. End quote. That is just what happens in countries where poaching is common. In the mountains, things almost always happen thus. A woodcutter goes poaching, the keepers surprise but cannot catch him because he has got the start of them, the gun is concealed in a crevice in the rock, and the cattleman and his wife swear that at the very hour when the keepers pretend to have seen him, he was in their hut, patching his working clothes. Everything is carefully and beautifully arranged beforehand, and all goes well so long as the investigating officer does not poke his nose into details, and does not put questions too precise and troublesome, and asks everything he is at liberty to ask. How they were seated, how long they were together, what they did, what they said, in what order things occurred, etc. If the officer has taken the indispensable precaution of summoning the accused and the witnesses at the same time, and of so ordering his examination that a witness once examined cannot communicate with those yet to come, it will be very odd if he cannot get contradictory statements. The most complicated proofs of alibi, concocted by the most experienced scoundrels, are just the same. The only difference is that they are perhaps got up more carefully. 
yet we believe it is always possible to prove the falsity of the false alibi. The job sometimes involves a lot of trouble, necessitating wearisome and repeated examinations, but cannot fail to bring to light contradictions. The most difficult cases to deal with are those in which an alibi is set up, all the incidents attaching to which are perfectly true, the time or date alone having been changed, i.e., if the crime has been committed on a Monday, a meeting which has taken place on a previous day is transferred to the Monday. Then, of course, all the details given by the different witnesses will fit in. If this procedure be suspected, the best plan is to cross-examine the witnesses regarding the incidents of previous and subsequent days. In other words, having satisfied oneself that the alibi is false, the next problem, and the only one, will be how to break down the witness as to date. As all the incidents deposed to actually occurred, cross-examination as to them will be not only waste of time, but will tend as well to establish the truth of the story. We must consequently proceed to incidents outside the witness's story. Richard Harris, K.C., in his book, Hints on Advocacy, discusses this question at considerable length. He points out that such questions as, where were you the day before, or the day after, are useless. You must take the witness entirely out of the circumstance, and ask something which he does not anticipate. You must ask about dates as much previous, or as much subsequent to the day in question, as possible. Even if the accused be in prison, we must not imagine that all necessary precautions have been taken. So long as one cannot keep each accused by himself, compel him to solitude even in his walks, surround him with absolutely incorruptible warders, it will be impossible to prevent him communicating with his friends outside. The greatest danger in this respect comes from his co-prisoners, especially when they are under remand, for one never knows when the inquiry against any one of them will not suddenly break down and the man be set at liberty. In such circumstances, the accused have always taken the necessary precautions. They have arranged among themselves what each shall tell the friends and relations of the other, if he ever gets outside the prison walls. Thus it is that, as we all know, it frequently happens that an accused suddenly starts an alibi which he has just thought of. We cannot understand how this man could be so indifferent to his fate, as not to have bethought himself sooner of so easy a means of at once proving his innocence. But we understand it all when we find out that another accused, confined in the same cell as this man, of the bad memory, has just been set at liberty. To him has been entrusted the working up of the alibi. If we cannot show that a person detained in the same cell has been liberated, we may be sure that the accused has managed to get a letter smuggled outside, giving the particulars of his scheme, for who would have so poor a memory as to forget for so long so important a defense? But once we establish that a false alibi has been got up, we have a fine game with the witnesses. As a general rule, it is more difficult to unmask false witnesses when their evidence has nothing to do with an alibi. Then the chief weapon of the investigating officer, the discovery of contradictions, becomes useless. Whoever wants to prove an alibi always takes care to have at least two witnesses, for he knows it is not likely that one will inspire confidence. But in other cases, especially when an accused wishes to present the whole circumstances of a case, it is often difficult for him to produce more than one witness for each particular moment. If then we have to combine the evidence of several witnesses, the contradictions which may appear in small details and especially in incidents of very short duration, do not count for much. For instance, if a man wishes to prove that he has not taken part in a row, and that three witnesses can corroborate his statement, they will naturally be questioned only as to the moment at which the complainant was wounded. The false witnesses will be careful not to enter too much into details, or to affirm anything too positively. It will be enough for them to swear that at that moment at which the complainant was wounded, their friend was not near him. But they cannot say exactly how everything happened, the row was too great, and the whole affair was over in a minute. 
it is difficult to say how in such a case we can discover contradictions, but if that method does not succeed, we must try another. The preceding rules, of course, lose none of their value. Study and get up the case as minutely as you can, and cross-examine thoroughly. But another rule may be added. Discriminate as closely as possible the various portions of a witness's deposition. It is not sufficient to wait until the deposition becomes, for some reason or other, suspicious, for as soon as such reason arises, we have the end of the thread in our hands, and can ordinarily unravel it with ease. But it is necessary to face in advance the possible falsehood of every statement of witnesses. To do so is not to display exaggerated mistrust, but is only a proof of prudence and experience, for one has often found false depositions slip into an enquiry in the most innocent and least expected form. Starting from this principle, we must first try to see if for some reason the witness is not speaking the truth, though desirous of doing so. If no ground is discovered for adopting this hypothesis, we must ask ourselves if perchance the witness does not wish to tell the truth. This will lead us to search for some reason for his desire, a search which may indeed lead to the conclusion that no such reason exists. Such a ground may perhaps be found in the personal relations of the witness with the accused or the wounded man, or perhaps in some real connection between the witness and the occurrence itself. In the former case, it may not be difficult to establish friendship, relationship, or some other tie, but in the latter, an accurate knowledge of all the circumstances can alone show if the witness is to any extent interested in the result of the investigation, if he has himself been an accomplice, or if he is afraid of being considered an accomplice of the accused. If we find that the witness has any sort of connection with the affair, we must to some extent accept with mistrust all that he says and verify every one of his statements. We must spare no trouble to ascertain the point of view at which the witness stations himself. This is not so difficult as one would think. The witness almost always betrays himself, if only by a word. We can in this connection learn much from the novelist, by comparing ourselves, when reading a romance, to guess which will be the hero and which the villain of the story, and that from the very beginning, before the author has expressly pictured them as such. Almost always our guess will be correct, often thanks to a single word. The hero may have the very worst character, but will never be avaricious, stingy, envious, untruthful, or spiteful. He will not always be depicted as an ideal of masculine beauty, but he will never be bald, he will not squint, he will not have bad teeth, or if he has, the teeth will be left out, and he will possess instead a broad and lofty forehead, or a piercing glance. He may be clad carelessly or out of the fashion, but his linen will always be scrupulously clean. The villain will perhaps be presented to us at the outset, gifted with every physical and intellectual good quality. Under the mask of an honest man, he will insinuate himself into the heart of the ingenuous reader, until he finds that the author makes him speak with harsh voice, or cast a furtive glance, or appear dressed with a tawdry elegance. Our man would never have received such epithets, had not the author intended later on to unveil him as a scoundrel. This is precisely the procedure of a witness who desires to save the guilty and inculpate the innocent. In the former case he will be careful, especially if he is apt at the work, to attribute to the accused some bad qualities and prudently to admit those traits in his character which it is impossible to deny. But he will guard himself against saying anything likely to render the accused contemptible, or to permanently injure him in our estimation. On the other hand, does he wish to prejudice the accused? At the start he will be genial, he will excuse, he will embellish. Then all at once he will make use of some epithet which will attract the attention of the investigating officer, and remind him to be prudent. The witness imputes to the accused matters too grave to be considered as stated conscientiously. For observations of this kind, one need not be a great psychologist. With good will and sustained attention, 
almost every one will in time arrive at the exact moment at which the witness lets slip the word that betrays him of course we have not yet indisputable proofs but the investigating officer has strong foundations for suspecting the sincerity of the witness's statements it is not as a rule difficult to verify the justness of the suspicion he has only to relate or describe to the witness some fact having an important bearing on the innocence or guilt of the accused and of which the investigating officer is certain either from having witnessed it himself or heard it from absolutely trustworthy witnesses as everything can be comprehended and related in several different ways the suspected witness if really disloyal will tell his story in such a way that the investigating officer can at once see how he is disfiguring the facts but a distinction must be drawn between the false witness and he who is only partial nor must a mere slight colouring in the description be taken too seriously indeed it is so clearly distinguishable from the real false deposition that confusion is hardly possible if the verification has been to the disadvantage of the witness a second verification may be necessary as a check but if the latter only confirms our suspicions the best course is ordinarily to tell the witness straight what we think of his story we shall at least thereby prevent him from continuing his lies it often happens especially when we are dealing with people not particularly obdurate that the witness attempts more or less impudently to lie to the investigating officer then turns round and tells the truth as soon as he sees that the investigating officer is not going to allow himself to be taken in we may assert indeed that it is all the fault of the investigating officer for if he had paid better attention from the very beginning he would have easily prevented the development of the whole tissue of falsehoods there also he must open his eyes and especially note carefully the contradictions in the deposition of the witness and those between the deposition and the facts for there is no check more powerful and more surprising to such a witness than a clear and striking ocular demonstration of course attention must also be paid to small details for instance the witness pretends that a certain man has read him something whereas the man in question can neither read nor write again a witness affirms that his house was in danger of catching fire although it was not in the direction in which the wind was blowing at the time or he asserts he remained out of doors half an hour with naked feet although the snow was knee-deep the witness states that the river frequently rises so high that it overflows we have only to look at the stones emerging but a little above the water to see that they are covered with a thick bed of moss which would not be there if the stones were frequently submerged the witness says his son had already drawn his attention to something a small calculation shows that at the time in question the son was only four years old similar examples of contradictions and self-evident impossibilities are frequently met with in our records they supply the surest method of demonstrating to the witness the falsity of his deposition but we must first discover them this is never very difficult if one gives sedulous attention to the examination listens carefully to the reading of the record and always pictures to oneself in imagination what the witness has related the last is indispensable and of the greatest assistance words alone do not contradict each other so strongly or clearly as facts or at least one does not notice so clearly the contradiction in the words but if we compel ourselves to build up in our mind the scene as the witness has described it or as we know it from previous recitals and to adjust what we are told with what we already know if in the course of the narrative of the witness we follow closely the facts and allow in thought the whole scene to unroll itself at the very spot where according to our previous information it must have taken place it is almost impossible for an improbability or an impossibility to escape us we must always abandon ourselves wholly to the business thus only can our task be fully accomplished we have already mentioned cases in which the wrong man comes forward as a witness sometimes when a medical examination has to be undergone a substitute is sent caspar lyman refers us to the historic case of the countess of essex 
Lady Frances Howard, who sent another young person instead of herself to prove her virginity. Such cases happen very often nowadays. The author remembers a case where A injured B with a stick, but without fracturing a bone. B, summoned to appear in court, sent C, who happened to have fallen from a tree and broken his arm. C appeared, gave the name of B, was examined and cross-examined, and the fraud was not detected until much later, by which time B had succeeded in obtaining much heavier compensation from A. In another case, instead of a woman A, a pregnant woman B was sent to court to personate A, and prove that she was pregnant. Sometimes the wrong person comes forward as the accused. The person D, suspected of forgery, sends E, who personates D, and states that he is half-blind, and therefore unable to commit forgery. He undergoes medical examination, his blindness is proved, and the prosecution of D is dropped. In another case, F, accused of concealment of birth, declared herself to be too ill to appear at court. A commissioner was sent to the house, where an old woman showed him her daughter lying in bed. A medical examination took place, the result of which established that the girl had never had a child at all, certainly not within a few days. Later on doubts arose, leading to the suspicion that the sister of the girl had taken her place in the bed, and had been examined in her stead. In another case, H was summoned for fraud, and sent J, who was arrested as H. After J had been in jail for four or five days, H succeeded in leaving the country, and J declared his real identity. In another case, K had been allowed out on bail, and on the day of the first remand, L appeared in his stead and was committed to jail. Advantage was taken of a change of magistrates, but the clerk of the court observed something different about the appearance of the man. It turned out that K had gone to bed and was too lazy to get up, so he sent L, who was also on bail for another offense. K fully intended to give himself up, but wanted to have another day's leave. All these cases prove how easily and how often such substitution can and does happen, although the consequences may be of the greatest importance. It is difficult to avoid them altogether, as each witness cannot in all cases be properly identified. But if anything strange appears in the case, such as peculiar behavior on the part of the witness, we must make it a rule to be specially careful. A question which in many cases assumes great importance is as to the value to be attached to the statements of dying persons. These statements may have to be taken into account in various ways. Thus the investigating officer may have to question wounded persons or those suffering from poison. He may have to record the depositions of persons who on their deathbed betray secrets long safely guarded and accuse someone of a crime. Sometimes dying persons salve their consciences by accusing themselves of crime. Perchance they may testify to the innocence of one who has been convicted. In such cases, the dying statement has a special importance, because on account of lapse of time or some other circumstance, every other proof is wanting. If the investigating officer has been able himself to question the dying person, or perhaps to administer an oath, the difficulty is less, because he has had the opportunity of noting for himself the way in which the deposition has been given, and so forming an opinion on its value but very often it has been impossible to secure the presence of the investigating officer, and the statement is made to third persons who hand it on to him. Naturally, such witnesses must be questioned with special accuracy and appropriate precautions. Particularly in every case the medical expert should decide whether the dying person is in a fit condition to make a sensible statement. If the medical man gives an absolutely affirmative reply to this question, another arises. Does the fact of being at the point of death exercise any special influence over the truth of the statement? The opinion of lawyers varies greatly on this point. Some declare that the words of a dying man are true and infallible in all cases. Others are of opinion that they must be valued on the same footing as those of any other man. This is the view adopted by the Indian legislature, 
as enacted in the Indian Evidence Act, Section 32. Quote, Statements, written or verbal, of relevant facts made by a person who is dead, are themselves relevant facts. 1. When the statement is made by a person as to the cause of his death, or as to any of the circumstances of the transaction which resulted in his death, in cases in which the cause of that person's death comes into question. Such statements are relevant whether the person who made them was or was not, at the time when they were made, under expectation of death. End quote. The last proviso differentiates the law of India from that of England, where such a statement cannot be legally used as evidence unless it be proved that the deceased was, when making it, in expectation of death. Clergymen, and especially Catholic priests, who have heard a thousand times the last secrets of the dying, must have had much greater experience than lawyers on so important a question. The opinion of enlightened and unprejudiced priests is that the answer depends upon whether the dying man is or is not a true believer. In the former case, every credence can be given to his statement, since, in the firm conviction that he is about to appear before the supreme judge, he will certainly not burden his conscience with a grave sin. The difficulty is to know whether the dying man is or is not a true believer. Assuming that he is not a believer, a further distinction must be drawn. In the first case, the dying man has no need to be cautious, because his memory cannot be injured by what he says, or because it matters little to him if it be, so long as he is sure that no injury can befall his relations in honor, fortune, or any other fashion. Here the deposition made in presence of death is true, even if the deponent has not been in life one to whom absolute credence could be accorded. But when it can be proved that the unbeliever still takes an interest in his own memory and his relations' welfare, and that the interest is affected by his statements, then the latter is of no more value than if made at any other period of his life. If he was an honest man, he will speak the truth also on his deathbed. But if not, he may well have lied, even at the supreme moment. End of section 17section 18 of criminal investigation volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org criminal investigation a practical handbook for magistrates police officers and lawyers volume 1 by hans gross translated by john adam and john collier adam examination of witnesses and accused continued c pathological lying between the state of a person who desires to speak the truth and that of another person who does not so desire there are what may be called intermediary positions such is the case where a person not having at a given moment the intention of lying yet under the influence of habit presents his facts in such a manner that their falsity becomes at once apparent this is not a rule due to sickness or disease but there must have been undoubtedly a train of circumstances causing the individual to be, at least temporarily, in an abnormal state of mind, leading him to accept falsehood as truth. Such cases present great difficulties to the investigating officer, for while these lies are without motive, at least any apparent motive, yet the impression produced by such persons is absolutely normal, and their statements are always so cleverly and clearly presented that one would never, apart from extraneous circumstances, suspect their falsity. Such cases, which may be called pathological, occur particularly among persons gifted with a lively imagination, among women and children, and pass through every grade from the small exaggeration to the complete invention of the whole story. The most interesting example is furnished to us by Goethe. He says in the second book of his work, Truth and Falsehood, that he often related stories he had himself imagined as narratives of events that had really happened to him. He concludes thus, quote, 
if I had not learnt gradually, and in conformity with my natural bent, to transform these imaginings and braggings into works of literary art, such a beginning would undoubtedly have had very serious consequences for me." End quote. The first to treat of normal sources of errors of memory was Maudsley, followed in order by Sully, Crapolin, and Dr. Delbrook. The last, who has dealt with the matter exhaustively, cites a great many cases in which people have told false stories through an instinctive impulse to lie, but, in spite of there being lack of discernment between true and false, these cases cannot be classed with those we have described as pathological. Evidently, we must put on one side all instances in which there is real disease, to which Delbrook has given the name Pseudologia Fantastica. It must be left to the medical expert to decide whether the impulse to lie and deceive is developed to such a point as to enter into the domain of hysteria and moral insanity. But the investigating officer encounters his greatest difficulties when he has to deal with people whose character is what Forel calls ethico-idiotic, which renders them absolutely incapable of telling the truth. This may go further than one would suppose. Take, for example, the case of the woman, hysterical it is true, cited by Reinhard, who wrote herself false letters, sent to herself anonymous messages, and finally at last became thoroughly convinced of the genuineness of all she had herself written. In this connection, Ripping recommends extreme caution in the interrogation of women who are enceinte, or have been recently confined. These frequently give long accounts of things that never happened, although at ordinary times absolutely truthful and worthy of credence. Even in the simplest circumstances, the investigating officer himself may be the cause of much difficulty. If, for example, he has to do with timid or conscientious witnesses, he may by his mere questioning drive them into making false statements, by bringing them to believe at last that they have really witnessed things that have never taken place. To this feature, Bernheim has given the characteristic name of retroactive hallucination. Great care and caution is, in such cases, the best support of the investigating officer. Readers who desire to pursue further this difficult subject will find abundant material in the works of the authors cited above. End of section 18. Section 19 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Criminal Investigation, A Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1, by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Examination of Witnesses and Accused, Continued. Section 3. Examination of the Accused. As is probably known to most of our readers, the examination of an accused person in Europe is legally much more thorough than is contemplated by Indian law, and is occasionally in practice carried to a pitch which shocks our sense of fairness. Yet even in India we have to deal with statements and confessions of accused persons, and the following section will furnish suggestive hints to those whose business it is to interrogate or record the statements of an accused. It will be useful, however, to summarize the law of India on this point, so that it may be kept clearly in mind while perusing the following pages. 1. Under the Oaths Act, no oath or affirmation can under any circumstances or at any time be administered to an accused person. 2. Any statement made by an accused person may be used as an admission, as evidence against himself, and in certain exceptional circumstances on behalf of himself. Evidence Act, Section 21. 3. Admissions which amount to confessions are placed on a special footing. A confession must inculpate the person making it himself, otherwise it cannot be used against any other person inculpated in it. A statement which merely purports to throw the blame on someone else cannot be used as evidence against that other. 4. 
under no circumstances and at no time shall a confession made to a police officer be proved as against a person accused of any offence evidence act section twenty four five a confession caused by an inducement threat or promise by a person in authority i e not only official authority but for example of a master over a servant employer over a workman etc is irrelevant as evidence evidence act section twenty four but if in the opinion of the court the impression caused by any such inducement threat or promise has been fully removed the confession may become relevant evidence act section twenty eight six no confession made by any person while he is in the custody of a police officer shall be proved as against such person unless it be made in the immediate presence of a magistrate but if any fact is deposed to as discovered in consequence of such information or confession so much thereof as relates distinctly to the fact thereby discovered may be proved evidence act sections twenty six and twenty seven seven when more persons than one are being tried jointly and a confession made by one of such persons affecting himself and a co-accused is proved the court may quote, take such confession into consideration as against such other person end quote, as well as against the person making it evidence act section thirty eight the criminal procedure code lays down how a confession made before a magistrate as in number six above shall be recorded the mode is the same as stated in number ten below and in addition it is laid down criminal procedure code section one sixty four quote, no magistrate shall record any such confession unless upon questioning the person making it he has reason to believe that it was made voluntarily and when he records any confession he shall make a memorandum at the foot of such record to the following effect quote, I believe that this confession was voluntarily made. It was taken in my presence and hearing, and was read over to the person making it, and admitted by him to be correct, and it contains a full and true account of the statement made by him." End quote. A careful magistrate usually excludes the police, and leaves the accused in charge of his own officers for some time before recording his statement so as to allow the supposed baleful influence of the police to evaporate nine when the case is one for committal to sessions the magistrate may after the evidence has been taken quote, examine the accused for the purpose of enabling him to explain any circumstances appearing in the evidence against him end quote. criminal procedure code section two o nine at the sessions trial this examination must be tendered and read as evidence criminal procedure code section two eighty seven in ordinary trials and in sessions trials the accused may at the close of the prosecution case be similarly examined criminal procedure code sections two hundred fifty three and two hundred eighty nine it has been over and over again laid down by the indian high courts that such an examination is intended solely as the section says quote, to enable the accused to explain any circumstances appearing in the evidence against them end quote, and should not be allowed to denigrate into cross-examination or still less into an attempt to trap the accused unfortunately magistrates and even sessions judges do not always lay this injunction to heart with the result that their examination of the accused often reads as if lifted bodily from Le Journal or Le Matin. 10. Statements or confessions made under any of the circumstances mentioned in Numbers 8 and 9 must be recorded as prescribed in Section 364 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, and any irregularity appearing on the face of the record as to the fulfillment of the conditions of sections 164 or 364 can only be corrected by calling evidence generally that of the magistrate himself to show that all the required formalities have really been complied with Quote, one wherever the accused is examined by any magistrate or by any court other than a high court the whole of such examination including every question put to him and every answer given by him 
shall be recorded in full in the language in which he is examined, or, if that is not practicable, in the language of the court or in English, and such record shall be shown or read to him, or, if he does not understand the language in which it is written, shall be interpreted to him in a language which he understands, and he shall be at liberty to explain or add to his answers. 2. When the whole is made conformable to what he declares is the truth, the record shall be signed by the accused and the magistrate or judge of such court, and such magistrate or judge shall certify under his own hand that the examination was taken in his presence and hearing, and that the record contains a full and true account of the statement made by the accused. 3. In cases in which the examination of the accused is not recorded by the magistrate or judge himself, he shall be bound, unless he is a presidency magistrate, as the examination proceeds, to make a memorandum thereof in the language of the court or in English, if he is sufficiently acquainted with the latter language. And such memorandum shall be written and signed by the magistrate or judge with his own hand, and shall be annexed to the record. If the magistrate or judge is unable to make a memorandum as above required, he shall record the reason for such inability. End quote. Notwithstanding such elaborate precautions in favor of the accused, it is astonishing how many convictions are, in India, based upon confessional statements. Bearing these rules in mind, we now proceed with our general analysis. The examination of an accused person is the most difficult of all tasks for an investigating officer who appreciates its value. We can here give only a few hints. He who knows men, who is gifted with a good memory and presence of mind, who takes pleasure in his work and zealously abandons himself to it, who keeps always scrupulously on the legal platform, and who sees always in the accused a fallen brother or one wrongly suspected, he will question well. But an officer who is wanting in a single one of these qualifications will never do any good. And yet even these qualifications are not all. There are other conditions which an investigating officer ought indeed never to lose sight of, but which are exceptionally necessary in the examination of an accused. Thus the officer must compel himself to be sincere even to the limits of pedantry, impenetrable by any shock. It appears supremely natural that an honest man should speak the truth, and yet the investigating officer is tempted only too often by excess of zeal to alter, be it but in the minutest detail, the deposition of a witness, the report of an expert, or some other document, which he communicates to the accused, quote, to assist him in making a clean breast of it, end quote, Often, too, he is led to pretend to know something of which he is ignorant, or knows only imperfectly, or to affirm something without substantial grounds. But how terrible are the consequences! The fear that the falsehood may be discovered, the confusion if the accused remains incredulous, the lifelong torments inflicted by conscience! What at the moment appeared but a slight inaccuracy, lives in our recollection as time goes on, as an infamous lie. Its effect, if it had any, seems to us a success unfairly obtained, and the man whose guilt was certain will be transformed into an innocent victim. Calm and absence of passion are also indispensable. The officer who becomes excited or loses his temper delivers himself into the hands of the accused. If the latter, wiser than the officer, preserves his sang-froid, or even with happy foresight, sets himself deliberately to exasperate his questioner so as to get the better of him. Certainly it is not always easy to maintain a calm demeanor. The crime may be of a nature to justify disgust or hatred. The accused may deny everything too impudently, may be always evading the real object of the question, may be unwilling to understand, or may talk only nonsense, but in spite of everything the investigating officer must never forget that he has to do his duty, and that his duty enjoins on him not to allow himself to be beaten by the accused. A conscientious officer, however naturally irascible, will not allow himself to be carried away. He will be constantly repeating to himself these words, 
it is my duty. Further, an investigating officer who is afraid of the accused is lost. It is difficult not to feel fear when one is naturally timid, but as we have already said, whoever is wanting in courage has no business to be an investigating officer. Besides, we have all seen examples of men, by nature cowardly, who, thanks to their own determination and force of long habit, have quite forgotten that there was a time when the rolling eyes of an accused made them feel very uncomfortable. We would not assume for ourselves the responsibility of advising that an investigating officer should never take precautions for his safety as regards the accused, as having him put in irons, guarded during his examination, etc. Let each man do what he thinks necessary. The author's opinion is that such inquietude is always and without exception superfluous. Will not a mortifying impression be produced upon the accused, when he finds himself dragged in chains into the office of the investigating officer, and by excess of precaution surrounded by warders, or if he notices that, before he has been brought in, scissors, heavy ink bottles, paper knives, and all dangerous utensils which he might snatch up and use as weapons of offense, have been carefully put aside, or even if the officer maintains a respectful distance and changes his tone whenever the accused raises his voice or clenches his fists. The officer will not impose upon him by this means or convince him by his arguments. And even when all precautions have been taken, even if the accused be brought shut up in an iron cage, if he really wishes to do anything, he can always do it. But that is of no importance. It is as rare to see an accused raise his hand against an investigating officer as to see a meteor kill someone in its fall. Should any mischief befall an investigating officer at the hands of an accused person, the former can always console himself with the reflection that it is certainly his own fault. There are other and better means of self-protection which the investigating officer has always at his disposal. Among these are perfect composure, prudence, and procedure in strict conformity with law and humanity. There are, it is true, extremely dangerous prisoners, with whom extreme caution is never out of place. One must become accustomed in such a case never for one moment, not even one single moment, to remove one's eyes from the individual, to cease following and watching all his looks, all his movements. Further, one must never sit down near a suspicious character. Both in attack and in defense, one should always be standing. For if one is seated when attacked, the mere getting up and putting oneself on the defensive causes considerable loss of time. If the accused be seated, as he ought to be, and the officer be standing, the latter has the advantage whatever happens. Further, one should stand as near the accused as possible without attracting his attention. One observes him better, does not forget constantly to keep an eye on him, he is not so tempted to do anything if he sees the officer close to him, and if the worst come to the worst, one is in the best possible attitude for seizing him. But all that is only to frighten him. The author has interrogated hundreds of accused, and has never come across one who made as if to attack him. There are indeed but few cases where such an attempt would have been of any use. For example, in a very small court or office room, with no warders or police in the passages or at the doors, the accused might try to get away in this manner. If in such a case the investigating officer is not accompanied by a clerk or peon, or if the latter is at a distance, he must never for an instant take his eye off the accused, as for instance to search for some document on the record, for then if the accused be armed, he may very well endeavor to strike down the officer and attempt to fly. But here are so many ifs, and so many imprudences, that such a concatenation of circumstances is almost impossible." Another case in which the accused may raise his hand against the investigating officer is where the latter shows himself unfair, passionate, rude, or contemptuous toward the accused, thus exciting his anger. 
if, in such circumstances, one of those misfortunes to which human nature is exposed befalls the investigating officer, it is only what he deserves. Do not say, there must have been a mistake, perhaps the accused fancied that he was being treated or judged in an unjust manner, when in reality it was not so. That does not usually happen. The accused, to whatever class of society he belongs, is most precise and just like a child if one treats him with unjust severity. He will never rebel against severity, and the most perverse is impressed when he sees the official doing his duty zealously. The harshest severity will not affect the accused if he finds the investigating officer at the same time exhibiting towards him a humane good will, and not endeavouring solely to crush him whenever possible, but setting out in relief as zealously everything which can establish his innocence or attenuate his offence. End of section 19section 20 of criminal investigation volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org criminal investigation a practical handbook for magistrates police officers and lawyers volume 1 by hans gross translated by john adam and john collier adam Examination of Witnesses and Accused Continued The very technique of the examination demands a knowledge and understanding of the man with whom we have to do. If the previous history of the accused has been registered only at the end of the record to which he has been a party, we need not expect any good to come of the whole inquiry, for the investigating officer has not taken the trouble to study the accused before setting to work, and if he has not done so, he must have omitted many points absolutely necessary. But if we find the antecedents of the accused carefully registered at the beginning of the record, the whole inquiry will be conducted at least carefully and intelligently. In thus setting out his antecedents with accuracy, we can learn above all what sort of man is before us, we can hark back to events of long ago and establish, with the help of questions, many things which, if not strictly relevant to the matter in hand, often enable us to form an accurate estimate of the character of the accused. As a general rule, the accused here speaks the truth, at least to a great extent, and if he does not do so, we can learn thereby to recognize his usual style of lying. In addition, we can quickly pick out the lies. We take notes and establish certain periods, then we make him go over the story again a little later, and then note the impossibilities, the contradictions, the gaps. Also, we can often pick up from the old records antecedents incidentally mentioned by the accused and compare them with his story. If we recall them to the accused, at the same time letting him see that we are not going to allow ourselves to be imposed upon, he may not unfrequently be led to renounce his intention of lying about the matter in hand, and penitently admit his guilt, when the affair under inquiry is imperceptibly introduced. It is a good plan not to draw too accurate a line between the antecedents and the examination strictly so called, but rather, proceeding in chronological order, to arrive gradually at the moment at which the crime has been committed, in the hope that he will begin himself to speak about it. We do not assert that in this way a confession should be dragged out of the accused. That would be both dishonest and useless. What we say is that nothing is gained by making his confession a painful task to him. We are convinced that in rendering his avowal easy, we are acting in his best interests, for it is always to his interest to confess. His actions appear in less sombre colours, he is sure of a less severe punishment, and the disburdening of his conscience is a blessing to the most hardened criminal. It is merciless, or rather psychologically wrong, to expect any one boldly and directly to confess his crime, perhaps an abominable offence, 
persons with an extensive acquaintance with men of the lowest character know only too well what repugnance they feel in employing the correct expression even after a complete avowal persons of a somewhat higher moral grade often shrink from using the word steal while the number of paraphrastic expressions employed to avoid uttering the simple word kill is extraordinary now if it is repugnant to such people to pronounce a single characteristic word it must be much more painful for them to make without ceremony a confession of their misdeeds in a connected recital we must smooth their way render their task easy often also we must seize the exact moment when confession is easiest to the guilty man we must often have abundance of patience we must advance slowly step by step we must make troublesome investigations if the guilt is only partially admitted to or if from a number of facts the accused recognizes only some we must often in such a case make very accurate distinctions frequently an accused admits only up to a certain point that is to say as far as he can go without compromising an accomplice or again up to the time when his conduct becomes criminal or perhaps when a less serious crime may be transformed into one carrying a heavier punishment, as, for example, theft in a dwelling-house into housebreaking and theft. There often exists, even among the vilest specimens of humanity, a certain standard of honor which it is most important the investigating officer should appreciate at its true value frequently the attempts of the accused to prevent his crime appearing worse than it really is are very like an attempt to deny everything that can possibly be denied we cannot hardly without exception be absolutely certain as to what is true and what is not true unless in the course of our examination we come to know the character of the accused sufficiently well to enable us to judge what line he is most likely to take to sum up we must never shrink from any trouble which will help us to know the accused his history and the necessary details of the matter in hand for nothing will so entirely and so definitely sweep away any ascendancy we may have acquired over him as to betray ignorance of details even the most insignificant if the accused notes any gap any mistake any piece of ignorance on the part of the investigating officer he at once entrenches himself behind it and all the labor all the sagacity of the officer are powerless to make him abandon his asylum with regard to an important point in connection with confessions referred to in the author's criminal psychology we can only mention here that false confessions are very often made through insanity such cases are very dangerous for the insanity is sometimes quite unnoticeable the confessing person appearing perfectly normal to the non-professional. In several cases of poisoning, by gas and mushrooms, very strange false confessions have been made, and the investigating officer cannot be too careful. We may here add a few words on the question of physiognomy. There are few sciences the value of which has been more exaggerated by its partisans and more unjustly depreciated by its adversaries. The balance seems to incline in favor of those who attribute to it considerable value. Certainly it is going too far to fix certain types of the human face, and to pretend that one can deduce from certain features, structures, colors, and their relations with one another, definite mental and moral characteristics. But it is beyond doubt that the experienced critic can learn from the lines of the face and play of the features much more and more satisfactorily than any one could tell him we cannot of course give here a precis of physiognomy but we know enough to enable us to recommend strongly to an investigating officer the study of the subject both theoretically and practically we certainly do not pretend that he should take in his hands the antiquated lavater and pin his faith to him but whoever studies attentively the works of modern writers on this subject, as Mantegaza and Baer, will find that even today we can learn much from the founder of the science. It is not easy always to say when he is deceived and when he is right. He is deceived, as we have just said, 
when he exaggerates the value of typical characters. He is instructive when he teaches us how to read the general character of a physiognomy. It was his fate, for instance, to mistake for a portrait of Herder, a portrait he had long looked for, that of a murderer executed in Hanover, and to read in the features all the qualities he had supposed to exist in Herder. But again, he is invaluable when he says, for example, quote, I chiefly recognize the true sage and the truly honest man by the mode in which they listen. They have a certain brightness in the eye, a clearness of vision, in which serenity and liveliness appear to unite, something intermediate between the lightning flash and the extinguished glimmer of a dying eye. End quote. No one can even today give an investigating officer a more precise lesson. To observe how the person questioned listens is a rule of primary importance, and if the officer observes it, he will arrive at his goal more quickly than by hours of examination. Undoubtedly, the features must not be wholly neglected. Rubes is quite correct when he says, quote, Suppose that one of your intimate friends covers his face so as to conceal the forehead, the chin, and half the cheeks. The eyes, the nose, and the upper lip are alone visible, and yet you will recognize him at once. But if he puts on a mask which covers the half of his forehead and the small space between the eyes and the upper part of the nose, you will no longer recognize him. End quote. These rules, and a hundred others of great value, the investigating officer cannot discover for himself, however hard he tries, even in the course of a long experience. He must seek them in books where they are laid down scientifically. Then in his practice he can extend and perfect his knowledge, and the time devoted to his preliminary studies will certainly not be thrown away. It is impossible to leave this question of the treatment of an accused person by the investigating officer without saying a word as to what is called the school of Lombroso. Indeed, the works of Lombroso, and in particular, L'homme criminel, Le criminel politique et la révolution, L'homme des génies, Génie et folie, La criminelle et la prostituée, are to be found today in the hands of all criminal experts, and have exercised on all of them some, at times great, influence. The high authority wielded by Lombroso is due not only to the abundance of the materials provided by him, to the number of new ideas and the captivating audacity of his reasoning, it is due also to the fact that his theory is in absolute accord with the nihilistic tendency which today penetrates everywhere. This modern tendency to bring everything to the same level consists in the negation of distinctive characteristics, and just as the social ideas preach equality, so the natural sciences profess that all living beings have the same origin, physical science propounds the identity of forces, and medical science affirms the impotency of a thousand remedies once deemed to be infallible. Why, then, should we be surprised if this nihilist tendency penetrating into our science has created this doctrine? There is no difference in nature between the criminal and the honest man. The former is only a hereditary degenerate, gifted with a morbid constitution, and if we do not go on to draw the logical conclusion, there is no difference between good and bad, it is only because we do not dare." If Lombroso did not exist, there would be a gap in the logical evolution of modern ideas. Let us examine a little the basis of this new doctrine. One of the German authors, who knows it best, summarizes it thus. According to this doctrine, all true criminals possess a continuous series of the nature of cause and effect, of physical characteristics, the existence of which is proved by anthropology, and of moral characteristics, the existence of which can be proved by psychophysiology. These characteristics constitute of criminals a particular variety, an anthropological type of the human race, and those who possess them are criminals by the stern degree of fate, even if they are never found out, and that too independently of all social and individual conditions. Such a man is born to be a criminal, 
He is, as Lombroso puts it, deliquente nato, the genuine original sinner. This hypothesis does not pretend to deny that acquired qualities or social influences, education, habit, temptation, poverty, will not occasionally make a man a criminal. On the contrary, the theory may be developed to recognize the existence of criminals by passion, by chance, or by habit. But it seeks to explain the existence of criminals by nature, by an innate disposition. The indications of this disposition are certain physical peculiarities not the result of bodily disease, and its elements are certain fundamental qualities of character and morality clearly distinct from the symptoms of mental disease, and the knowledge of which enables the psychologist to declare that those possessing them cannot help becoming criminals. Now the school of Lombroso sets itself to discover and establish the anatomical variations to be found in criminals, their primary characteristics, variations in rudimentary organs, variations in secondary sexual characteristics, variations in multiple organs, variations resulting from a stoppage or diversion in development, and finally, acquired characteristics. It cannot be denied that the school has succeeded in proving the existence of these anatomical variations in a certain number of criminals, but it has been impossible to push the demonstration far enough to establish a determinate type of criminal. This has been proved by Dr. Kiern in a most convincing manner in a brief brochure. He shows that, truly enough, one can, in examining carefully a certain number of convicts, discover some mental anomalies and various marks of degeneracy, but these never appear in identically the same fashion, and far from being typical, appear in the greatest diversity, setting all rules at defiance. Further, one frequently finds one symptom of intellectual weakness, but very rarely in combination all the symptoms characteristic of moral insanity. Thus there being no correspondence in individuals taken one by one, there can be no question of a criminal type. The theory of Lombroso has been completely demolished by Dr. Nake in his dissertation on The Methodology of a Scientific Anthropology, in which he comes to the conclusion that the works of Lombroso, quote, with their arbitrary processes, their exaggerations and premature conclusions, in no way answer to what one has a right to expect in a scientific work. End quote. The truth is, quote, there is neither criminal born nor type of criminal. End quote. The chief dogma of the positive school is thus destroyed but we may pause to ask whence has it drawn the materials necessary to these seductive conclusions. It has noted and utilized the statistics furnished by prisons, and here it cannot be denied that the numbers cited and furnishing such and such percentages are here and there pretty high, but only here and there. Often the percentage is so low that no conclusion can be drawn from it, for whenever the percentage is very low, we are always liable to find that chance has had something to do with the calculation of the statistics. Further, it is frequently overlooked that the percentage obtained for a particular criminal anomaly must be compared with the corresponding percentage among non-criminals. Ordinarily, this comparison is impossible, for one can carry on investigations only upon criminals confined in jails. Occasionally, on certain points, we may make inquiries among men, but not among women, so that no one can say in what proportion any particular anomaly is met with among others than convicts. The enquiries undertaken in schools, barracks, and hospitals, and the notes made at post-mortem examinations, can furnish but approximate information, for it cannot be imagined that a definite and representative section of the whole human race is here dealt with but if it cannot be asserted that a certain anomaly is met with in a well-established percentage of the whole race, then the percentage found for criminals is of very doubtful scientific value, however accurate the inquiry may have been. Suppose, for example, it has been established that a certain anomaly is found among 10% of all criminals, 
that is of no value unless it can be shown that a different percentage prevails among non-criminals. But if it is pretended that this anomaly is found among only 5% of non-criminals because that proportion has been found to exist in schools, barracks, and hospitals, it is only an approximate supposition, for no one knows in what proportion the anomaly might be met with among that other section, and far the larger section, of men who are outside schools, barracks, and hospitals. Besides, the materials at disposal in each of these inquiries are special, and do not represent the bulk. At school we find youth, in the barracks picked men from a physical point of view, in the hospital the poorest portion of the populace. But approximate suppositions are not scientific proofs. In truth, the weak point of the conclusions derived from statistics by Lombroso and his followers arises from the theoretically false way in which he builds up his figures, whereby the whole basis of his system crumbles away. Admit what Lombroso says, the anomaly A is found among X percent of the convicts in all the prisons of the world, the anomaly B in Y percent, the anomaly C in Z percent, and so on then to conclude that these anomalies will be found in the indicated proportions among all the criminals of the world is false we could only draw this conclusion if we could divide all the inhabitants of the world into two camps criminals and non-criminals sheep and goats if then we could examine all the people in the two camps establish the percentages of anomaly and compare the results we should be safe but here the materials are not only uncertain but inaccurate. Lombroso has examined convicts in prison. That his materials may be complete, he must examine all who have been previously in jail, all who commit crimes without being caught, and all who would naturally become criminals if favorable circumstances had not by chance snatched them from a criminal career. For example, those who would have been thieves if they had not been well off, or poachers if they had not been lucky enough when young to be appointed gamekeepers. Thus we cannot say that convicts represent an unfluctuating and certain proportion of criminals, for that cannot be proved. No more can we tell, even approximately, the number of old offenders now at liberty, the number of living criminals who will be punished some day, the number of undiscovered criminals, and the number of those who, naturally disposed to crime, will never, for one reason or another, enter the criminal ranks. But if such numbers cannot be fixed even approximately, there is nothing to rest on to establish the proportion in which an anomaly will be found among convicts in comparison with criminals at liberty. It may be objected that in a series of years we may arrive at sufficient certainty if the proportion remains the same, although the prison population may have changed. Without taking into account that we should have to wait many years to apply this test, it would prove only one thing, namely, that the proportion remained the same among convicts, and there would still be no possible comparison between criminals inside prison and criminals outside it. The arithmetical error committed by Lombroso is thus a double one. On the one hand, he does not take into account all the criminals which he should include, and on the other he counts the criminals at liberty among his honest men. Thus if convicts be C, honest men H, and criminals at liberty X, he compares C with H and X, instead of comparing C and X with H. And he cannot help himself, because X is an unknown quantity." Thus we can say that the figures furnished by the positive school of Lombroso, and on which it has built up such grave conclusions, are taken wholly at hazard. We can say that the percentages which should serve as proof are calculated on numbers drawn by chance, and that the relation of such number to the total number of men is and must remain absolutely unknown. We do not deny that the general researches of Lombroso have awakened a crowd of ideas and established many important facts, nor do we deny that Lombroso has shown, better than any of his predecessors, 
that our prisons contain more than one moral wreck or individual of stunted mental development who would be far better in an hospital for incurables to lombroso belongs the immoral merit of having insisted on the care with which we should proceed in dealing with such individuals but his theory reaches no further that persons of feeble intelligence full of hereditary defects and morally shipwrecked fall into crime more readily than others has been known for ages and when we are advised to be more careful of them than we have been up to now when it is a question of their punishment we receive the advice with many thanks but that is no ground for the criminal expert suspending his work and yielding up his place to the medical man alone End of section 20《セクション21 of Criminal Investigation, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in May 2015. Criminal Investigation, a Practical Handbook for Magistrates, Police Officers, and Lawyers, Volume 1 by Hans Gross. Translated by John Adam and John Collier Adam. Chapter three Inspection of Localities. Section one Preparation. His report of an inspection of localities is a real touchstone for the investigating officer. In no other duty are address, power of observation, logical reasoning, methodized energy, and keeping the end ever in view so clearly revealed, and nowhere else can more striking examples of awkwardness, feebleness of observation, disorder, vagueness, and hesitation be found. When the investigating officer receives records from other courts, he is obliged to find out the peculiarities of character of the official who has prepared them. By this means, he will know what to think of the work of his colleague. If he find among the records a description of a locality, he need but read it to immediately form an idea of the value of the remaining documents. An unskilful investigating officer will never furnish a good report of this description. While on the other hand, such a document will reveal the good investigating officer at his true value. In a judicial inspection of localities, it is necessary to conform to a sort of technical formula, technique, in the method of procedure, and this formula is acquired only by conscientious preparation, complete absence of excitement, and by dispassion. The latter must be obtained at all price and must be divested of all affectation. Above all, he must take care to be well prepared and have everything arranged, even to the smallest details. Local inspection is only ordered in the most important cases, but then the gravity of the case, the unlooked for incidents, the feeling of heavy responsibility, the emotion produced by horrible and sorrowful sights, in addition to other circumstances, in themselves act so violently upon the investigating officer that he has no need of other difficulties of an incidental nature to distract his attention, already sufficiently absorbed, even though these lesser difficulties may have an importance of their own. In the first place, then, the investigating officer must be careful to obtain a clerk who is willing, brisk, and clear headed. Should the clerk find his task tedious or work with an ill grace, the investigating officer runs the risk of being himself unconsciously influenced by him, and may neglect to make so minute an inquiry as he otherwise would do, in order not to further dishearten his assistant. If the clerk be a slow writer, the best part of one's time is lost, and the most zealous of investigating officers begins to feel himself becoming disgusted or impatient. According to his temperament. Moreover, the time allotted to each excursion is nearly always limited, and the investigating officer is often hindered in making the necessary observations for the sole reason that the clerk is a dawdler. 
Further, the clerk should be intelligent, so that he may seize with rapidity the information dictated by the investigating officer, be able to assist him, and devote his attention to details pointed out to him by the investigating officer, to observe on his own account and point out to the investigating officer what may have escaped the latter. Four eyes are better than two. The author always recalls with a feeling of thankfulness the services of one of his assistants, who during five consecutive years seconded him when attached to one of the largest and most important provincial courts. At first it took a deal of trouble to knock this man into shape, for all his schooling had been acquired at but a primary school, but to his indefatigable zeal, sincere attachment, unceasing wakefulness and natural gift of observation, the author owes most valuable discoveries, and more than one success obtained in important inquiries should be entirely attributed to this honest and simple-minded subordinate. It is true that in the smaller courts one has not always good material at his disposal, but the investigating officer should be given the best at hand when he is setting out to examine the scene of a crime. Being then in possession of a useful assistant, care should be taken to make him perfectly conversant with the matter in hand. All the facts, theories and possible solutions should be explained to him. He must be told to observe for himself things that the investigating officer foresees he will be unable to attend to, and in short the whole scheme of the inquiry must be discussed with him. To try and make mysteries with one's assistant is not only ridiculous, but can in no case be of any utility whatsoever. If he be unworthy of confidence, he is unfitted for his post and must be at once got rid of. But if he is worthy of confidence, he may as well be made acquainted a little in advance with what he cannot fail to see when he comes to carry out his personal duties. The author has made a point of not communicating his plans too soon to the clerk, but only immediately before carrying them into execution, when it was certain that he would not be leaving again before the work was begun. However worthy of confidence a man may be, his tongue is frequently stronger than his head and heart, and his chatter may do a great deal of harm. It must not be forgotten that the clerk, by virtue of the law itself, is not a mere writing machine. He is employed by government to help the investigation, and has the right to give an opinion. It is self-evident that he cannot be allowed without restraint to put his spoke into every wheel, for then the investigating officer would lose his authority. Such conduct would also be productive of disorder, and in many cases the thoughtless boasting of the assistant might upset all the master's plans. Where the investigating officer is thus in the habit of informing his clerk of his projects and initiating him into his schemes, it is a good plan to arrange that, should the clerk wish to inform the master of anything, he should write it down on his writing pad. When the investigating officer notices that the clerk is starting to scribble, he should, so as not to draw the attention of any one, stop dictating for some excuse or other, and then, when he sees that the clerk has finished, he will start reading over his shoulder, as if looking for the thread of his ideas for the purposes of continuing his dictation, all that the clerk has written. Often the most precious information will be found thus written down, as for instance, you have forgotten to search such and such a box, or the accused is throwing uneasy glances towards the fireplace, or even it seems to me that the person is holding an open knife behind his back, all which in the ardour of work had been overlooked. Further, all necessary tools and aids should be kept in continual readiness. These we shall discuss minutely later on. But there are other details no less important. Care must be taken to have the means of transport quite ready, to be properly equipped for the time that will be taken up, and to give the necessary notices to witnesses and assistants, as, for example, in an exhumation, to the grave-digger and the persons who will identify the body, etc., so that they may be found on the spot. This also applies to experts, municipal representatives, and the like. It is almost always a priceless advantage to have with one from the outset a representative of the detective department. He can be made use of in a thousand ways, and many a difficulty and much loss of time may be avoided. 
if nothing else rogues and idlers must be kept at a distance arrests made articles and localities watched necessary inquiries pursued in the neighbourhood conversations between accused persons and witnesses prevented houses and persons searched and many other similar details often of decisive importance attended to section two what to do at the scene of offence on arrival at the scene of the crime certain things must be attended to which are common to all cases be they of simple theft robbery murder arson or misdemeanour the first duty is to preserve an absolute calm with it everything is won without it everything is compromised an investigating officer who fusses about sets to work aimlessly starts a plan only to drop it asks everybody useless questions and gives orders only to cancel them makes a most painful impression on those engaged with him in the inquiry and destroys any confidence they may have had in his successful management in such a case it is all up with the zealous cooperation and sustained attention of his assistants but if the investigating officer shows perfect confidence with no trace of excitement and acts as with a sure prevision of the results every one willingly submits to his orders and each does his very best and the result of the inquiry is assured thus when the investigating officer reaches the spot he must beware of speaking at random and starting to do something without rhyme or reason man indeed is naturally the victim of excitement and in the presence of an important event can find no better way to control his agitation than by issuing orders wholesale altering them and at all hazards making things hum in the same way soldiers are more at ease on the field of battle when they can themselves join in the actual fighting fire off their rifles and make a noise but the superiority of a company is proved less in the fight than when it is held in reserve observing quietly what is going on allowing the bullets to rain upon it and watching the wounded carried to the rear the first point is therefore quietly and attentively to take stock of the situation the investigating officer ought to find his bearings correct if need be the impression that he has already formed about the case on its first being reported and modify his plans accordingly these latter considerations are of importance as soon as the investigating officer is informed about a case it absorbs all his thoughts or at least ought to do so he immediately makes a mental picture of the case itself and all connected with it in a definite form with precise outlines when travelling to the spot he bases upon this idea his conjectures as to how the offence has been committed and builds upon his mental picture of the spot the plan of inquiry to be pursued the idea may take root in his mind to such an extent that he cannot rid himself of it either in part or in whole even when the scene is actually displayed before his eyes and frequently causes him to go wrong in his reckonings for this reason the faults of his first impression must be corrected on the spot and his plans and intentions modified accordingly the scene of the crime must then be inspected both in its general aspect and in detail and must be considered as far as possible in relation to the facts the time allotted to this close examination is far from being lost and the results compensate largely for any apparent delay after this the investigating officer must find out the persons best able to give information about the case which will enable him to become at least approximately acquainted with its circumstances if the case is one of slight importance or the investigation but an incidental one found necessary in the course of the main inquiry he is already aware of what it is all about but if it is a first inquiry with reference to some important crime such as murder or arson or some big accident such as a railway collision boiler explosion etc he should endeavour to find a representative of the authorities a policeman a municipal inspector or a person directly interested in the matter as for example a relation of the murdered man the sufferer by the fire a skilled workman from whom to obtain preliminary information 
habit above all helps the investigating officer in examining people with a view to obtain this preliminary information he learns little by little not to waste time over details while forgetting nothing of importance and however inexperienced he will commit no grave mistake if he always remembers the old and precious maxim of the jurist quis quid ubi quibus auxilis cur quomodo quando who what where with what why how when what was the crime who did it when was it done and where how done and with what motive who in the deed did share if these words be always kept prominently before one in one's office they will be impressed on the memory and imagination and prevent many a grave mistake when the information that can be gathered up rapidly has been obtained the next care should be to make a selection among the people interested in the case the investigating officer must watch that all who have given or who can give information do not go too far away but remain on the spot if possible it is as well to submit the witnesses to a certain surveillance so as to prevent them from gossiping uselessly with one another for witnesses and more especially people of little education women and children cannot help discussing the case and the case only and telling one another what they have seen to such an extent that they do not exactly know in the end what each does know that is they mix up what they have themselves seen and heard with what has been told them by others true the witnesses may have talked to each other and heard each other's stories beforehand but in every case nothing leads them to talk to such an extent and exclusively about the case as they are being collected together on the scene of the crime in the very presence of the investigating officer thus making the affair as it were stand out in full relief while taking these measures the investigating officer should attend to the preservation in as complete a manner as possible of existing vestiges of the crime and take care that they are interfered with as little as may be he must at once establish for example whether the corpse of the person who has been murdered is still in the same position as when the crime was discovered he must distinguish upon the marks of footsteps those made before the discovery from those made afterwards by the curious etc the conclusion of everything happening after the moment when the crime was committed is a very special task for the investigating officer all the more so as the most regrettable errors may arise from the neglect of it there are known cases where the investigating officers has described with the most minute accuracy the position of the corpse and drawn therefrom the most ingenious conclusions while unhappily the evidence pointed out that the corpse had been turned several times by different persons before his arrival and had therefore been placed in quite a different position again a jacket of rough cloth found on the corpse played an important part in the case until the discovery was made that it had been simply placed over the body to hide from passers-by the horrible sight of a fractured skull bayard as far back as eighteen forty seven related a case in which the physician who was summoned stepped in the blood and then walked all over the building leaving bloodstains everywhere which subsequently caused so much trouble and confusion as to completely spoil the investigation here is an instance where the consequences might have been much graver in a case of arson a footprint was discovered which undoubtedly corresponded with that of the accused it was indeed his but it had not been made at the time of the crime but subsequently when on his speedy arrest he had been taken to the place by a policeman we shall describe yet another case which forcibly points out what danger may arise from the introduction into the examination of localities of details which are purely accidental the story seems almost incredible but it is absolutely true and all who were connected with it will remember it perfectly well the extraordinary combination of circumstances which characterize it render it all the more instructive a lady the proprietress of a factory in counting out her money had made up five little packets of one thousand florins in paper and placed them so she believed in the cash box 
Next day she found only four packets there, although the cash box was as well secured as it had been the previous night. The lady believed that her maid-servant had got hold of the key and had removed the packet of one thousand florins from the cash box during the night. This could be done the more easily as the office where the cash box was kept was on the ground floor, while the living rooms, which communicated with the office by a spiral staircase, were on the first floor. The maid on being arrested protested her innocence, and it was only after a search that lasted a week that her trunk could be discovered. This trunk was carefully searched in the office of the investigating officer, and its contents, consisting for the most part of old and valueless articles, were exposed on the table and carefully examined without discovering anything suspicious. It was only on lifting up the lot a strip of paper was found underneath on the table, on which was printed besides several letters the words, One thousand florins in one florin notes. It was one of the strips that the Austro-Hungarian bank was in the habit of using for rolling up round sums of money paid out, indicating, for example, one hundred florins in one florin notes, or five hundred florins in ten florin notes, or one thousand florins in five florin notes. The complainant was immediately asked whether the packet of notes of which she had been robbed was tied up with a similar strip. She declared that she often changed money at the Austro-Hungarian bank, and often received her money wrapped up in such strips, and frequently made use of them in her own counting-house when she counted up her cash, but she could not say whether the packet in question had one or not. Fortunately the investigating officer discovered written on the ribbon the date 22nd of August, in very small and almost imperceptible characters. It was established that this date was written by the clerk in the bank, who had counted out the bundle of one thousand florins that was wrapped round by this particular ribbon, but as the accused was arrested on the 22nd August, it was inexplicable how this ribbon came among her things. At length it all came out. The examination of the trunk took place on September 1st in the office of the investigating officer, and while it was going on, a clerk brought that official his monthly salary. Now, he had received the packet of 1,000 florin notes from the bank, and after taking off the unlucky cover, had carelessly placed it upon the table then covered by the belongings of the accused. The investigating officer and the clerk had not noticed this, and so the strip of paper assumed such enormous importance. But suppose that by some chance the date on the strip had been but a few days earlier, which might have very easily been the case, there would then have been no reason for searching for its origin, a chance which was all the more extraordinary since there was nothing against the supposition that the ribbon had passed from the bank into the hands of the lady, and had afterwards been stolen by the servant along with the one thousand florins. A perfectly innocent person would thus have been convicted, simply because an object which had nothing to do with the case had not been eliminated. End of section 21